October 1874, the General Conference, the 44th Semi-Annual Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commenced this morning, October 6, in the New Tabernacle at 10 o'clock, present on the stand, of the First Presidency, Brigham Young, President, George A. Smith, Daniel H. Wells, Lorenzo Snow, Brigham Young, Jr., Albert Carrington, and George Q. Cannon, Counselors. Of the Twelve Apostles, Orson Pratt, Sr., John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, C. C. Rich, Lorenzo Snow, Franklin D. Richards, George Q. Cannon, Brigham Young, Jr., and Albert Carrington. Patriarch John Smith. Of the first seven presidents of seventies, Albert P. Rockwood, Horace S. Eldridge, and John Van Cott. Of the presidency of the High Priest Quorum, Edward Snellgrove, and Elias Morris. Of the presidency of this stake of Zion, George B. Wallace, W. H. Folsom, and John T. Kane. Of the presidency of the bishopric, Edward Hunter, and Leonard W. Hardy. Besides the above, there was a general representation of leading men from all parts of the territory of Utah, and some from Idaho. The conference was called to order by President George A. Smith. The choir sang, All you that love Emmanuel's name, whose spirits burn with ardent flame. Prayer by President George A. Smith. The choir sang, Sweet is the work, my God, my King, to praise thy name, give thanks, and sing. President George A. Smith felt thankful to meet in these conferences and behold the faces of the Latter-day Saints. We have received the first principles of the gospel and thereby entered into covenants, to which we will all do well to give heed. But owing to the manifestation of human weaknesses, many in the early history of the church apostatized from the faith, and some suppose that most of the talent of the church went with it. But the subsequent progress of the kingdom was such that the previous apostasy was scarcely felt. The subject for contemplation during this conference would be that of a general reformation, including the principle of union, which has been extensively preached upon, but there is still room for a great improvement in our practice, in order that we might become a self-sustaining community. Therefore, we should commence in good earnest, not only to manufacture what we require to use and wear, but also to patronize in our families every article of home industry. He then spoke of the progress of the temple in St. George, and also that in this city, and the necessity of keeping up our donations of 50 cents a month in cash for the purpose of building temples. Some two or three hundred workmen were expected to go down to St. George after conference to hurry up the temple, as in that country work could be done throughout the winter with very little interruption from storms. There would also be a number of missionaries called during the conference to preach the gospel in the States and in Canada. Let us be united in our heart's desire and prayer to God that his servant Brigham might be healed of his present infirmity, and that those who spoke might be filled with light and wisdom to instruct and bless those who attended this conference. Let us cleave unto righteousness and continue faithful to the end that we might obtain eternal life. Individual Salvation, the success of the work of the Lord not dependent on man. Encourage home manufacturers. Build temples. Safety on the old ship Zion. Remarks by President George A. Smith, delivered at the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Tuesday morning, October 6, 1874, reported by David W. Evans. The present occasion, a semi-annual conference, is one which, in the history that we are making, is marked with more than ordinary importance. I always feel thankful to be permitted to meet the faces and greet the countenances of the brethren and sisters from the different parts of the territory and elsewhere who assemble at these conferences, and I feel it important that, in doing so, we should lay aside the ordinary business transactions of life and try and compare notes with ourselves as to our actual progress in the things of the kingdom. We have received the first principles of the gospel, and we have started in their observances, and in doing so, we have become obligated by our personal agreements and covenants in the waters of baptism, and in the ordinances which pertain to the gospel to live in accordance with those principles which are revealed. In pursuing our daily avocations, we become mixed up, more or less, with the world. We are called to battle with the world, and we have exhibitions from time to time of the weaknesses of human nature. I remember very well in the days of Kirtland hearing men testify that they knew this was the work of God, that they had seen visions of the armies of heaven and the horsemen thereof, as did Gehazi, the servant of the prophet, and then, in consequence of the failure of a bank, or because some business transaction did not come out in accordance with their expectations or desires, 
they would apostatize and come to the conclusion that they never knew anything about it and become infidels. This shows the weakness to which some individuals have been subject. I also remember in the great apostasy which took place in Kirtland that those who apostatized considered that all the talent of the church had left it, and yet the work rolled right along, and so far as they were concerned, they were never missed. They were soon forgotten, and nobody could tell where they went to. I have occasionally met with them twenty or thirty years afterwards, and could hardly tell where they dropped out. Their disappearance made no ripple. The facts are, brethren, that the work of the Lord does not depend upon us. If we go into darkness, if we let our hearts be filled with covetousness or corruption, or give way to licentiousness, drunkenness, Sabbath-breaking, unbelief, or any crime that corrodes our system or organization, so that our tabernacles become unfit for the Holy Spirit to dwell in, it will withdraw from us, and the light that is in us becomes darkened, and that darkness is so great that we grope as a blind man and wander hither and thither, and those who suffer themselves to be led by these blind men fall into the ditch with them, but the work rolls right along. Now we assemble here, and we want to review our conduct and our characters before the Lord. It is one of the weaknesses of human nature to sit in judgment on others, but on the present occasion we should bring ourselves to account, one and all, and determine whether we are living in accordance with the principles of the Holy Gospel that we have received. I recollect hearing once that Satan had invented for men a certain kind of leather spectacles, which, when a man looked at his own sins, made them look very small, and when he looked at his own righteous acts, made them look very large. When he looked at his neighbor's sins, they seemed very large, and when he looked at his neighbor's righteous acts, they appeared very small. Spectacles of this kind should be avoided, and we should be very careful when we are examining ourselves that we do not get them on, as well as when we examine our neighbors. The first step, then, in relation to the business of this conference is to preach the principles of repentance and reformation. We should question ourselves and determine whether we have suffered ourselves with the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire of gain, or from any other cause, to be darkened in our minds. There are many false spirits gone out into the world, and when Joseph Smith communicated the keys of the priesthood to the servants of the Lord, he gave them the power to try these spirits, and this power was given to the church, and no man need be led astray, only as he suffers himself to lose the Holy Spirit, which is the result of sin, wickedness, neglect, or transgression. In addition to this general reformation which we wish to impress upon the minds of our brethren and sisters at the opening of this conference, we want to take such steps as will be for the temporal and spiritual welfare of the saints. The changes which have transpired in the world show us how uncertain a tenure our business arrangements are placed upon. From the time that the revelation was given to the saints, commanding them to let the beauty of their garments be the workmanship of their own hands, to the present time, that doctrine has been preached, and yet it now seems more necessary than ever that, in our settlements and associations, we should organize and take such measures as will enable us to provide within ourselves as far as possible the articles which we need. It is our duty to ourselves and to our God to unite our interests in such a manner that we can produce what we need within ourselves, without being hewers of wood and drawers of water to strangers. We have made a good deal of progress in this direction, as we can see by the numbers of people who come here clothed in the manufacture of their own factories or looms. Still, there is room for further progress in this direction, and during the conference, instructions will be given as may be considered necessary to aid us in facilitating the work of manufacturing our own wool, leather, shoes, hats, and every, art and every other article of domestic necessity, just as far as our country will admit. We are always commanded, so says the revelation contained in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, given on the 19th of January, 1844, to build temples to the holy name of our Father in heaven. We are now engaged in this work. We are building a temple in this city, and one in St. George, and if any of you cast an eye at the beautiful foundation that is now raised up here by the tithes and offerings of the brethren, you can but rejoice in the idea that we are building to the name of our Father an edifice creditable to the work for which it is designed. We wish our brethren and sisters to remember this. It has been counseled and advised by our president and by those in authority that it would be a wise thing for every person in the church to contribute a monthly donation of a half dollar in money for the temple, that their names may be put in the book of the law of the Lord, that old and young among the Latter-day Saints may feel an interest in this matter, that on their fast days they may make this contribution to aid in supplying the necessary means to the workmen that cannot be procured without money, and the necessary materials to facilitate the work. 
If anybody will go and examine that foundation, the granite blocks that are lying around, and consider the expense of quarrying them and bringing them here, and of cutting them and fitting them in that foundation, they will realize that the brethren have been very industrious, and that a great work has been done. For such edifices are not erected without great labor, time, and expense. We therefore desire the brethren to take into consideration during the conference such subjects as pertain to the advancement of these temples. We also wish, during the conference, to call the attention of the brethren to the propriety of some two or three hundred hands from different parts of the northern settlements volunteering to go to St. George this winter to work on the temple, making a donation of their labor. During last winter, quite a number of the brethren went down from San Pete and some of the neighboring counties, and put in about three months' work, and during the entire winter, there were only seven and a half days they could not lay stone on the temple, and they were mostly rainy days. Those of us who have not got anything to employ us to advantage during winter can go down there and put in three or four months' work on that temple, in getting lumber and hauling it, to quarrying rock and cutting and setting it, in making mortar, providing lime and hauling it, and in aiding in all the various departments of labor necessary. We can have the walls put up and get the timber ready for the roof during the winter, while we should be doing comparatively little at home. This is one item that I wish to have considered through the conference. There will be some missionaries called during conference whose duty it will be to preach the gospel and defend the interests of Zion in the United States, Canada, and other parts of the world. We would invite our brethren and sisters living in this neighborhood, as long as there are vacant seats here, to come and occupy them, while the elders shall give them instructions. And we ask every man and woman who fears the Lord to lift their hearts to him in prayer, that his blessings may rest upon the elders, that President Young may be healed of his afflictions, and have health and strength to perform the duties of his calling, and that all the elders who rise to speak may be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, that we may be instructed, not from the mere natural wisdom of the individual, but by the inspiration of the Spirit of the Almighty, that our testimony, our knowledge of the gospel, the principles of salvation as revealed unto us, may be inspired unto us by the power of the Almighty, that we may know up for ourselves and not for another that we have received the gospel of Jesus Christ, these are some of the items that will be spoken of during the conference as the Spirit may direct, as well as other matters pertaining to Zion. You remember the revelation in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants given June 22, 1834, on Fishing River, Clay County, Missouri. It says, 7. And let all my people who dwell in the regions round about be very faithful, and prayerful, and humble before me, and reveal not the things which I have revealed unto them, until it is wisdom in me that they should be revealed. Talk not of judgments, neither boast of faith nor of mighty works, but carefully gather together as much in one region as can be, consistently with the feelings of the people. And behold, I will give unto you favor and grace in their eyes, that you may rest in peace and safety, while you are saying unto the people, Execute judgment and justice for us, according to law, and redress us of our wrongs. 8. Now behold, I say unto you, my friends, in this way you might find favor in the eyes of the people until the army of Israel becomes very great, and I will soften the hearts of the people as I did the heart of Pharaoh from time to time, until my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and mine elders, whom I have appointed, shall have time to gather up the strength of my house, and to have sent wise men to fulfill that which I have commanded concerning the purchasing of all lands in Jackson County that can be purchased, and in the adjoining counties round about, for it is my will that these lands should be purchased, and after they are purchased, that my saints should possess them according to the laws of consecration which I have given. And after these lands are purchased, I will hold the armies of Israel guiltless in taking possession of their own lands, which they have previously purchased with their monies, and of throwing down the towers of mine enemies that may be upon them, and scattering their watchmen, and avenging me of mine enemies unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. 9. But first let my army be very great, and let it be sanctified before me, that it may become fair as the sun and clear as the moon, and that her banners may become terrible unto all nations, that the kingdoms of this world may be constrained to acknowledge that the kingdom of Zion is in very deed the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Therefore let us become subject unto her laws. 10. Verily I say unto you, it is expedient in me that the first elders of my church should receive their endowment from on high, and in my house, which I have commanded to be built unto my name in the land of Kirtland. And let those commandments which I have given concerning Zion and her law be executed and fulfilled, after her redemption. 
there has been a day of calling, but the time has come for a day of choosing, and let there be chosen that are worthy. And it shall be manifest unto my servants by the voice of the Spirit, those that are chosen, and they shall be sanctified. And inasmuch as they will follow the counsel which they receive, they shall have power after many days to accomplish all things pertaining to Zion. 11. And again I say unto you, Sue for peace, not only the people that have smitten you, but also to all people, and lift up an ensign of peace, and make a proclamation for peace unto the ends of the earth, and make proposals for peace unto those who have smitten you, according to the voice of the Spirit which is in you, and all things shall work together for your good. Therefore be faithful, and behold, and lo, I am with you even unto the end. Even so, amen. Let us consider these things and sanctify ourselves in all humility. God has preserved us from all our enemies for over forty years since this revelation was given, and we occupy many cities, towns, and settlements, and should improve in all the goodly graces of the gospel preparatory to the great work still before us, for the promises of God are true and will not fail. Oliver Cowdery, previous to his apostasy, said to President Joseph Smith, If I should leave the church, it would break up. Joseph said to Oliver, What? Who are you? The Lord is not dependent upon you, and the work will roll forth, do what you will. Oliver left the church and was gone about ten years. Then he came back again to a branch of the church in meeting on Mosquito Creek in Pottawatomie County, Iowa. The body of the church had come off here to the west, but there was still remaining there a branch about 1,500 or 2,000 people. And when he came there, he bore his testimony to the truth of the Book of Mormon and the divine mission of the Twelve Apostles, and asked to be received into the church again, and said that he had never seen in all his life so large a congregation of saints as the one then assembled. We loved to hear Brother Oliver testify. We were pleased with his witness, but when he had passed off and went among our enemies, he was forgotten, and the work rolled steadily along, step by step, so that ten years after, when he came back to an outside branch, he expressed his astonishment at seeing such a vast body of saints. Some men in their hours of darkness may feel, I have heard of men feeling so, that the work is about done, that the enemies of the saints have become so powerful, and bring such vast wealth and energy to bear against them, that we are all going to be crushed out pretty soon. I will say to such brethren, it is a very bad policy for you, because you think the old ship Zion is going to sink, to jump overboard, for if you jump overboard, you are gone anyhow, and the old ship Zion will ride triumphantly through all the storms, and everybody who proves unworthy to remain on board of her and jumps overboard will repent of it when it is too late, as many have done already. The gospel of Jesus Christ is true, and the Lord has revealed this work. It has been said, Oh, what vast, what wonderful ability Brigham Young has possessed to do what has been done. The fact in this case is, it is the Lord who has done it. He has guided and directed and has done the work, and his servants who have labored in it have only been instruments in his hands. He has given them all the ability, wisdom, and knowledge which has been manifested, and the same God has the power to still guide, control, instruct, uphold, and he will do so. Those who fall into darkness, error, folly, and wickedness simply lose their position, but they who endure to the end, the same will be saved. The great work which has been commenced in these last days will continue until, by and by, when the Lord sees fit, he will come to his temple and will receive his saints as his own. Let us then devote our time and attention for a few days to receiving instruction and counsel, that we may have our hearts comforted and renew our testimony. For I can assure you, as the Lord God of hosts lives, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true, and all of us who fall into darkness and go astray will be the losers. Zion will ride triumphant, which may God grant for Jesus' sake. Amen. Elder C. C. Rich was pleased to know that we lived in a day of inspiration from the Almighty. Such a privilege had not been enjoyed for many generations past. To know that we had a work committed to our care from God should inspire us with courage and determination to do all we could. The labor we were called upon to do not only pertained to our own temporal and spiritual affairs, but also to the salvation of our friends who were dead. He showed up the ruinous policy of supplying our wants from a foreign market and strongly advocated a self-sustaining practice, which was the only way we could ever advance in temporal prosperity. No matter what amount of opposition might be arrayed against us as a people, if we would only be united in carrying out the counsels of the servants of God, 
all the efforts of the wicked would fail. We must obey the mandates of heaven through his servant Brigham, and the labor would be that of love. It was for us to be continually on the watchtower to avoid every evil practice in ourselves and others, so that we might finally overcome. Elder Brigham Young, Jr. said he had a testimony to bear. It was a great thing to know God and his son Jesus, and that there was a man on the earth who was inspired to lead men in the path that would bring them back again into the presence of God. He had received the above testimony for himself that God spoke to his servants in this our day, just as tangibly as ever to Isaiah, Jeremiah, or any of the ancient prophets. Flesh and blood did not reveal this fact to him, but he received it from God himself, and thousands of Latter-day Saints could bear the same testimony. Therefore, the world, who heard this testimony and rejected it, would most certainly be under condemnation. Thousands had been gathered to this territory in consequence of the promise of the servants of God, that a testimony should be given them if they would obey, with an honest heart, the principles of the gospel. While the peaceful inhabitants of this territory were honestly engaged in building up and happifying the condition of themselves and families, and emigrating the poor from foreign countries, besides spending thousands and millions of dollars in building temples, etc., why should they be persecuted by those who ought to know better? But as long as God revealed to him that it was his duty to preach the gospel, he intended by his help to continue to the end, risking all consequences. Saints are living witnesses of the truth, the people of God preserved by divine providence, persecution, individual salvation. Discourse by Elder Brigham Young, Jr., delivered at the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Tuesday morning, October 6, 1874, reported by David W. Evans. I have a testimony also to offer to my brethren and sisters. It is a great thing in my estimation to know God and His Son, to know that God has established the kingdom of the latter days, and to realize that there are men upon the earth who are capable, through the revelations of Almighty God, to teach the people the way of life, to point out to them the path by which they may regain the presence of their Father and God. Such is the testimony I have had, such a testimony I have at the present time. I am aware that to some it seems incredible, and that in their ears it sounds preposterous to utter such words, and especially does it seem so to those who consider that they are living in the blaze of the Christian religion, for the large majority of that class of people will not for a moment entertain the idea that God will ever again speak to men upon the earth, or inspire them as he did anciently. They believe the day has gone by when such things can be, and that having the Bible in their possession it is no more necessary for God to make known his will to man. I am aware that the Christian world view it in this light, but I cannot help that. I am not responsible for them, nor they for me. I stand for myself, and am supported by the evidence which I have received from Almighty God. If they can testify to me that Christian religion is true, I can, in turn, testify to them that God has revealed himself, that he has again spoken to men upon the earth, and that they hear his voice just as much as Isaiah, Ezekiel, or any of the prophets of the ancient days. This is my testimony, and I know it to be true. By the same Spirit that revealed unto Peter his Lord and Savior, I know that Jesus is the Christ. This has not become knowledge with me through the testimony of others alone. I sought and received that testimony for myself. Said Jesus unto Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for the flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I testify to you this day, that that same God has revealed unto me that these things are true, that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that this people represent the kingdom of God, which Daniel and others of the ancient prophets said should be established upon the earth in the latter days. That is the testimony which I have to offer here this morning. If I stood alone in this matter, and there was no other person who could bear the same testimony, perhaps people would be justified in disbelieving me, that is, if I gave them no evidence of the truth of my words. But when the proof is positive and the evidence is incontrovertible, when there are scores of thousands of people gathered from, as well as scattered through, the nations of the earth, who can rise as one person and bear this testimony? The nations of the earth will condemn it if they reject it. It is true that Joseph Smith was an unsupported witness in some respects of the gospel which he had to reveal unto the human family. He came forth a boy, alone. His testimony was given to the world, and God, in his wonderful providences, fulfilled the words of that boy, and others were induced to believe what he told them. He told the people that if they would obey the will of the Father, 
if they would repent of their sins, be baptized for the remission of them, and have hands laid upon them for the reception of the Holy Ghost, they should receive it, and it should be a witness unto them that his words were true and faithful. Have the words of Joseph Smith been fulfilled in this and in other respects? I answer yes. He bore this mission unto the people, and it, with its promises, came to me, and I obeyed it, doing as I was told in that order, that I might obtain the evidences of the Holy Spirit. Did I obtain them? Yes, I did. And here is a congregation before me, the representatives of a great people who can bear witness with me this day that the words of Joseph the prophet were true and faithful to this generation. Our testimony is not unsupported, for I have gone forth into the midst of the nations of the earth, and have stood before strangers, and have said unto them, If you desire the knowledge that the prophets who were with Jesus on the earth possessed, if you will do those things which have been commanded, you shall know of the doctrine, whether I speak of myself or of God who sent me. I have borne this testimony hundreds of times to the nations of the earth, because I was sent forth to do it, and I had a testimony that it was my mission to testify of these things. What has been the results of the elders going to the nations of the earth and bearing this testimony? We see before us a mighty people gathered in these mountains. There is scarcely an adult who has been gathered here who came with any other purpose but to build up the kingdom of God, because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit which he or she received through obedience to the words which were declared unto them. If any have gathered here with any other purpose, they are not in this church, or if they are, they will not remain in it very long. This people have gathered here by scores of thousands. Cannot those who are not of us put their prejudices to one side for a moment and take a fair and impartial view of the circumstances which surround us? Cannot the world look upon the Latter-day Saints and ask themselves, Is it possible for men to make these promises, and yet be impostors and deceive the people to the extent they have? Have the elders deceived the people? It looks to me like folly in the extreme for people to entertain such an idea. Have we deceived the people? No, sirs, we have not. Were these words false which were uttered by the elders when they were called upon the people to repent? No, the people verily received that testimony of the truth of this work by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, which was promised them by the elders, and that is the reason why so many have gathered to these mountains. But the majority of people now are like the Jews when they arraign Jesus. They want a miracle. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is he that smote thee? That is exactly the same spirit that prevails now. If you Latter-day Saints have the blessings and gifts you talk of, why don't you rise up in power? Why does not God come out of his hiding place and preserve you from your enemies? I can testify today that he has done so. From my earliest recollections I have been wandering with his people. I have been with them when driven before their enemies, with my father and his family in their persecutions. And I know, as I know that I live, that God has stretched out his hand and preserved this people when nothing but his providences could have saved them. Who are they who smote this people? Are they righteous men, men who are seeking to benefit the human family? Are they men who are turning their whole attention to benefit their fellow men, or building up principles of righteousness and truth to sustain the poor, and to gather them from the nations of the earth to a land where they can possess these comforts and blessings which should surround the sons and daughters of our, of our God? No, they do not busy themselves about such things as these. They have business on hand, which they think is more important. They have Latter-day Saints to persecute. They do not have time to turn their attention, nor their minds, to such trifles as bringing the poor from the nations of the earth or developing the resources of a great country. They have no time for this. They have a far greater work on hand, opposing the progress of this people and the fulfillment of the prophecies of men of God who have lived upon this earth. That is the view I take of it from my standpoint. Of course, I do not expect others outside of the church to look at it as I do, but this people are engaged in what? First, at the present time, in defending themselves, trying to secure their lives and property from men who are seeking to deprive them of both. They are also continuing their efforts to bring the downtrodden of Europe and every other nation to this land of America, where they can enjoy freedom and religious liberty, and have a home and not be servants of those who are more wealthy than themselves. This people are expending millions of dollars to gather the poor from the nations of the earth, that they, with us, may enjoy the blessings of religious liberty and the blessings of this free land. Why don't these men who are persecuting us and all the time telling how mean and contemptible we are as a people turn their attention not to our sins, 
but to their own shortcomings, and pick the beam out of their own eyes before attending to the moat in ours, and then try to do something to ameliorate the condition of the human family. These are simply my views on the subject, and I would to God that every man in this great nation would do right himself, and not seek to persecute his neighbors because he thinks they are doing wrong. A man might do a thing which, according to his conscience, he would be perfectly justified, but from my standpoint it would be very wicked. A heathen might be justified in doing that which I should consider a great crime. Shall I go to work and persecute an individual that does not see exactly as I see? Should I be justified in doing this? No. If I see a person in the wrong, I am justified in going to him and trying to teach him the principles of the gospel, which I find contained in the Bible, and which God has revealed to the human family for their salvation. In other words, I should be justified in trying to lead him in what I believe to be the path of righteousness, but I should not be justified in trying to drive him. Is this the course that is being pursued by us? By no means. The spirit manifested toward us continually is, if you don't do as we say, we will force you. Nobody comes here to persuade us. Their object is to compel us to bow to their wishes. They wish to make us forsake that which we revere and consider holy, simply because they despise it and deride it as something that ought to be put down by force. It is not a Christian spirit that induces persecution, not at all. Why not take the example of Jesus, whom they profess to worship? If this people are wrong, convince them of their error. Oh, say they, we can't do it. It is like the king of Denmark, Frederick the Seventh, if I mistake not. The priests complained to him and said that they could not put down the Latter-day Saints, that they were proselyting in spite of all they could do. Said the king, Why don't you take the Bible and confound them and let the people see their errors? The priest said, We have tried that but have not succeeded. They have more arguments in the Bible than we have. Well, said the king, I think yours is the poorest religion of the two. I will let the Latter-day Saints go on and shall not interfere with them. I would like this position to be taken by those in this nation who are opposed to us, but they will not assume this position, for we can correct them with the scriptures of divine truth. Why do they not use the word of God in their operations against us, instead of the carnal weapons which they happen to have because they belong to a certain party? Why not imitate the example of Jesus and try and persuade us, if we are in the wrong, and put us in the right? We desire to be saved. It is salvation we hope for. It is the desire for salvation in the kingdom of God that prompts me to say these things. And as long as God shows to me that I am right, as long as I have an approving conscience before him in carrying out the doctrines which I believe in, so long, with the help of God, will I advocate them. Let the issue be what it may. Amen. The choir sang the anthem, Who is Like Unto Thee? Benediction by President D. H. Wells. Afternoon. Choir sang, Come all ye saints who dwell on earth, your cheerful voices raise. Prayer by Elder A. Carrington. Choir sang, Happy the man who finds the grace, the blessings of God's chosen race. Elder John Taylor felt happy for the privilege of talking over the things of the kingdom of God. The labor involved in this kingdom differs from every other on the face of the earth, and the situation we now find ourselves in he did not think we were responsible for it being part of a program that was designed and planned before the world was. He reviewed the history of past generation in connection with the great purposes of the Almighty, the wickedness and degeneracy of man, and the justice of God in sweeping them from the face of the earth, not permitting them to propagate their corrupt species, but of their going into the spirit world, where they had to remain until Jesus, in the meridian of time, went to open the prison doors and preach deliverance to the captive, as it is written, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. He also adverted to the ancient men of God who held the everlasting priesthood, and by it were enabled to comprehend the dealings of God towards his people as parts of a great plan devised in the bosom of the Almighty. After the days of Abraham, the people gradually degenerated and fell into darkness, and God had to introduce the law of carnal commandments. We next found a family transplanted to this continent who grew into a great and mighty people, partly righteous and partly wicked, and were visited by the blessings and judgments of the Almighty, according to their works. For over two hundred years they lived as a united and happy people. God had revealed many things to Joseph Smith which he knew nothing about until they were revealed, such as the first principles of the gospel, the gathering, the building of temples, etc. All these things that pertain to this dispensation came from God and not from man. Therefore we had been sustained and should continue to be so long as we adhered to his counsels through his servants. 
Those who combined together to stop the work of God were simply reckoning without their host. Their feeble efforts would signally fail, for God was at the helm. Let us feel that we were engaged in building up the kingdom of God and lay aside all contracted notions. Let us help to build temples that all people that had ever lived might be felt after to do them good and attend to the ordinances of the gospel for them. All the ancient men of God who once lived and now lived were operating behind the veil in the rolling forth of this great Latter-day work, as well as we were. Therefore, let us labor with our hands and means to build these temples. Let us lay aside selfish and oppressive feelings and be more godlike and noble in all our labors. The kingdom of God was onward and upward, and no power on the earth could prevent it. This he prophesied in the name of Israel's God. Destruction of the Wicked by the Flood Wisdom in God Priesthood Temples Intelligence comes from God. The Lord will take care of the saints. Angels operating with men in the work of human redemption. Discourse by Elder John Taylor, delivered at the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Wednesday, October 7, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. I am happy to have the opportunity of meeting with the brethren and to talk over the affairs pertaining to the kingdom of God in this conference. We are engaged in a work in which all of us are interested, individually and collectively. It is a work that differs from anything else that exists at the present time on the face of the earth, and in many respects it differs from anything that has ever existed. I do not know that we are in any wise responsible for this, or for the position in which we find ourselves. The circumstances with which we are surrounded are not particularly or specially of our own making, nor the principles in which we believe. We have an abiding faith, as we heard referred to this morning, in certain principles which have emanated from the heavens, and we find ourselves on the earth at this particular time, in this peculiar dispensation, and engaged in a work that is dependent, I was going to say altogether upon the Almighty, and which is part and parcel of that program which existed in his mind before the world rolled into existence. There have been different dispensations existing in the various ages of time, as the purposes of God have rolled on in relation to this earth. All of them, more or less, partook of the same principles that have been revealed unto us, that is so far as the gospel is concerned, but all of them more or less differing. The first commandment given to man was to be fruitful, to multiply and replenish the earth. In other words, an earth had been created and it was necessary, as it had been brought into existence and man placed upon it, that his seed should be propagated, and that there might be bodies prepared for spirits to inhabit, that they together might accomplish certain purposes in the designs of God pertaining to the creation of the earth. By and by we find the people departing from the principles of truth, from the laws of the gospel, repudiating the fear of God, grieving his Holy Spirit, and incurring his displeasure. Then a flood came, and the inhabitants of the world, with the exception of a very few, were swept from it. After the gospel had been preached to all who then lived, and all had had an opportunity to believe in and obey it, a few of them did so and lived in the fear of God, and according to the revelations which we have, they were translated and caught up. They had a separate existence from those who lived upon the earth and occupied the position of translated beings and were necessarily governed by other laws than the denizens of the earth. This was one peculiarity of the dispensation before the flood. Then came the flood, which many people, unacquainted with things as they existed in the bosom of God and with his purposes and designs, consider was a great cruelty, an act of tyranny, evincing a spirit of outrage and oppression upon the inhabitants of the world. Skeptics reason in this manner sometimes. The only reason of their caviling being that they do not understand God or his laws and designs in relation to the earth and the inhabitants that live upon it. And being ignorant of these things, they are not competent judges as to the fitness of things generally and the course pursued by the Almighty in relation to the inhabitants of the earth. Hence they arrive at all kinds of foolish conclusions. The fact is, there were certain ideas connected with the destruction of the world that were good, proper, and merciful. Mankind had committed unto them certain powers, among which was the power to perpetuate their own species, of which they could not, according to the laws of nature, be deprived while living. And they had a certain agency of their own, which they could act upon, and the people who were destroyed in the flood had departed from the laws of God. Man has a dual being, not only a body of mortal tabernacle, but a spirit, and that spirit existed before he came here. And if men before the flood had been allowed to go on in their iniquities, 
and if, with every thought and imagination of their hearts, which were all unlawful and evil, they had been allowed to perpetuate that kind of existence, of course God would have had very little to do with the operations of the earth and the inhabitants thereof. It would therefore have been unjust to the spirits created by our Father in the eternal worlds to force them to come and inhabit the degenerated bodies which they must have received from such characters as the generation drowned in the flood. And hence God took away their agency by destroying them from the face of the earth, because they were prostituting their powers to an improper use, and not only injuring themselves by defying the law of God, but also inflicting an evil upon unborn generations by perverting their own existence, and by the, their powers of procreation entailing misery upon millions of spirits that had a just right to look for protection from their father. The Almighty, therefore, took this awful method to redress this aggravated wrong, and he had a right to do it. Why, our stock raisers act upon that principle a good deal. I was talking to one of them a little while ago, who had a large flock of sheep, and he told me that he had got some better stock and was going to kill off the poor ones in order that he might raise only good stock, and a better breed than he then had. I suppose that God had as much right to do this as the sheep raisers and cattle raisers have, and thus by cutting off that wicked generation from the earth, he deprived them of the privilege of propagating their own species. And what then? Oh, they were all damned. No, they were not quite. Yes, they were in part and partly not. God understands all these things, and manages matters according to the counsel of his will, and hence he provided a way whereby the people who were then drowned would not listen to God's laws, and who had departed entirely from the precepts of Jehovah, might hereafter have a chance of obeying the laws of life and salvation. Well, were they not all tea totally doomed to go and be roasted in flames forever and ever? Not quite, for we read that Jesus, when he was put to death in the flesh, was quickened in the spirit by which he went and preached to the spirits in prison that sometimes were disobedient in the days of Noah, when once the long-suffering of God waited upon them in those days. Hence we see that instead of being eternally damned, Jesus went to preach the gospel of life and salvation to those whom God, in the days of Noah, swept off by the flood, in order that he might introduce another state of things, and tried to raise up a people who would listen to his laws and obey his precepts. The scriptures say that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison, the same as he had preached to others on the earth. What did he preach? Do the scriptures say what he came to preach? Yes, they say he came to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those who were bound, and to open the prison doors to the captive. That is what he came to do, and he did it. We are not connected with a thing that will only exist for a few years. Some of the peculiar ideas and dogmas of men, some nice theory of their forming, the principles that we believe in, reach back into eternity. They originated with the gods in the eternal worlds, and they reach forward to the eternities that are to come. We feel that we are opening with God in connection with those who were, with those who are, and with those who are to come. We find that after the days of Noah, an order was introduced called the Patriarchal Order, in which every man managed his own family affairs, and prominent men among them were kings and priests unto God, and officiated in what is known among us as the priesthood of the Son of God, or the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Man began again to multiply on the face of the earth, and the heads of families became their kings and priests, that is, the fathers of their own people and they were more or less under the influence and guidance of the Almighty. We read, for instance, in our revelations pertaining to these matters of a man called Melchizedek, who was a great high priest. We are told that there were a great many high priests in his day, and before him and after him. And these men had communication with God, and were taught of him in relation to the general proceedings, and acknowledged the hand of God in all things with which they were associated. Noah and his descendants, for a length of time, did that which was right in the sight of God to a very great extent. But by and by they departed from his law, and Abraham was raised up as a special agent in the hand of the Almighty to disseminate correct principles among the people, and as a medium through which God would communicate intelligence and blessings to the human family. He went through a very rigid course of discipline, and was tried in almost every possible way, until finally he was called upon to offer up his son, and then, when he attempted to do that, and the Lord had fully proved him, the Lord said, I know that Abraham fears me, that he has not withheld his only son from me, and I know that he will command his children after him to fear my name. 
After God had tried Abraham, he took him to a mountain and said unto him, Lift up thine eyes eastward and westward and southward and northward, for to thee and thy seed after thee will I give this land, and in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That was a great blessing, and it placed Abraham in a most prominent and important position before God, before the people and before the world. Now, although God made that promise unto Abraham, yet Stephen, who lived some two thousand years afterwards, said that God gave him none inheritance in that land, no, not so much as to set foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him and to his seed after him. There was something peculiar about these men, being in possession of an everlasting priesthood, which is without beginning of days or end of years. They measured things with the eye of the Almighty, by the principle of faith by the knowledge and intuition which the Spirit of God gave them, and the revelations which it imparted. And they felt like one of old, who said, When a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my life, to my appointed time, will I wait until the change come. Inspired by the Spirit of the living God, in possession of the principles of revelation, holding the keys of the everlasting priesthood, which unlocked the mysteries of the kingdom of God, they looked forward and backward, and felt that they were a part of a great program which God designed to accomplish in regard to the earth. It was not for the immediate possession of some temporary good, not for the grasping of something that they could hold for the time being, that they were anxious, but they were after riches, exaltations, glory, and blessings that would continue while life or thought or being lasts and immortality endures. From the loins of Abraham a great many great prophets, seers, revelators, men of God, kings, princes, and authorities descended, and they raised up a nation that was powerful in its day and generation. But they, like others, finally departed from the laws of God and from the principles of eternal truth. And then the power of Melchizedek priesthood was withdrawn from them, and the law was added because of transgression, and although they became numerous, great, wealthy, wise, and intelligent people, yet they lost for a long time the power, intelligence, life and light of revelation which the gospel imparts. Then came the time when Jesus appeared on the earth. He was a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, and he came to accomplish things which had been planned by the Almighty before the world was. He was the being to whom the antediluvians, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, patriarchs, and those who were filled with the Spirit of God and the light of revelation referred to, and to whom they looked, To him pointed all their sacrifices and the shedding of blood of bulls and goats, heifers, lambs, etc. Jesus introduced the gospel, and if the people would have received and obeyed the principles which he taught, the kingdom of God would have been established. The dispensation of the fullness of times brought in, and the temple at Jerusalem, the baptisms for the dead would have gone on, and the redemption of the living and the dead would have proceeded. But the people could not receive the teachings of Jesus, There was a dispensation different from any of the others. There was an Elias to come, who would turn the hearts of the children to the fathers, and the hearts of the fathers to the children. And when it was asked, Jesus, art thou the Elias which was to come, or do we look for another? It was told them, This is he, if ye can receive it. But they could not. And consequently they beheaded John the Baptist and crucified Jesus. And it was declared that not one stone of their magnificent temple should be left upon another, without being thrown down, which was literally fulfilled. And the ground upon which it stood was plowed over. Jesus told his disciples that when they saw Jerusalem encompassed about with armies, they were to flee to the mountains. One of the prophets, in speaking of the affairs that were then to take place, said that a certain power should arise, which should make war with and prevail against the saints, and that the power should seek to change the times and the laws, and that they should be given into his hand for a time and times, and the dividing of times. Very well, these things have taken place. We now turn our attention to this continent to find that God transplanted a people who were of the seed of Abraham from Palestine to this continent. Here they passed through all kinds of vicissitudes and changes, sometimes abounding in iniquity and vice, at other times full of virtue. Sometimes they acknowledged the hand of God, and at other times disregarded it. Sometimes they were chastened by the Almighty, and at other times permitted to go on in their iniquities. At one time there was a people on this continent who lived for nearly two hundred years in the fear of God, under the direction of his Spirit, governed by the laws of the gospel, who had all things common among them, and we are informed that there never was a more united, happy, and prosperous people upon the face of the earth. 
these are some of the changes that have taken place here. And now we are living in another age and under other circumstances. The world is waxing old. Myriads of people have lived upon it. Generation after generation have come and gone. Some good, some bad, some very wicked, some very righteous, some pure and holy, others to the contrary, embracing every kind and all the peculiar phases that have been developed by the human family. They have come into existence, and they have died. And what of them? What of the good, and what of the bad? What of the righteous, and what of the unrighteous? What of their standing before God, and what of the nations that have existed, that do exist, and that will exist? These are things which, as intelligent, immortal beings, demand our consideration. And what of us as part of them? We need to reflect and it is proper that we should understand something in relation to these things. We have our part to perform. We find ourselves in the world in this day and age, which is that which is spoken of by Paul, the dispensation of the fullness of times, when God would gather together all things in one, whether they be things in the heavens or things of the earth. There is something very remarkable, very peculiar in that expression. What the gathering is in the heavens, it is not for us to say at the present time, what the gathering is on the earth, we have some little idea from the things with which we are associated. There is a peculiarity about it. As I said before, we find ourselves living in this day, and we are called upon to perform a certain work in connection with the economy and designs of God pertaining to the earth we live on, pertaining to ourselves, to our progenitors, and to the whole human family that have existed upon the face of the earth. We are here to do a certain work which God has set, to us, set us to do, and as I have said, we have had very little to do in bringing about the matter. We did not originate it. We talk sometimes about Joseph Smith. He did not originate it. He told us about a great many things that we talk about, and unfolded many principles unto us. But how did he know them? God called him and set him apart as he called Noah in his day, and as he called Enoch, Abraham, and Moses in their day, and as he called the prophets and Jesus in their day as he called Nephi, Lehi, Moroni, and Alma in their day upon this continent. He has called us, and has introduced to our view certain principles, and we have been learning these principles gradually. The first thing was to get baptized, a very simple affair, a very little thing. Nevertheless, it was an ordinance of God. He appointed it, and we went and were baptized. Then we had hands laid upon us for the reception of the Holy Ghost, and we partook more or less of its influence, according to our faithfulness and diligence in keeping the commandments of God. We had not anything to do with originating this work, neither had Joseph Smith, neither had Oliver Cowdery, nor Brigham Young, nor any of the twelve, nor the first council, nor the bishops, nor any other man living. God has his work to perform, and at the proper time, and in his own way, he will fulfill his own purposes and build up his kingdom. He commenced it at his own time. He called Joseph Smith and gave him revelation. He told him about the ancient history of the people of this continent and enabled him to translate. He gave him a key to all these things. He could not have done it without any more than you or I could. He was indebted to God just as much as you and I are, and so were his brethren who were with him. Joseph Smith had many revelations, but who gave them to him? By what spirit and intelligence were they unfolded and communicated to his mind? God revealed them to him. He obeyed the behests of Jehovah. When God called him and set him apart, he was obedient, just the same as you and I were. When the elders of Israel came forth to preach the everlasting gospel, we obeyed it, and through obedience we obtained the Spirit of God that brought us into the position which we occupy at the present time. And now about the gathering. Who understood anything about it? The ancient prophets prophesied about it. But what did we know about it? Or what do the world today know about it? Nothing, only as has been revealed. If God had not revealed it, we should not have been as ignorant as the rest of mankind are. And so we should be about our ceilings, and the covenants that men and women make with one another, that the fools around us do not comprehend. They think we are fools, but we know they are. That is the difference between us. We know they are ignorant, brutish, foolish, and know not God nor his laws, nor the principles of truth. But we know something about these things, because God has revealed them to us. We heard this morning that this was a time in which to build temples, and you know that we are now engaged in a work of that kind. Why are we thus engaged? Is it for our sakes only? God forbid. The gospel that we preach is not for ourselves only. We have not preached it these many years that we might make money by it. 
I have traveled a great many thousands of miles to preach this gospel without purse and without scrip, and I see many men around and before me who have done the same thing. Was it for ourselves? No. Was it because it was pleasant? No, but God had revealed certain principles to us pertaining to the salvation of the world in which we live. He had committed a dispensation of the gospel to us, and it was woe unto us if we preached not that gospel, whether we liked it or not. But we did like it, and we went forth in the name of Israel's God, and God went with us and sanctioned our testimony by his Spirit and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. We could not have done these things, or I will acknowledge that I could not, neither could any of my brethren, unless God had been with us. We had not sufficient faith and intelligence, but God imparted his Spirit, his intelligence, and the gift of the Holy Ghost to the elders of Israel, and they went forth bearing precious seed, the seed of eternal life. And they came again rejoicing, and bringing their sheaves with them. And here they are gathered into the garner. What for? For ourselves? No, we are or ought to be co-workers with God in the accomplishment of his purposes in relation to the world in which we live, and people that have lived before us, and those that shall come after us. The principles which we are in possession of emanated from God. The priesthood which God has revealed emanated and originated with the gods in the eternal worlds. It is the principle by which they are governed, and by which God governs all things which exist. And we, as the servants of God, acknowledge the hand of God in all these things. Can I preach? Do I have any intelligence? God imparted it. Can my brethren preach? Have they intelligence? God imparted it. Did Joseph Smith or Brigham Young have intelligence? God imparted it. Have we been delivered at various times, and has the hand of God been manifested in our behalf? Yes, or we could not have been here today. The powers of darkness would have prevailed against us. The enemies of Zion would have put their feet upon their necks, and, have, and would have trampled us to the dust of death long ago. We talk about the intelligence that has been manifested in connection with this work. Where did it come from? It came from God. As you heard this morning, God, in answer to the prayers of thousands, has inspired his servants and has given them intelligence to carry on his work. It has been carried on under the influence, guidance, and direction of the Spirit of God. Without that, none of us could have done anything more than the rest of mankind. Who led us? God. Who has sustained us here? God. And who will continue to sustain us? The Almighty. These fools who think they can trample underfoot the servants of God and overthrow the kingdom of God are reckoning without their host. They are pushing against the buckler of the great Jehovah, and they will find that he will put a hook into their nose and lead them in a path that they know not of. Israel will rise and shine, and the power of God will rest upon his people, and the work that he has commenced will roll forth until the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he shall rule for ever and ever. The purposes of God are not going to be thwarted by the folly, vanity, and ignorance of men. And as we had very little to do with introducing these things, we have really very little to do with carrying them on. Somebody was speaking this morning in reference to certain men who thought that, if they left the church, the work would not go on. That is perfectly ridiculous. There are certain things that have to be accomplished in the economy of God, and no man or combination of men can stop them. No influence that the world can exert can hinder them. For God is at the helm, and he will roll forth his own work. Hear it, you men of the world. You cannot go further than God will let you, any more than the Latter-day Saints can. It is in God's work that we are engaged. There is nothing really selfish about our operations when we come right down to the bottom of the work. For we are all engaged with God, and with the spirits of just men made perfect, and with the priesthood that have existed before us, and with the intelligences that surround the throne of God. With all these intelligences, we are united in the grand work of rolling forth the designs and purposes of God. You do not have the Latter-day Saints only to fight against, but you have to fight all the just and good who have lived and died on the earth, and who live again. And besides these, you have to fight with God and his angels and the intelligences who surround the th his throne. As Latter-day Saints, we are sometimes apt to think that we must look after ourselves individually. We are a good deal like the man who, when praying, said, God bless me and my wife, my son John and his wife, us four and no more. Amen. There was no philanthropy, benevolence, or kind feeling towards the rest of mankind there, and too many of us feel a good deal the same way. As Latter-day Saints, we ought to feel, and when we feel right, we shall feel, that we are the representatives of God upon the earth, that we are engaged in building up his kingdom, 
that we are living in an age when God designs to accomplish certain purposes, and we are desirous of cooperating with Him in that labor. And it is our mission to help to save the living, to redeem the dead, and bring to pass the things spoken of by the prophets. This is the position that we occupy, and a great many things have yet to be introduced before these things can be accomplished. We are commencing to build temples, and hence, as I said before, our dispensation differs from others which have preceded it. It is a kind of a time for settling up accounts. You know, when a man goes to work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, he keeps account of what he does, and when Saturday comes, it is kind of a settling up day. It is so with us. It is so with the world. Our day is a kind of settling up day. The elders have been forth and gathered together a few of the people to whom they have preached. Others are gathering, and now we, at home here, are engaged in building temples. What for? For ourselves? Yes. For somebody else? Yes. For our friends who have lived? Yes. For other people's friends who have lived? Yes. And to feel after all nations who have lived. For we are interested in the welfare of all the peoples who have ever existed on this earth. And like God, we are feeling after them with a fatherly, kind, generous, and philanthropic feeling. That is why we are building our temples. That is why men are called upon to labor upon these temples. For we desire to enter therein, and to officiate and administer for the living and the dead. Well, but it takes a little money. Oh, does it? Never mind, the gold and the silver are the Lord's. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. And we shall get a little of his gold and silver, and in using it in building temples to the name of the Lord, we are taken into partnership with him. We unite with God, and with the angels, and with the spirits of just men made perfect, with the priesthood that existed anciently, and with the gods. We all unite together for the accomplishment of God's purposes, and we will feel after the inhabitants of the earth. If people are foolish around us, we cannot help that. Let them go on and exhibit their folly. God will take care of us. He is as much interested about us as we are, and a great deal more, and he is as much concerned about the rolling forth of this work as we are, and a good deal more. The ancient Nephites who lived on the earth, those men of God who, through faith, wrought righteousness, accomplished a good work, and obtained exaltation, are as much interested in the welfare of their descendants as we are, and a good deal more. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those ancient men of God who once lived on the earth, and who yet live, are as much interested in the accomplishment of God's purposes as we are, and a good deal more. Well, then, what have we to do? Why, to fulfill the duties devolving upon us as they come along day by day, and to introduce every principle that is calculated to save the living and redeem the dead. We are not alone in these things. Others are operating with us. I mean all the men of God who ever lived, and they are as much interested as we are, and a good deal more, for they know more, and they without us cannot be made perfect. Neither can we be perfected without them. We are building temples for them and for their prosperity, and we are going to operate in these temples as we have done heretofore, for their welfare and for the welfare of their posterity. And then they are operating for us behind the veil with God and the intelligences which surround his throne. And there is a combination of earthly beings and heavenly beings, all under the influence of the same priesthood, which is an everlasting priesthood and whose administrations are effective in time and in eternity. We are all operating together to bring about the same things and to accomplish the same purposes. Well, then what shall we do? We will build the temples. And don't you think we shall feel a little better while we are doing it? I think we shall. For while we are so doing, we shall have the approbation of God our Heavenly Father, and of all good men who have ever lived, and we may need this by and by when we get through this world, These Gentiles do not need anything of this kind. They are all going to heaven anyhow. But we want to make friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when we fail, they may receive us into everlasting habitations. I want friends behind the veil. I want to be the friend of God, and God to be my friend. I want to help to roll forth the kingdom of God, and to build up the Zion of the Most High. And I want to see my brethren engaged in the same work. And we will do it. In the name of Israel's God we will do it. We talk about the order sometimes. Well, we will do that too. What, would you? Yes, to be sure I would, or anything else that God wants of me. I am on hand. That is my feeling about these things. Well, but is there not a good many weaknesses to see? I think there is. Don't you think there is about you? Just examine yourselves and then answer the question whether you have not a good many weaknesses. 
I think there are a great many things among us that we ought to be ashamed of. We are covetous, grasping, and grinding. There is not enough human sympathy, brotherhood, and kindly feeling among us. Every man in Zion ought to feel that in every other he has a brother and a friend, and not a ravenous character who would grasp everything that he has, and grind him to the dust of the earth. I want liberality, generosity, kindness, and the love of God within us, and flowing around us like wells of water springing up unto everlasting life. These are the principles by which we ought to be actuated and governed. Let the potsherds of the earth strive with the potsherds of the earth. God will take care of his own affairs and manage them in his own way. Zion is onward. Her progress cannot and will not be retarded. I will prophesy it in the name of Israel's God. It is onward, 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 until the purposes of God shall be accomplished, until the towers of Zion shall arise, until her temple shall be built, until the living shall be saved, until the dead shall be redeemed, and until the knowledge of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let us, then, cleave to righteousness and truth, lay aside our folly, vanity, and nonsense, our egotism, ignorance, and covetousness, and everything that is wicked, sinful, narrow, and contracted, and let us feel that we are our servants of God, engaged in rolling forth his kingdom and accomplishing his purposes upon the earth. May God help us to be faithful. In the name of Jesus, amen. Elder W. Woodruff rejoiced that he had lived long enough to see and hear men who had moral courage sufficient to advocate the unpopular doctrines of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in this dispensation. God holds the destinies of all men, and no man can stay his hand, but his purposes would roll on, and all things would be accomplished according to his mind and will. All the revelations given by inspiration since the world began up to the present time would be fulfilled. All things spoke of pertaining to Zion in the last days would be brought to pass. The records which were deposited in the earth by the hand of the prophet Moroni many centuries ago, and in accordance with the sayings of Isaiah and Ezekiel, had been brought forth in this our day by Joseph Smith the prophet. The prayers of the thousands of saints in these valleys ascended to heaven in behalf of the servants of God, and that the purposes of God might be accomplished. This great latter-day work was commenced by the elders of Israel going forth without person's scrip, and testifying to the people what God had begun to usher in, and thousands were now to be seen here today as the result of their labors and the blessing of God accompanying them. All the revelations given by God through his servant Joseph Smith had been fulfilled to the very letter so far, and every other would be, for not one jot or tittle of the word of God would fail. When the Gentiles rendered themselves unworthy of eternal life, the gospel would be taken from them and offered to the Jews. No man need expect to prosper who dared to fight against God. But however much men might feel disposed to persecute and destroy this people, we had no desire to resent it for our object was to build up and not to destroy. We were not disposed to quarrel with any man about his religion, for that was a matter entirely between him and his God. We invited the closest investigation of our principles, for they were what God had revealed, and would bear the most rigid scrutiny and comparison. Hence our tabernacle had been open to different religious teachers for the advocacy of their peculiar tenets. The Gospel of Christ unpopular in every age of the world we have to live by faith. God has decreed that his kingdom will be established. The priesthood conferred upon Joseph Smith by holy angels. All blessings to be obtained from the God the saints worship. Discourse by Elder Wilford Woodruff, delivered in the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Wednesday, October 7, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. I did not have the privilege of listening to all the remarks of Elder Taylor this forenoon, Yet to what I did hear I can bear testimony of its truth. I always delight in seeing a man valiant in the testimony of Jesus Christ. There is something glorious in the principles of the gospel. I always did, from my boyhood, hope and pray that I might live long enough in the earth to find some man who would have sufficient courage and independence of mind to believe in the same doctrine and gospel that Jesus Christ taught. And I have lived long enough to see, hear, and partake of it, and I glory in it because it is true. The religion or gospel of Jesus Christ is a very unpopular thing, and has been in every age of the world. Show me a man who was ever inspired by of the Lord God of Israel to do a work for him who was popular. You cannot find such a man in the whole history of the world. You may take Noah, who was about a hundred and twenty years building an ark, and how many friends did he have? I think about seven in all. Lot was very unpopular the morning he left Sodom and Gomorrah, 
and so would have been all the patriarchs and prophets in every age of the world. Jesus Christ, when he came to Jerusalem, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the great Shiloh of the Jews, came to his own father's house. Yet there was not a man more despised in all Judea and Jerusalem than was Jesus Christ, from the day of his birth until he came to the cross. Why is this? Because men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. The Lord Almighty in the last days has set his hand to carry out and fulfill his words for the past five or six thousand years, given through the mouths of his servants, the prophets and apostles, wherever he has had them on the earth. He has commenced this work and he will perform it, for as Brother Taylor has justly said, there is no power on the earth that can stay his hand. For the simple reason that God controls the destinies of all men, kings, princes, rulers, presidents, statesmen, governors, nations, tongues, and people, upon the face of the whole earth, and men are placed in a position where they are under the necessity of exercising faith in God in order to build up his kingdom. Read the eleventh chapter of Hebrews and you will find that, beginning with the creation of the world, everything has been accomplished by faith. The whole of the work of all the ancient patriarchs and prophets was accomplished by the exercise of this principle, and it is just so in the last dispensation of the fullness of times. When God sent angels to Joseph Smith, he knew and understood, by the teachings given unto him, what he had to perform in a measure. The Lord called him to do a work, and raised him up for this purpose. Was Joseph Smith popular among men? No, never. He was persecuted until the day of his death, until he sealed his testimony with his blood. But the persecution against him and the unbelief of the world did not make the truth of God without effect. The Lord has carried out and fulfilled all these prophecies from the commencement until now, and there never has been a jot or tittle allowed to fall unfulfilled. There never was a revelation from the days of Father Adam until this, given by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, through the mouth of patriarch or prophet, that will fall unfulfilled. Though the heavens and the earth pass away, these things will not fail in their fulfillment, and as Brother Taylor has said, the world cannot stay the work of God. They never have done, and they never will. This is a different dispensation from all others. God has set to his hand to build up his kingdom in Zion, and that kingdom and Zion must be built up, or the revelations of God will fall unfulfilled. The Bible is full of these teachings, and they must have their fulfillment, and I bear testimony to their truth. The Bible is true, and its prophecies were spoken by holy men of old, as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. The revelations of Isaiah concerning the building up of the Zion of God in the last days will have their fulfillment. The house of God must be clothed with the glory of her God. The temple of God has got to be built also upon the tops of the mountains. The gospel must be preached to every nation under heaven before the end shall come. The world say they do not believe these things. That is true. We do not expect them. We never have expected them to believe them, but the unbelief of the world does not change the word of God. We have to live by faith. When Moroni hid in the earth the record which the Book of Mormon was translated from 400 years after Christ came in the flesh, he did it by faith, as much so as, Mo as Noah built the ark. He looked forward and saw that record come forth in the last days, in fulfillment of the sayings of Ezekiel and the sayings of Isaiah, when the stick of Joseph should be put with the stick of Judah, and they should become one stick in the hands of the servants of the Lord, before the eyes of the world, and when the truth should spring out of the earth and righteousness look down from heaven. These things were to be a beginning of the great work of God preparatory to the gathering of the twelve tribes of Israel in the latter days. The work has come forth, just as everything has been fulfilled, which has been done by faith but and by the commandment of God. When Joseph Smith began to receive revelations from God, he was a boy, an illiterate youth, and had he not had faith and in the inspiration of the Almighty upon him, he never could have had power and courage to go forth and introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ in the midst of a generation of false doctrine, ignorance, and darkness. But God preserved inspired and sustained him, and caused him to live upon the earth until he had planted this kingdom in fulfillment of the revelations. He organized the church. He received the holy priesthood from the hands of angels sent from God, men who held the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, and other generations upon the earth. They conferred upon Joseph all the powers and keys of the priesthood necessary to build up the kingdom of God upon the earth, and he lived long enough to organize that kingdom, and it will never be thrown down any more forever. The revelations of God to us have been encouraging, and we have seen them fulfilled. We shall continue to do so until the end. 
I will say to the Latter-day Saints that we are in the same position that other generations have been. We have got to walk by faith. We must have confidence in the fulfillment of the revelations of God. No man or woman on the face of the earth will ever be disappointed with regard to the fulfillment of the word of the Lord, for he has uttered decrees, made covenants, and through his servants the prophets has declared his word and will concerning the world and its inhabitants, and not one of his sayings will fail, all must be fulfilled. If it could be otherwise, the Zion of God would never be built up, but God has decreed that his kingdom will be established, that Zion will arise and shine, and that every weapon formed against her will be broken. The prayers of hundreds of thousands of saints dwelling in these valleys of the mountains daily ascend into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, beseeching him to fulfill his word upon the earth and to sustain his servants. Do not the saints pray for anybody else? Yes, they pray for everybody, for President Grant, Judge McKean, the governor of Utah, and every man holding official positions here, as well as for Brigham Young and the Apostles. These prayers ascend before the Lord, and they will be heard and answered. Talk about Brigham Young and Joseph Smith. How many have said to Joseph Smith, How on earth do you govern and control this people? How easy you do it. Our enemies today look at Brigham Young and say, If he would only die, Mormonism would stop. But in this they are mistaken. This work does not depend upon Brigham Young. It did not depend upon Joseph Smith. All the world thought if they could only slay Joseph Smith, there would be an end of Mormonism. And so there would have been, had it not been, the work of the Almighty. If it had been the work of man, it would long since have ceased to exist upon the earth. The power that has sustained this work from the beginning sustains it now. As Brother Taylor has said, all the holy prophets and apostles who have been slain on the earth for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God, and who now sit on the right hand of God in the heavens, are just as much engaged in carrying on the work of God here as when they lived in the flesh, and more so because they have more light and power. And Jesus Christ himself, who died on the cross, and after his resurrection visited the other sheep of his fold on this continent, and offered the gospel to Jew and Gentile, that same Jesus is pleading with the Father today, and has been from the day his body lay in the tomb, to carry out and fulfill his purposes, and to accomplish his work in our day and generation. We are not alone in our efforts to carry out the work of God. If the eyes of the world were open, they would see that there are more for us than against us. We are only, in one sense of the word, worms of the dust in the hands of God. This work does not depend on any man or set of men. The Lord Almighty has set his hand to accomplish his purposes, and he is feeling after the honest and meek throughout the world, in order to find those who are willing to take hold and help to build up his kingdom in the latter days. He has found a few, and he will find more. How has it been with Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, the Apostles, and thousands of the elders of Israel who have gone forth to preach the gospel to the world without purse or scrip, offering the word of life and salvation without money and without price? They have carried their knapsacks on their backs, or with valise in hand, have traveled thousands and thousands of miles for this purpose. They have been inspired to do this by the power of the, of the Most High God, and that inspiration has sustained them all the way through. It has upheld this church from the time it came forth until this hour, and will into its consumption. We came here on the 24th of July, 1847, having been driven from our homes, the graves of our fathers, and from lands we purchased from the general government because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, or in other words, because of our religion. We came here and found a barren desert containing nothing but a few roving Indians, coyote wolves, crickets, and grasshoppers. There was no mark of the Anglo-Saxon race or of the white man here then, but the whole region of country was a desert of the most forbidding and desolate character. Now when strangers come up to Zion on this great highway, cast up in fulfillment of the revelations of God, what do they see? They see no longer a desert, but a belt for six hundred miles of cities, towns, villages, orchards, fields, and crops. Who has done this? The Lord God of Israel has inspired his saints to do it. President Young has been led, guided, counseled, and moved upon by the Holy Ghost and by the revelations of Jesus Christ. And that which strangers now behold in this tabernacle and throughout this territory is in fulfillment of that volume of revelation which you can read in the prophecies of Isaiah and others of the prophets and patriarchs. These things are true, and your eyes can see them. Whether they believe them or not has nothing to do with it. I will tell you that if this work had not been of God, and God had not borne testimony to the preaching of the elders, 
we might have preached until we have been as old as Methuselah, and we could not have gathered the people from almost every nation under heaven as we have, as we have done, according to the predictions of the ancient prophets contained in the Bible. But the Lord has never disappointed anybody so far as this work is concerned. It did not stop after the death of Joseph, and it will never on account of the death of any man, prophet, apostle, or any other man, for it is in the hands of God, and he has decreed that it shall stand forever, and that it shall extend until its dominion becomes universal. We do not see today what we saw twenty-four years ago, and we do not see today what will be seen twenty-four years hence. There will be no stoppage to the building up of the Zion of God, or to the carrying out of his work. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, raised up by the Lord Almighty, and the inspiration of God guided and sustained him to the day of his death. He sealed his testimony with his blood, and that testimony is in force upon all the world. This record which I hold in my hands, Book of Doctrine and Covenants, contains the revelations of God, and in one of them the Lord says, Let earth and hell combine against you, and they shall not prevail. The kingdom is yours. I have given it into your hands, and you are called upon to build it up. The Lord is at the helm to govern, guide, and control this work, and he will do so unto, unto the end. Now when men undertake to fight against this work, as Brother Taylor has said, they fight against God. It is not against Brigham Young, the apostles, or this people alone, but it is against God. Every man will be rewarded according to his works. Our prayers go up before God day and night, that he will execute justice, judgment, righteousness, and truth, that he will sustain everything that leads to good, and does good, and that he will overthrow all that lead to evil and do evil, and we are assured by revelation that the Lord will hear and answer our prayers. The Lord is with this people, but as Latter-day Saints I do not think that we always prize our privileges. We are called upon to perform a work. The Lord has placed this work in our hands, and we are held responsible before the heavens and the earth to use the talents, the light and truth, which have been committed into our hands. What is this life? What are the things of this life? The Latter-day Saints are living for things the other side of the veil, the same as all servants of God have done in every age of the world. Now is it not a curiosity that so few of the human family have an interest in eternal things, things the other side of the veil? Bless your souls, our lives here are only a few days in duration, but on the other side of the veil we shall live eternally. We shall live and exist just as long as our Creator will exist, and our eternal destiny depends upon the manner in which we spend our short lives here in the flesh. Will it not pay any man, any prophet, apostle, or saint, in this or any other age of the world, to be true and faithful to his God, to magnify his calling, to be valiant in the testimony of Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel, to bear record of the things of the kingdom, to Jew and Gentile, and in his day and generation? Yes, it will pay men to do right, and men will sorrow and bitterly regret taking any course in this or any other generation against God or his work. What have been the afflictions of the Jews who rejected Christ? Why, every word spoken concerning them by Moses and Jesus has had its fulfillment until the present day. For hundreds of years past and gone, they have been a hiss and a byword, and trodden under the feet of the Gentiles, in fulfillment of the words of Jesus Christ, and they will continue in their present position until the ful fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Jesus offered his gospel to the Jews in his day, but in these latter days, it has been offered first to the Gentiles, thus fulfilling the saying that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And when the Gentiles count themselves unworthy of eternal life, the gospel will go to the house of Israel and they will receive it. The Gentiles should heed the warning given them by the Apostle Paul, lest they fall through an example of unbelief as did the Jews, who were broken off because they rejected the Messiah and refused the message of salvation which he delivered unto them. From that day to this they have been scattered, peeled, and afflicted. Their city was overthrown, and their temples destroyed, and the land of their fathers has been in the hands of Gentile nations until today. The Lord has said, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. And we may rest assured that the Lord will reward those who seek to destroy the lives of his people and to overthrow his kingdom. Vengeance is in the hands of the Almighty. I will fight your battles, saith the Lord. We do not seek any man's hurt, however much of an enemy he may be to us. We leave him in the hands of God, and we know that he will reward him, and the reward will be all that God, saints, angels, devils, or wicked men can ask, and it will be all that any man can want. When we undertake to fight against God, we have to pay for it. 
Men will have to pay for every sin committed in the flesh, no matter what they do. They will have to be accountable for it. If a man does right, is valiant in the testimony of Jesus Christ, obeys the gospel, and keeps his covenants, when he passes to the other side of the veil, he has an entrance into the presence of God and the Lamb. Having kept celestial law, he enters into celestial glory. He is preserved by that law, and he participates in that glory through the endless ages of eternity. It pays any man under heaven to obey and be faithful to the law of God, and the few days he spends in the flesh. I say to the world, to every sect under heaven, if you ever obtain any blessings in the eternal worlds from anybody at all, it will be from the God the Latter-day Saints worship. For God made us all, whether we are Methodists, Baptists, Mormons, or anything else, we are all the children of one parent. Then why should we persecute one another because of our religion? It is folly in the highest degree. We live in a land and under a constitution which guarantees the right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience to every sect, party, name, and denomination under heaven. Then why should we be so narrow-minded as to hate or seek to persecute or kill our neighbor because he differs from us in religion? We worship God, and we are Latter-day Saints because we know that the gospel which has been revealed in these latter days is true. We have received it and have realized the promises made to those who would not obey it. The Holy Ghost and the testimony of Jesus Christ never deceived us, and we have received this testimony while abroad in almost every nation under heaven. By this power we have been gathered. That is the reason that we are Mormons, as the world calls us. We know this work is true. We know it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would not persecute, abuse, or quarrel with any man because of his religious views. A man's religion, let it be what it will, is between him and his God. He is going to the eternal world, and he will receive his reward. And there is no reason or use in quarreling about religion. And we have never felt to do this in our lives. Whatever may have been said concerning us, our tabernacles, this and others, have been open to every minister who came along, no matter to what sect or party he belonged. We are not afraid of our doctrines, and we are not afraid to have our children hear the doctrines of others. If any man has got a truth that we have not got, let us have it. Truth is what we are after, and we are not afraid of the doctrines of any man. We are willing to stand by the revelations of God. These are the feelings of the Latter-day Saints. When our Methodist friends came into the city, erected their tent, and held their big camp meeting, what was the course pursued by the Latter-day Saints? The president of the church, the twelve apostles, and citizens with their wives and children gave them a congregation of many thousands, and we sat in their tent and listened to them, while they abused us, just as much as they pleased. We believe in giving every man the privilege of saying what he pleases. We have always been willing to let every man express his sentiments here among us. We are not afraid of them. If we have not the truth, that is what we are after. We want it. But we know that we have it, and the gospel as restored, revealed to Joseph Smith, is the truth of God. And we know that the Lord has set his hand to build up Zion, and he is going to do it. We bear record of this because we know it is true. I pray that God will bless the Latter-day Saints. I pray that we may prize our privileges, that we may enjoy the spirit of our calling, that the Holy Ghost may enlighten our minds continually, that we may not walk in the dark but in the light. I pray that the Spirit of God may bear record to the stranger within our gates. I am satisfied that it does, and it has done more or less for the forty years that are past and gone. But it is the same today as it was in the days of Jesus. He told Nicodemus that light had come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And here is where condemnation comes in. But we cannot help that. My brethren and I have traveled a great many thousands of miles to preach the gospel to our fellow men. We have done this because we know the gospel is true. We are willing to stand by this gospel, this testimony, and this work in life and in death, in time and in eternity. We shall meet the strangers who come here and visit us on the other side of the veil. They will meet us there. And if they never know before, they will know then that our testimony is true. I pray God, our Heavenly Father, that he will bear testimony by his Holy Spirit to the meek and honest among the children of men, that they may receive the truth and be prepared to inherit eternal life. For Jesus' sake, amen. The choir sang the anthem, Beautiful Are Thy Towers. Conference adjourned to 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Benediction by B. Young, Jr. Second day, Wednesday morning, October 7th. The choir sang, The towers of Zion soon shall rise above the clouds and reach the skies.
Prayer by Elder G. B. Wallace. Choir sang, Earth with her ten thousand flowers, air with all its beams and showers. Elder Albert Carrington said in his reflections he often thought, what is the use of talking, since the human family were determined to have their own will and enjoy their peculiar notions. But God has instituted the preaching of the gospel for the purpose of correcting error and leading the children of men to a knowledge of himself. He then vividly contrasted the difference between the priestcraft prevalent throughout Christendom and the priesthood of God. He also dwelt on the imperfection of the saints of God in these valleys, who had more or less imbibed Babylonish habits and customs, not only in their deal, showing a great amount of avarice and greed, but in their dress also, and other expensive and foolish indulgences. It would be better to strictly observe the law that God had revealed, which was intended to lead them back into the presence of their Father. The plan of salvation devised by our Father was so simple, so wise, and so cheap, that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. But the very simplicity of its principles seemed to constitute the great stumbling block to the world. We who inherit these valleys, and are regarded by mankind generally as ignorant and fanatical, once lived in Christendom, and knew all about the dogmas, tenets, and practices of the Christian world. But, having embraced the everlasting gospel of the Son of God, and received the life-giving power and influence of the Spirit of God, we occupy a very different position to what the world assign us. All knowledge now enjoyed by the scientists of the world have been received from God. They obtained their intelligence from Him, and therefore they have nothing to boast of. But every truth, whether scientific or otherwise, is couched in the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God is the only author of the everlasting plan of salvation, revealed in its fullness in this our day. And therefore the world need not find fault with the Latter-day Saints for the principles it contains, but rather let them find fault and measure arms with the Lord God Almighty. He rejoiced that God had chosen a poor, unlettered youth by the name of Joseph Smith to reveal to and usher in the fullness of the everlasting gospel according to the prediction of John the Revelator and other prophets. Elder F. D. Richards bore testimony to the truth of those principles that God had revealed and which had been taught to us, including baptism for the remission of our sins and ushering us into the kingdom of God. He also felt thankful that so many had been made the happy recipients of these blessings. He reviewed the past experiences of the saints in the early history of the church, many of whom had to succumb to the persecutions of the wicked and the ungodly, and dwelt on some of the choicest blessings and privileges to which the gospel had introduced the saints. Joseph Smith, who was the instrument in the hands of God to bring forth these precious revelations, was a prophet to this generation and has gone to the spirit world to unfold to them the great plan of salvation and assist in rolling forth the great purposes of God and the redemption of the human family. He prayed that the saints might so live as to see the truth triumph upon the face of the land. Conference was adjourned till 2 o'clock p.m. Choir sang an anthem, Lift Up Your Heads. Benediction by Patriarch John Smith. Second day, afternoon, October 7. The choir sang Hosanna to the Great Messiah, the long-expected Savior King. Prayer by Elder John Taylor. The choir sang, We are not ashamed to own our Lord and worship Him on earth. Elder Orson Pratt said he had been requested to preach upon the subject of marriage. He did not think anyone who believed in the scriptures would pretend to deny that marriage was a divine institution. To prove what God did in the days of Moses, he referred to the 21st chapter of Exodus, where a law was given to a polygamic nation. He hoped that pious Christians in this congregation would not find fault with their own Bibles this afternoon. He hoped also they would not complain that those ancient men of God who were polygamists were now citizens in the kingdom of God, not damned and cast out on account of their polygamy. Neither should they complain if God should see fit to reveal the same law to be observed in our day. In order to show that the polygamous practice continued with the house of Israel, he turned to the 21st and 25th chapters of Deuteronomy, where a law was given that a man was to marry the widow of his deceased brother. He also proved that the laws on polygamy given in the days of Moses, like those on honesty, uprightness, etc., were not abrogated by the Savior, but were just as binding after as before his coming. He spoke also on the penalty that attached to those who rejected or refused to obey the law of polygamy, which was a universal reproach by all Israel. When God commenced to usher in the last dispensation and to restore all things which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets, since the world began, the law of polygamy would have to come with all the other things, 
and the Christian believer, to be consistent, must either abandon the Bible as a divine record, or admit the law of polygamy to be a Bible doctrine. He then spoke of the subject in reference to its existence among the Latter-day Saints. The reason why it was practiced among us was because God commanded us to observe it, and gave revelation concerning it, and we believed it. Why should not God give laws in our day, pertaining to family relations as well as in the days of Moses? He always thought, when a boy, that any one had a right to believe and practice Bible doctrine in this land of freedom, but it seemed that men had passed laws which prohibited the observance of one law, that of polygamy, on pain of heavy penalties. Should we therefore obey God or man? He then delivered a prophecy that every man or woman go into darkness and lose the Spirit of God, and finally be damned. He dwelt on the subject in reference to its future state. All the ordinances of the gospel had a bearing upon a future condition. Marriage being a divine institution, no persons joined together by a civil magistrate were legally married in the sight of God, neither were their children legal heirs, though they were so regarded according to the laws of all Christian countries. He regretted that some of our young people, professing to be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, had actually been married by a justice of the peace only, which severed their relation as man and wife when death did them part. Not so with those who were married under divine authority for time and all eternity. Their relationship would never be dissolved. He closed his remarks with a vivid description of the new Jerusalem on whose gates would be inscribed the names of twelve polygamous children. God's ancient people polygamists. Marriage relations are to continue forever. No power binding in marriage but that of the holy priesthood possessed by the Latter-day Saints. Discourse by Elder Orson Pratt, delivered in the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Wednesday, October 7, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. I have been requested this afternoon to preach upon the subject of marriage. It is a subject which has been often laid before the Latter-day Saints, and it is certainly one of great importance to the Latter-day Saints as well as to the inhabitants of the earth. For I presume that no person who believes in divine revelation will pretend to say that marriage is not a divine institution, and if this be the case, it is one which affects all the human family. I will select a passage of scripture in relation to this divine institution as it existed in the days of Moses. In selecting, however, this passage, I do not wish the congregation to suppose that we are under the law of Moses particularly. There are many great principles inculcated in that law, which the Lord never did intend to come to an end or to be done away. Eternal principles, moral principles. Then there are others that were done away at the coming of our Savior, he having fulfilled the law, because we find certain declarations contained in the law given to Moses that does not prove that the Latter-day Saints are under that law. That same God that gave the law of Moses, the being that we worship, is just as capable of giving laws in our day as in Moses' day, and if he sees proper to alter the code given to Moses and to give something varying from it, we have no right to say that he shall not do so. Therefore, in selecting the passage which I am about to read, it is merely to show what God did in ancient times, and that he may do something similar in modern times. In the 21st chapter of Exodus, speaking of a man who already had one wife, Moses says, If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. It will be recollected that this law was given to a polygamic nation. When I speak of a polygamic nation, I mean a nation that practiced both plural and single marriage, and believed one form to be just as sacred as the other. Their progenitors or ancestors were polygamists, and they were considered patterns for all future generations. Their piety, holiness, purity of heart, their great faith in God, their communion with Him, the great blessings to which they attained, the visions that were made manifest to them, the conversation that God himself, as well as his angels, had with them, entitled them to be called the friends of God, not only in their day, but they were considered by all future generations to be his friends. They were not only examples of the Jewish nation, but in their seed, the seed of the polygamists, all the nations and kingdoms of the earth were to be blessed." I hope that pious Christians in this generation will not find fault this afternoon with their Bible, and with the prophets and inspired men who wrote it. I hope they will not find fault with God for selecting polygamists to be his friends. I hope they will not find fault with Jesus, because he said some two thousand years or upwards after the days of these polygamists, 
that they were in the kingdom of God and were not condemned because of polygamy. Jesus says, speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, many shall come from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. Do not find fault with Jesus, you Christians, because he has these polygamists in his kingdom, and because he has said that the Gentiles will be blessed through the seed of these polygamists. Neither find fault with him because he has taken these polygamists into his kingdom, and that many will come from the four quarters of the earth and have the privilege of sitting down with them therein. Jacob married four wives, and may be considered the founder of that great nation of polygamists. He set the example before them. His twelve sons, who were the progenitors of the twelve tribes of Israel, were the children of the four wives of the prophet or patriarch Jacob. So sacred did the Lord hold these polygamists that he said, many hundred years after their death, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and this shall be my memorial unto all generations. Now Christians do not find fault if God chose these polygamists and, at the same time, wished to make them a sample, a memorial to all generations, Christians as well as Jews. Several hundred years after God raised up these, his friends, and founded, or began to found the twelve tribes of Israel, he saw proper to raise up a mighty man called Moses to deliver the children of Israel from the bondage in which they had been oppressed and afflicted by the Egyptian nation. So great had this affliction become that the king of Egypt issued a decree commanding the Israelitish midwives to put to death all the male children born among the Israelites. This murderous law was carried out. This was about eighty years before Moses was sent down from the land of Midian to deliver the children of Israel from this cruel bondage. How long this great affliction of putting to death the male children existed is not given in the Bible, but it seems to have waxed worse and worse during the following eighty years after which Moses was sent to deliver them. We may responsibly suppose that the oppressive hand of Pharaoh was not altogether eased up, but continued on for scores of years, destroying many of the male children, making a great surplus of females in that nation. A great multitude of females over and above that of males will account for the peculiar passage of Scripture to which I now refer you. It will be found in the third chapter of Numbers. I have not time to turn to it and read it, but I will quote you the substance thereof. Moses and Aaron were commanded to number all the males in Israel from a month old and upwards that were called the firstborn among the various tribes. Now the firstborn does not mean the oldest male child of the first wife, for sometimes the first wife has no children, but it means the firstborn son that is born to the father, whether by the first wife or second or third, or any number of wives that he may have. The term firstborn pertains to the first male child that is born to the father. So it was accounted to Jacob's family of twelve sons. Reuben, only, was called the firstborn of Israel, until he lost his birthright through transgression, which we are told in the fifth chapter of First Chronicles was taken from him and given to one of the sons of Joseph. But so far as age or birth was concerned, Reuben was the firstborn, and had it not been for his transgression, he would have inherited a double portion of his father's substance, for that was the law in ancient times. Now how many of the firstborn could be found in the midst of Israel? We are told that there were 22,273 firstborn males among the eleven tribes. The tribe of Levi was not reckoned at that time, but all the male members of the tribe of Levi, from a month old and upwards, was 22,000 souls. Now if the tribe of Levi numbered in proportion to the other eleven tribes, the number of firstborn males in all of the twelve tribes would probably amount to between twenty-four and twenty-five thousand souls. It could not have run over that. There might have been some of the firstborn who were dead, which would make a few more families, than there might have been other families who never had any male children, which would increase the family still more. Supposing that, in order to give all the advantages possible and to make as many families as we possibly can consistently, that we say, instead of 25,000 firstborn in the midst of all Israel, that there were 30,000. That is allowing for all these contingencies I have named, where families have no males, and those families that have male children under a month old, which were not reckoned, and those families which might have had firstborn male children who died, and the number might possibly be increased to four or 5,000 more, making the total number of families about 30,000. Thus we see that the number of firstborn males from a month old or upwards give us a clue to the number of families. 
We may not be able to determine the number exactly, but these data will enable us to approximate very closely. It is generally admitted that Israel at that time numbered 2,500,000 souls. There might have been a variation from this, a few thousand souls, but according to the scriptural and all other evidences that can be gleaned, the number above referred to is about the number of souls that existed in Israel at that time. Among that 2,500,000 souls, then, were about 30,000 families. How many were there in a family? All you have to do is to tell how many there were in a family is to divide 2,500,000 by 30,000, and you will find the quotient is 83, showing that number of souls on an average in each family. Now, if these families were all monogamic, how many children must have been born to each wife? 81. This argument is founded on scripture, and it shows plainly, even if you should double the number of families, or of the firstborn, that they could not be all mon monogamic families. For if we suppose that there were 60,000 families, it would make every married woman the mother of 40-odd children. And if such a supposition could be entertained, it would go to show that women in those days were more fruitful than they are now. These declarations are given in your Bible, which is also my Bible, that is, the King James translation, we all believe or profess to believe to be Bible believers or Christians. Do not be startled, my hearers, at these declarations of your Bible. No wonder, then, that this passage, which I have taken from my text, was given to that people because they were a people who needed to be guided in relation to their duty. If a man take another wife, that is, after he has got one, if he take another one, her food, whose food? The food of the first wife. Her raiment, that is, the raiment of the first wife, her duty of marriage he shall not diminish. Now this is plain, pointed, and positive language in regard to polygamy as it existed among the house of Israel in ancient times. Why did not the Lord say, if polygamy were a crime or a sin, if a man take another wife, let all the congregation take him without the camp and stone him and put him to death? Or, if that was too severe, let them incarcerate him in a prison or dungeon for several years? If it be a crime, why did he not say so? It is just as easy to say that, as to give directions as to what course a man shall pursue with regard to his first wife if he takes another one. This is Bible doctrine as it existed in those days. I know that it has been argued that the first woman here spoken of was merely a betrothed woman and not married. But if this be so, what a curious saying this is in our text, that her duty of marriage shall he not diminish if he take another wife. This and other expressions show clearly that they were both wives, and that there was a certain duty to be attended to by the husband, besides providing them with food and raiment. It was argued here in this tabernacle before some eight or ten thousand people on a certain occasion that the Hebrew word translated duty of marriage ought to have been translated dwelling. Her food, her raiment, and her dwelling he shall not diminish. I recollect asking the learned gentleman, Reverend Dr. Newman, why he translated it dwelling instead of translating it as all the other Hebraists have done. I asked him to produce one passage in all the Bible where the word translated duty of marriage meant a dwelling, but he could not do it. The Hebrew word for dwelling and the Hebrew word for duty of marriage are two entirely distinct words. I referred him to the learned professors in Yale College and to many others who have translated this Hebrew word duty of marriage. These professors and others learned translators have referred to the special passage and have translated it in two ways. One is duty of marriage and the other is cohabitation. Now, if this latter be correct, her food, her raiment, and her cohabitation shall he not diminish. I asked him why he varied in his translation of the Hebrew from all these translators and lexi lexicographers. His only answer was that he found a certain Jew in Washington who told him that it meant dwelling, or rather that its original root referred to a dwelling. I thought that was a very poor argument against all the translators of the Christian world who are mostly monogamists. But we will pass on. I do not intend to dwell too long on these subjects. So far as the law of Moses is concerned, to prove that the house of Israel kept up the polygamous institution from generation to generation, let me refer you to another law to show you that they were compelled to do this, or else to come out in open rebellion against the law of Moses. In the 25th chapter of Deuteronomy, we read something like this. When brethren dwell together, and one of them die, the living brother shall take the widow of the deceased brother, and it shall come to pass that the firstborn that is raised up shall succeed in the name of his brother. This was a positive command given to all Israel. Now was this command confined to young men who were unmarried, 
or was it an unlimited command so far as living brothers were in existence? This is a question to be decided. There is nothing in all the scriptures that makes any distinction between a married brother who survives and an unmarried brother. The law was just as binding upon a living brother if he already had a wife living as it was upon a living brother if he had no wife, it being a universal law, with no limits in its application so far as the house was concerned. This law, then, compelled the children of Israel to be polygamists, for in many instances the living brother might be a married man, and in many instances there might be two or three brothers who would take wives and die without leaving seed, and in that case it would devolve upon the surviving brother to take all the widows. This law was not given for that generation alone, but for all future generations. Some may say that when Jesus came, he came to do away the law. I doubt it. He came to do away the law of sacrifices and of burnt offerings, and many of those ordinances and institutions, rites and ceremonies which pertain to their tabernacle and temple, because they all pointed forward to him as the great and last sacrifice. But did he come to do away all these laws that were given in the five books of Moses? No. There are many of these laws that were retained under the Christian dispensation. One of the laws thus retained was repentance. The children of Israel were commanded to repent, and no person will pretend to say that Jesus came to do away the law of repentance. Another was the law of honesty, upright dealing between man and man. No one will pretend to say that this law ceased when Jesus came. The laws concerning families and the regulation of the domestic institutions were not intended to cease when Jesus came and they did not cease, only as they were disregarded through the wickedness of the children of men. The laws concerning monogamy and the laws concerning polygamy were just as binding after Jesus had come as they were before he came. There were some laws which Ezekiel says were not good. Jesus denounced them and said they were given because of the hardness of the hearts of the children of Israel. Ezekiel says that God gave them statutes and judgments by which they should not live. Why did he do it? because of their wickedness and hardness of heart. I will tell you how this law became done away and ceased to exist among the children of Israel. It was in consequence of their rejection of the Messiah. In consequence of this, their city was overthrown and their nation destroyed, except a miserable remnant, which were scattered abroad among the Gentile nations, where they could not keep the law in regard to their brother's widows. When the John the Baptist was raised up to that nation, he must have found thousands of thousands of polygamists, who were made so and obliged to be so by the law which I have just quoted. Some of you may inquire, had not a surviving brother the right to reject that law of God? He had, if he was willing to place himself under its penalty. I will quote you the penalty, and then you can see whether he could get away from polygamy or not. One penalty was that he should be brought before the elders, and that the widow whom he refused to marry according to the law of God should pluck his shoe from off his foot, and should then spit in his face, and from that time forth the house of that man should be denounced as the house of him that hath his shoe loosed and reproach among all Israel. Instead of being a man of God, and a man to be favored by the people of God, instead of being a man such as the Christian world would now extol to the heavens because he rejected polygamy, he was a man to be scorned by all Israel. That was the penalty. Was that the only penalty? I think not. Read along a little further, and it says, Cursed be he that continues not in all things written in this book of the law. Oh, what a dreadful penalty that was, compared with the being reproached by the whole people. Oh, what a fearful curse upon a man that refused to become a polygamist, and would not attend to the law of God. A curse pronounced by the Almighty upon him, and also the anathemas of all the people as well as from God. The word of the Lord was that all the people should say amen to this curse. Now, if I had lived in those days, I should not have considered it very desirable to bring myself under the curse of heaven, and then have the curse of all the twelve tribes of Israel upon my head. I should not have liked it at all. I would rather have gone into polygamy according to the command, even if it had subjected me to a term of five years in a penitentiary. We find many other passages touching upon this subject. I will quote one, which will be found in the twenty-first chapter of Deuteronomy. It reads as follows, if a man have two wives, one beloved and the other hated, and they have borne him children, bore both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn sons be hers that was hated, then it shall be, when he makes his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. Now this applies to two classes of polygamists, 
first to those who may have two wives living at the same time, and then to those who may have married two wives in succession. It applies to both classes, for both classes existed in those days. And the Lord gave this, not con to condemn polygamy, not to do away with it, but to show that the individual who had two wives should be impartial with regard to his children. Did he approbate this man that might have had two wives to his hatred of one and the loving the other? No, he did not. But inasmuch as man is weak and may sin against God and suffer himself to be overcome with prejudice and hatred to one person and feel in his heart to love and respect another, the Lord gave laws in case any such crime should exist among them as a husband's hating one wife and loving another. He gave laws to regulate it, not that he approbated the hating part. As I have already proved to you that there were great and vast numbers of polygamic families in Israel, that there were thousands of firstborn from these plural wives, these firstborn persons, whatever might be the conduct of their mothers, were entitled to their inheritance, namely a double portion of all that the father had to bestow. That was the law in ancient times. We might close here so far as the law of Moses is concerned, but I wish to call your attention to a peculiar saying in this law. The law has got to be restored again. Says one, You astonish me beyond measure. I thought it was done away forever. Well, listen to what the Lord said to Israel at the closing of the book of Deuteronomy. When the children of Israel shall be scattered, in consequence of their iniquities to the uttermost parts of the earth among all the nations, and their plagues shall be of long continuance, and they shall be cursed in their basket and in their store, and with numerous curses which he mentioned should come upon them. After these things had been of long continuance, the Lord says, after they shall return unto me, and hearken unto all the words contained in this book of the law, then I, the Lord God, will gather them out from all the nations, whither they are scattered, and they will bring them back into their own land. Oh, indeed! Then when they do absolutely return to hearken to all the words of the book of this law, God has promised to gather them again. That is, they must enter into polygamy. They must believe when their brother dies and leaves no seed that the surviving brother though he has one, two, or a half a dozen wives living, shall take that widow. That is part of the law, and they must fulfill all the words of this law. And then God has promised to gather them again. Says one, when that is fulfilled, it will be in the days of Christianity. We can't help it. Polygamy belongs to Christianity as well as to the law of Moses. Says one, the children of Israel have been scattered now some 1,800 years among all the nations and kindreds of the earth in fulfillment of this curse. But if we believe that saying which you have just quoted, we are obliged to believe that the children of Israel are yet to return to attend to all these institutions, and that too while the Christian religion is in vogue, and that they are to regulate their households according to the laws of God, whether those families are monogamic or polygamic. What will the good Christians think when that is fulfilled? They cannot help themselves, for God will not gather Israel until they do return with all their hearts unto him, and hearken to and obey all the words of this law written in this book. This is the word of the Lord, and how can you help yourselves, says one. We will pass laws against them. That will not hinder when God sets his hand to carry out his purposes. Laws may be passed by England, Denmark, Norway, or any other Christian community, will not hinder the Israelites from attending to all the words contained in the book of his law. For they will want to get back again to their own land. Inasmuch then as the Lord has promised to restore all things spoken of by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, supposing that he should begin this great work of restoration in our day, how are we going to help ourselves? I can't help it. Brigham Young, our president, can't help it. Joseph Smith could not help it. If God sees proper to accomplish this great work of restoration, the restitution of all things, it will include what the prophet Moses has said, and it will bring back with it its a plurality of wives. The fourth chapter of Isaiah could never be fulfilled without this restoration. The passage to which I refer is familiar to all the Latter-day Saints. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now will this prophecy ever be fulfilled, unless this great restoration or restitution shall take place? It cannot. If this great restitution does not take place, Jesus will never come, for it is written in the New Testament, in the third chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, 
that the heavens must receive Jesus Christ until the times of the restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouths of his holy prophets since the world began. Jesus will have to stay a long time in the heavens, providing that monogamist principles are the only principles that will be introduced. In fact, he never can come, for the scriptures say that the heavens must retain him until all things are restored. God has said that seven women will take hold of one man for the purpose of having their reproach taken away, that they may be called by his name, not cast off as harlots or prostitutes, not to take away the name of the Father from the children, and to cast them into the streets, as the Christian nations have been doing for many long centuries that are past. But these seven women will be desirous of having the name of their husbands for themselves and their children. Isaiah says it shall be so, and it will have to be under the Christian dispensation. How are the Christians going to get rid of this? Can you devise any way? Is there any possible way or means that you can think of that will put a stop to the Lord's fulfilling his word? I will tell you one way. If you will all turn infidels and burn up the Bible and then begin to persecute, the devil will tell you that you can successfully overcome and that God will never fulfill and accomplish his word. But if you profess to believe the Bible, by the Bible you shall be judged. For, saith the Lord, my words shall judge you at the last day. The books will be opened. God's word will be the standard by which all nations will be judged. Hence, if you wish a righteous judgment, I would say, forbear. Do not destroy the Bible because it advocates polygamy. But remember that every word of God is pure. So it is declared. And he has nowhere in this book condemned plural marriage, even in one instance. I know that it has been argued that there is a law against polygamy, but in order to make the law, the scripture had to be altered. It is that famous passage which has become a byword in the mouth of every schoolboy in our streets. Leviticus 18th chapter, 18th verse. Now let us examine for a few moments that passage and see what it says. You will find that the fore part of this chapter forbids marriage between certain blood relations. Prior to this time it had been lawful for a man to marry two sisters. Jacob, for instance, married Rachel and Leah, and there is no law against it prior to this time. It has also been lawful for a man to marry his own sister, as in the days of Adam. For you know that there were no other ladies on the face of the earth for the sons of Adam except their own sisters, and they were obliged to marry them or to live bachelors. But the Lord saw proper, when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness, to regulate the law of marriage, so far as certain blood relations were concerned, called the law of consanguinity, which speaks of a great many relationships and finally comes to a wife and her sister. This law was given to regulate the marriage relations of the children of Israel in the wilderness. It was not to regulate those who lived before that day who had married sisters, not to regulate those who might live in the latter days, but to regulate the children of Israel in that day. It reads thus, Neither shalt thou take a wife of her sister, to vex her, to uncover her nakedness besides the other in her lifetime. This passage has been altered by certain monogamists in order to sustain their ideas of marriage. And we find in some large Bibles what are called marginal readings that these monogamists have put in, and instead of taking this in connection with all other blood relations, they have altered it. Neither shalt thou take one wife to another. The men who translated King James Bibles were monogamists, yet they had sense enough to know that the original Hebrew would not bear that construction which had been given by later monogamists. The original Hebrew, when translated word for word, makes it just as King James translators have made it. The Hebrew words are... V isha elahota lo taka. These are the original Hebrew words, and if they are translated literally, word for word, the translation stands just as it is in the text. But this is not saying, but what the words elahota under certain circumstances are translated in another form, namely one to another, one sister to another. And I am willing that it should be translated that way. Then it would read, Thou shalt not take one sister to another to vex her in her lifetime. So you may take it either way, and it bears out King Tran James' translation, or the meaning given by him. I do not profess to be a Hebraist to any very great extent, although I studied it sufficiently many years ago to understand its grammatical construction and to translate any passage of the Bible. But then, having lacked practice for many years, of course, a person may become a little rusty in regard to these matters. But I have searched out the passages that can be found in the Old Testament, either singular or plural, masculine or feminine, pertaining to the words contained in this text. And I find a far greater number rendered according to the words that are here given, literally in this text, than what are translated one sister to another. But I am willing that this translation should be allowed. 
Now, if we thought the congregation would like to hear the translation of all this and the reasons why, we could give it. But I presume that there are but few Hebrew scholars present, and if the translation were given, the great majority of the congregation would not understand whether it was translated correctly or not. And for that reason, I shall not take up your time by referring to these technicalities. But I will make the broad statement that there is not a Hebrew scholar living on this earth who can translate that passage from the words contained in the original Hebrew without adding words of his own, not contained in the original text. If he translated it, as Dr. Newman did, one wife to another, if the first word, vi isha, means one, as he would try to have us understand, it does not mean wife also, but if it means wife, it cannot be translated as he has it, therefore it cannot bear out that construction. But I see that I am dwelling too long on the subject of the law of Moses. Now I wish to come directly to the point in regard to polygamy as it exists at the present time among the Latter-day Saints. I stated in the beginning of my remarks that polygamy, or any other institution that was given at one age, might not be binding upon another without fresh revelation from God. I made that statement when I was discussing that subject in this house. I still say that we are not under the necessity of practicing polygamy because God gave laws and commandments for its observance and regulation in ancient times. Why then do the Latter-day Saints practice polygamy? That is a plain question. I will answer it just as plainly. It is because we believe, with all the sincerity of our hearts, as has been stated by former speakers from this stand, that the Lord God who gave revelations to Moses, approbating polygamy, has given revelations to the Latter-day Saints, not only approbating it, but commanding it, as he commanded Israel in ancient times. Now let us reason on this point. If God did do such things in former ages of the world, why not the same being, if he sees proper, perform the same or similar things in another age of the world? Can anyone answer this? If God saw proper to give certain laws in ancient times and then to revoke them, or if he saw proper to give laws that were not revoked but done away by the transgressions of the children of men, has he not a right, and is it not as consistent for that same divine being to give laws, for instance, in the 19th century concerning our domestic relations, or as it was for him to do so in the days of Moses? And if he has that right, as we Latter-day Saints believe that he has, are not the people's consciences just as sacred in regard to such laws in these days as the consciences of ancient Israel? Or must there be some power to regulate our religious consciences? Here is a grand question. Shall our religious consciences be regulated by civil government or civil laws? Or shall we have the privilege of regulating them according to the divine law of the Bible, or any divine law that may be given in accordance with the ancient Bible? I answer that, when I was a boy, I thought I lived in a country in which I could believe in anything that agreed with or that could be proved by the Bible, whether it was the law of Moses or in the doctrines of the New Testament. I really thought that Jews had a right to reject Jesus, or in other words, if they had not the right to do it morally, they had the right so far as civil law is concerned to reject this Messiah and to believe in and practice the law of Moses in our land. But I am told that such liberty of conscience is not to be tolerated in our republican government. If the Jews should collect in any great numbers and should say one to another, Come, brethren, we are the descendants of Abraham. Let us now begin to practice according to the laws that were given to our ancient fathers. And if a brother dies and leaves a widow but no children, let his living brother, though a married man, marry the widow according to our law. It is doubtful whether they would be permitted to associate together and practice those laws now if they were so disposed. Why? Because the prejudice of the people is so great that they are not willing others should believe in the whole Bible but only in such portions as agree with their ideas. If we were instituting a practice that the Lord God never approbated, but for the punishment of which he had prescribed penalties, or if we were introducing something foreign and contrary to the Bible, then there would be some excuse for the people in saying that such a thing should not be practiced in the name of religion. But when we take the Bible as a standard in relation to crime, it is altogether another thing. And I do think that every American citizen who professes to believe in any part or portion of that sacred record on which the laws of Christendom pretend to be founded has the right to do so, and practice it, and that too without being molested. Now after having said so much in relation to the reason why we practice polygamy, I want to say a few words in regard to the revelation on polygamy. God has told us that Latter-day Saints, that we shall be condemned if we do not enter into that principle. And yet I have heard now and then, I am very glad to say that only a few such instances have come under my notice, a brother or a sister say, I am a Latter-day Saint, but I do not believe in polygamy. 
Oh, what an absurd expression. What an absurd idea. A person might as well say, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, but I do not believe in him. One is just as consistent as the other. Or a person might as well say, I believe in Mormonism and in the revelations given through Joseph Smith, but I am not a polygamist. I do not believe in polygamy. What an absurdity. If one portion of the doctrines of the church is true and the whole of them are true, if the doctrine of polygamy as revealed to the Latter-day Saints is not true, I would not give a fig for all your other revelations that came through Joseph Smith the prophet. I would renounce the whole of them, because it is utterly impossible, according to the revelations that are contained in these books, to believe a part of them to be divine, from God, and part of them to be from the devil. That is foolishness in the extreme. It is an absurdity that exists between the ignorance of some people. I have been astonished at it. I did hope that there was more intelligence among the Latter-day Saints, and a greater understanding of the principle than to suppose that anyone could be a member of the church in good standing and yet reject polygamy. The Lord has said that those who reject this principle reject their salvation. They shall be damned, saith the Lord. Those to whom I reveal this law and they do not receive it shall be damned. Now here comes in our consciences. We have either to renounce Mormonism, Joseph Smith, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the whole system of things as taught by the Latter-day Saints, and say that God has not raised up a church, has not raised up a prophet, has not begun to restore all things as he promised. We are obliged to do this, or else to say with all our hearts, yes, we are polygamists. We believe in the principle, and we are willing to practice it because God has spoken from the heavens. Now I want to prophesy a little. It is not very often that I prophesy, though I was commanded to do so when I was a boy. I want to prophesy that all men and women who oppose the revelation which God has given in relation to polygamy will find themselves in darkness. The Spirit of God will withdraw from them from that moment of their oppression to the principle until they finally go down to hell and be damned if they do not repent. That is just as true as it is that all the nations and kingdoms of the earth, when they hear this gospel which God has restored in these last days, will be damned if they do not receive it, for the Lord has said so. One is just as true as the other. I will quote this latter saying as regarded in the Book of Covenants, the Lord said to the elders of this church, in the very commencement as it were, Go ye forth and preach the gospel to every creature. And as I said unto mine ancient apostles, even so I say unto you, that every soul who believes in your words, and will repent of his sins, and be baptized in water, shall receive a remission of his sins, and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. And every soul in all the world who do not believe in your words, neither repent of his sins, shall be damned. And this revelation or commandment is enforced from this very hour upon all the world, as fast as they hear it. That is what the Lord has said. Just so, in regard to polygamy, or any other great principle which the Lord our God reveals to the inhabitants of the earth. Now, if you want to get into darkness, brethren and sisters, begin opposing this revelation. Sisters, you begin to say before your husbands, or husbands, you begin to say before your wives, I do not believe in the principle of polygamy, and I intend to instruct my children against it. Oppose it in this way, and teach your children to do the same, and if you do not become as dark as midnight, there is no truth in Mormonism. I am taking up too much time. I would like to dwell on another more pleasing part of the subject, if there were time. President George A. Smith, there's plenty of time, Brother Pratt. I will go on and tell the people why polygamy was instituted in this dispensation, so far as a future state is concerned. God has revealed to us that marriage as instituted by him is to benefit the people, not in this world only, but to all eternity. That is what the Lord has revealed. Do not misunderstand me. Do not suppose that I mean that marriage and giving in marriage are to be performed after the, re after the resurrection. I have not stated any such thing, and there will be no such thing after the resurrection. Marriage is an ordinance pertaining to this mortal life, to this world, this probation, just the same as baptism and the laying on of hands. It reaches forth into eternity and has a bearing upon our future state. So does baptism. So does the ordinance of the laying on of hands. So does every ordinance which the Lord our God has revealed to us. If we attend to these things here in this life, they secure something beyond this life, for eternity. They neither baptize nor receive baptism after the resurrection. Why? Because neither was intended to be administered after the resurrection. After the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Why? Because this is the world where these ceremonies are to be attended to. That which is secured here will be secured hereafter. If it be secured upon the principles of law which God has revealed, marriage, then for eternity, is the great principle of marriage with the Latter-day Saints, 
and yet I am sorry to say that there are some of our young people who will suffer themselves to be married by the civil law, not for eternity, but just like the old Gentile custom, the way our forefathers were married, a justice of the peace, a judge, or someone having the right by the civil laws, will pronounce them husband and wife for a short space, called time, perhaps to last only about threescore years, and then it is all over with the marriage contract. It is run out, they are husband and wife until death shall separate them, and then they are fully divorced. We do not believe in any such nonsense. It is one of the ideas of the Gentile world in regard to marriage. The first great marriage celebrated in this world of ours, that of our first parents, is a sample of marriage that should be introduced and practiced by and among all generations and nations so far as the eternity of its duration is concerned. Our first parents were immortal beings. They knew nothing about death. It was a word that has never been spoken in their ears. The forbidden fruit had never been laid before them. No law in respect to that was yet given. But Eve was brought to our father Adam as an immortal woman whose body could not die in all ages of eternity. She was given to an immortal husband whose body could not die to all future periods of duration unless they brought death upon themselves. Sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Death is one of the consequences of sin, and they brought it upon themselves. But before that they were married. The immortal Adam had the immortal Eve given to him. Now if it had been possible for them to have resisted that temptation, they would have been living now, just as fresh and as full of vigor, life and animation after six thousand years, as they were on the morning in which this ceremony of marriage took place. And if you should reflect upon millions and millions of ages in the future, they would still be considered husband and wife, while eternity should last. You could not set a time, you could not point your finger at a moment or hour, when they would be separated and the union be dissolved. That is the kind of marriage that we Latter-day Saints believe in, and yet some of our young people, professing to be members of the Church, and who say they wish to keep the commandments of God, go and get married by a justice of the peace, or some person authorized to perform that ceremony by the civil law. Ask parties who are guilty of such folly why they were married by these officers of the law until death should part them, and they will say, we did it inconsiderately and without reflection. Or perhaps they will say that their parents did not teach them on that point. Do you not know that such marriages are not sealed by him that it is that is appointed by divine authority, that they are not of God and are illegal in his sight, and your children are illegitimate in the sight of God? If you expect to have any benefits in eternity arising from your children, they must be yours legally, according to divine appointment, under a divine marriage. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. But what has God to do with it, when a magistrate, who perhaps is an infidel, and does not believe in God at all, says to a man and woman, join your hands together. And then, when they have done so, he says, I pronounce you husband and wife. What has God to do with such a marriage as that? Has God joined them together? No, a civil magistrate has done it, and it is legal so far as the laws of the country are concerned, and the children are legal and heirs to their parents' property so far as the civil law is concerned. But what has God to do with it? Has he joined them together? No, and the marriage is illegal, and, in the sight of heaven, the children are springing from such a marriage are bastards. How are we going to legalize these matters? There are many who are very sorry for the Latter-day Saints, so sorry that they would favor the passing of a law that would legalize all the children who have been born in polygamy, and thus prevent them from being what they consider bastards. Now we are just as anxious, on the other hand, to get all our fathers and mothers who have been married by these Gentile institutions joined together by divine authority in order that they may become legal in the sight of God. We do not want their children to be bastardized, and hence we get them adopted, or we shall do so when the temple is built. I mean all those who have been born of parents that have never been joined together of the Lord or by his authority. All such children, as well as men and women, married only by the civil law, have got to have ordinances performed for them in the temple. The men and women will have to be legally married there and the children born before their parents were thus legally married will have to pass through ordinances in order that they may become the legal sons and daughters of their parents, and they will have to be adopted according to the law of God. You young men and women who are married in a manner that the Lord does not authorize or own, put yourselves to a great deal of trouble, because you will have a great deal of work to do hereafter in temples in order to get things legalized. How much better it would be for you to come to those whom God has appointed and have your marriages solemnized as immortal beings who have to live in eternity. It is true that we all have to die by and by, 
and we shall be separated for a little season. But this separation is a good deal like a man's leaving his family to go on a mission. He returns after a while to his wives and children, and he has not lost the one, nor has he been divorced from the other, because they have been separated. And if death separates for a little season, those who are married according to God's law, they expect to return to each other's embraces by virtue of their former union, for it is as eternal as God himself. Do you mean to say, says one, that people in the immortal state will be united in the capacity of husbands and wives with their children around them? Yes, we do believe that all persons who have these blessings sealed upon them here by the authority of the Most High will find that they reach forward into the eternal world, and they can hold fast to that which God has placed upon them. Whatsoever you seal on earth, said the Lord to the ancient apostles, shall be sealed in the heavens. What could be of more importance than the relationship of families, the solemn and sacred relationship of marriage? Nothing that we can conceive of. It affects us here, and it affects us hereafter in the eternal world. Therefore, if we can have these blessings pronounced upon us by divine authority, and we, when we wake up in the morning of the first resurrection, find that we are not under the necessity of either marrying or giving in marriage, having attended to our duty beforehand, how happy we shall be to gather our wives and our children around us. How happy old Jacob will be, for instance, when in the resurrection, if he has not already been raised, a great many saints were raised when Jesus arose and appeared to many. If Jacob did not rise then, and his four wives and his children, how happy he will be when he does come forth from the grave to embrace his family, and to rejoice with them in a fullness of joy, knowing that, by virtue of that which was sealed upon him here in time, he will reign upon the earth. Will it not be a glorious thing when that polygamist, by virtue of promises made to him here, comes forth to reign as king and priest over his seed upon the earth? I think that in those days polygamy will not be hated as it is now. I think that all things that have been prophesied by the ancient prophets will be fulfilled, and that Jacob will get his wives, by virtue of the covenant of marriage, and that he will have them here on the earth, and he will dwell with them here a thousand years, in spite of all the laws that may be passed to the contrary, and they will be immortal personages full of glory and happiness. And Jesus will also be here, and the twelve apostles will also sit on the twelve thrones here on the earth, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And during a whole thousand years they will eat and drink at the table of the Lord, according to that promise that was made to them. Old Father Abraham will come up with his several wives, namely Sarah, Hagar, and Keturah, and some others mentioned in Genesis. And besides these, all the holy prophets will be here on the earth. I do not think that there will be any legislation against polygamy. By and by, they will build a polygamous city, and it will have twelve gates, and in order to place as much honor upon these gates as possible, they will name them after the twelve polygamous children that were born to the four polygamous wives of Jacob. And these good old polygamists will be assembled together in this beautiful city, the most beautiful that ever had place on the earth. By and by, some Christian will come along, and he will look at these gates and admire their beauty, for each gate is to be constructed of one immense splendid pearl. The gates are closed fast and very high, and while admiring their beauty, he observes the inscriptions upon them. Being a Christian, he of course expects to enter, but looking at these gates, he finds the name of Reuben inscribed on one of them. Says he, Reuben was a polygamous child. I will go on to the next, and see is there a name of a monogamous child anywhere. He accordingly visits all the twelve gates, three on each side of the city, and finds inscribed on each gate the name of a polygamous child, and this because it is the greatest honor that can be conferred on their father Jacob, who is in their midst, for he is to sit down with all the honest and upright in heart who come from all nations to partake of the blessings of that kingdom. But, says this Christian, I really do not like this. I see this is a polygamous city. I wonder if there is not some other place for me. I do not like the company of polygamists. They were hated very badly back yonder. Congress hated them, the president hated them, the cabinet hated them, the priests hated them, and everybody hated them, and I engendered the same hatred, and I have not gotten rid of it yet. I wonder if there is not some other place for me. Oh yes, there is another place for you. Without the gates of the city there are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, adulterers, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now take your choice. Amen. The choir sang the anthem, The Earth is the Lord's. Conference was adjourned till 10 o'clock tomorrow. Benediction by President George A. Smith. Third day, Thursday morning, October 8. The choir sang, The morning breaks, the shadows flee, Low Zion's standard is unfurled. Prayer by Elder John Van Cott. 
The choir sang, Praise ye the Lord, my heart shall join in work so pleasant, so divine. Elder George Goddard made a few remarks on the importance of strictly carrying out the counsel of the servants of God in contributing freely to the erection of temples and carrying out a self-sustaining policy by the encouragement of every possible home industry. Elder C. W. Penrose spoke of the necessity of every public speaker being filled with the Spirit of the Lord in addressing an assembly of Latter-day Saints. He also spoke of the gospel which had been preached by the elders among the nations, and after close scrutiny and investigation of those principles which they preached, many embraced them and were baptized for the remission of their sins. They then received a witness from God testifying to their truth. They were then taught the principle of gathering, which they soon received and acted upon. Hence, thousands had gathered into these valleys where they could learn more of the ordinances of the gospel, might unite their energies, and fulfill the prayer of our Savior, that they might be one, even as he and his Father in heaven were one. He then made remarks on the priesthood which is placed upon the male members of this church, for the building up of the saints. Most of the saints who came from the old country were not, as some suppose, from the lowest walks of life, but from the ranks of the industrious or working classes, from the bone and sinew of the nation, who possessed moral courage enough to receive and obey truth as they found it, and were willing to risk the consequences. President Young was not opposed to the dissemination of education. He had always sustained and encouraged it, and as a people we ought to patronize our own publications which contained our principles, and lay aside the use of trashy works that come here in large quantities. He then defended the people against the unrighteous attacks made upon them of being guilty of murder and disloyalty to the government. We are here to build up, not to tear down, to create, not to destroy. Let parents set good examples before their children and keep them from mingling with the corrupt, who were to be found in the saloons and other places where the profane and wicked were wont to meet. He closed by a faithful admonition to both saints and sinners, and bore a strong testimony of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. President G. A. Smith hoped the instructions imparted this morning would be carried out in families and wards. Let us observe the Sabbath and the word of wisdom, encourage the reading of our own publications, and do what we could to build up the kingdom of God. No matter what false statements might be circulated, let us be up and doing. He said many were about to be called as missionaries to the states and other places, as there was a great generation grown up since the rise of this church who had never heard the gospel. He then described the present condition of the temple in this city and invited all the bishops and saints generally to go and visit the temple. He himself was delighted with the stability and beauty and progress of it. He hoped the brethren and sisters would carry out the suggestions given during this conference. They should especially sustain the publication known as the Woman's Exponent, being the only journal published by the sisters. He also advocated the principle of self-sustenance in connection with the growth of the United Order and to never cease her efforts until Zion was free and independent. Prayer must be remembered in families, elders to be sent on missions, building temples, temples necessary to salvation, Home Manufacturers, the United Order. Remarks by President George A. Smith, delivered at the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Sunday afternoon, October 11, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. I have been much interested in the remarks of the elders this morning, as all through the conference, and I hope the instructions we have received will be treasured up in the hearts of all and carried home to our households and wards and that the elders who have attended conference will stir up the people to diligence, teach them to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, and instead of fooling away their time in labor or pleasure, to devote that day to the worship of God and to rest, according to the original design of heaven. We should remember our prayers at all times in our families. We should also remember to observe the word of wisdom, and be careful to continually pursue such a course as will entitle us to the blessings of the Lord, and that his spirit may unceasingly abide in our hearts. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we should let our light shine before men by observing the principles which we profess to have obeyed. We need not be troubled because false reports are sent abroad into the world concerning us. This has been the universal lot of the saints in all ages of the world. The Savior said, Blessed are ye when men shall persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. If we are only conscious within ourselves that these charges are false, we need not fear and we should never hesitate to lift up our voices among the children of men in bearing testimony of the truth revealed in these latter days through the prophet Joseph Smith. We are anxious to publish the standard works of the church to a greater extent than hitherto. 
Some of them have been republished and others are in progress, and we wish to have the cooperation of the saints generally throughout the territory in helping on this work. Our publications should be in every family of the saints, and we wish to exercise that kind of influence in the midst of our people that will lead them to make themselves acquainted with the contents of the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and such other works as are or have been published illustrative to the principles of life and salvation made known in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they may be more generally understood by those professing to be Latter-day Saints. We expect before the conference closes to call a considerable number of elders to go and preach the gospel in the United States. There have been but few missionaries sent to the states, and the present generation there have, to a great extent, formed their notions of us and our faith from the false reports sent through the press. And as we all know that notions so formed cannot be other than erroneous, we shall call a considerable number of elders to go and travel through the states, representing the gospel in its true light, and bearing testimony to the truth, that the generation that have grown up since we were driven into the wilderness may learn and know for themselves the facts concerning us. We are laboring, as has been referred to by some of the brethren who have addressed the conference, to build a temple in St. George, and one in this city. The work is moving on in both places. I feel quite gratified at the success of the workmen the present season on the temple here. Take the granite from the boulders in the mountains, bringing it here, cutting the blocks, placing the pillars in position, and getting everything in the mechanical style that it is in the last two years is perfectly wonderful to me. The erection of a temple like this is a great work and requires a vast amount of means, energy, and skill. We have not had as much means to sustain the brethren who have been laboring upon it as we anticipated, in consequence of the change of the times and the failure of some to come forward and pay their tithing, and thereby supply the demand. Yet we have moved the work forward gloriously. Brother Pinnock has the gates open, and I invite the bishops and all the brethren and sisters from distant places to go and see the beautiful work we have done on that temple. And while you are inspecting what has been done, try and realize the amount of labor and means that have been required to accomplish it. Think of the millions of dollars that King Solomon expended in building the foundation of his temple, and of the heavy tax it was upon the people. And then, if you want to compare his work with ours, think of the manner in which we are carrying this forth. I wish the saints also, when visiting the temple, to raise their hearts in prayer to the Most High, that he will bless the efforts that are being made to rear a house to his holy name. We invite all the brethren and sisters to contribute their monthly offerings in money, that these workmen may have a portion of their wages in money, and such necessaries as cannot be obtained without it. For a considerable portion of the present season the temple workmen have had to do almost entirely with home products. Some of them have stuck to it faithfully, others have been compelled to quit. In fact, for want of means we were under the necessity at one time of dismissing fifty hands. But we have kept the work moving, and if the brethren will go and see what we have done, they can but be surprised and delighted. It is a glorious work, and one that is to be dedicated to the Most High God. Then let our hearts be lifted to Him in prayer, that this work may continue, that we may be protected from the wrath of our enemies, and from the vengeance of the wicked one, and be able to complete this temple and dedicate it, that the glory of the Lord may rest upon it, and the various quorums of the priesthood be organized within it, and that we and our children may be permitted to enter its sacred precincts, and receive the ordinances of the priesthood, and the blessings of the gospel of peace, which can be received only in a temple of the Lord. I wish to bear my testimony to the principles of the gospel which have been revealed. I never wish to stand before the saints without doing that, for when I was called as one of the first seventies to bear testimony to the people, I lifted my hand to heaven and said, If I ever forget to bear testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the true mission of Joseph Smith, let my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. From that day to this, I always remember to bear my testimony when I address the people, for I know that this gospel and the plan of salvation revealed to Joseph Smith and taught by the apostles of this church is true. Men may say that Brigham Young and the elders of this church are impostors, but I know that they were called by revelation and ordained and set apart to do this work through Joseph Smith, and they are the servants of the Most High God. They were called to proclaim the gospel and to administer its ordinances, and with all their hearts they have labored to accomplish the work assigned them. It is written that Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. This shows that a man of like passions to ourselves may obtain faith to perform great and good works, to give wise instructions, to proclaim the principles of the everlasting gospel, to bear testimony to the truth 
to administer in the work of the Lord and bear off his kingdom. And it is our duty, as we have already been warned, to exercise faith for those in authority that, while they contend with like passions with ourselves, they may have the Spirit of the Almighty to preserve and guide them, and to sustain their hands, and in all cases be careful never to be found speaking evil of the Lord's anointed. A tattling tongue is a curse, and, as the Apostle James expressed it, is set on fire of hell. And when we are found speaking evil against the servants of God, and accusing the brethren, we are only following in the wake of the wicked one. Let us then avoid these things, and learn to speak those things that are good, upright, and true, and bear a faithful testimony of the gospel. As I said before, I wish the saints generally to remember the brethren who are laboring on the temple at St. George. They have been working all the season, with very little to supply them, and some of them are destitute of clothing and other necessaries. Some of the workmen there have labored on the temple from the very beginning, and the walls are now thirty feet high, and the work is going ahead prosperously. We have invited the people in every settlement to contribute of their means to continue the work, and we have also invited brethren to go down to St. George and labor upon the temple this winter, that the building may be prepared for the roof as soon as possible. It will be a magnificent temple, and will contain all the conveniences of the temples of Kirtland and Nauvoo, and it will be 143 feet long and 97 wide, and the walls will be 88 feet high. It is desirable that the brethren contribute their means to supply the wants of those who are laboring on that temple, that they may be encouraged to continue. We are anxious to push this temple forward to completion as early as possible. It is not so large nor so elaborate in its design as the one in course of erection in this city. St. George is a place which parties living in the northern settlements who may desire to go to do so can go and spend the winter and attend to the ordinances of the priesthood. When that temple is finished, we can go down there and be baptized for our dead, receive our anointings and ordinances and all the blessings pertaining to the priesthood, and get our records made to perform that great work which is placed upon us for the salvation of all generations from that time that the priesthood was lost, the covenant broken, the laws trampled underfoot, and the ordinances forsaken unto the present time. For the salvation of all who have died since then rests upon us as a generation. But if any of us suffer ourselves to be led into darkness by the cunning and craftiness of the wicked one or evil spirits, we lose great and glorious blessings and a great and glorious responsibility which is laid upon us pertaining to the salvation of ourselves and our ancestors. We call upon all brethren to consider these things, and we do not wish any to go and labor on that temple this winter unless they desire to do so, and have got the spirit to go in order that they may assist in forwarding the work. It is very probable that some who live in the northern settlements who are able to do so will make practice of spending the winter in St. George because of the mild, pleasant weather which prevails there during the winter season. Last winter, the Masons worked on the walls of the temple all the winter except seven and a half days when they were prevented by rain. But to all who may have the, any intention of going there to spend the winter, I would say, never go with light shoes and thin clothing, but take warm clothing and thick-soled shoes. Do not be deceived with the idea that you will find summer weather there in the winter season. It is more like pleasant spring weather, and when evening comes, good thick warm clothing is needed. In speaking of the press, I wish to name especially the paper published by our sisters, The Woman's Exponent. I feel as though I hardly need suggest to the brethren that natural gallantry would require them, all through the territory, to subscribe to this little sheet, and I believe that if the brethren would do so, the paper would be much more widely circulated and would do much more good than at the present. The brethren should remember that our sisters hold the ballot in this country, that they have equal influence at the polls with the men, and I certainly think that we should patronize them in their press, for I am satisfied that the prospects of any man being elected in the legislature of Utah Territory would be very poor if the women were opposed to him, for I presume that the women compose a majority of the legal voters of the territory. Hence, under these circumstances, our natural gallantry and the national characteristic to desire office should prompt us to sustain their publication. I hope also that the brethren, in reflecting upon these instructions which have been given during conference, will not forget what has been said in relation to sustaining ourselves with our own material. We have mechanics here who can make good coffins, yet a great many coffins are imported from the states into this territory, for which the money has to be paid. I say that we ought to be ashamed of this, and I here publicly request my friends, whoever may live to place me in the ground, to place me there in a coffin made of our mountain wood, 
by our own mechanics, and I prohibit anybody who may outlive me paying a dollar for a coffin for me that is imported from the States. That is my sentiment, and I wish it was of every man and woman in the territory. It may be said to be a small matter, but it takes thousands of dollars of our money away just to gratify pride. Says one, I am just as good as such a one, and why not have a coffin from Chicago or St. Louis as well as he have one? This is a sentiment resulting purely from pride and love of display, which is unworthy of a Latter-day Saint. Carry this principle out, and it leads us to reject homemade shoes and other articles which are far superior to the foreign-made imported articles. We have been talking about the United Order and getting up tanneries, shoe shops, etc., and initiatory steps have been taken in some of the settlements with these objects in view, but it takes time to carry out and successfully accomplish such projects. But we can produce these things within ourselves, and it is our duty to do it, and instead of manifesting a disposition to oppose anything of this kind, we should exert all the influence and energy we possess to bring it about, and to make ourselves self-sustaining. It is true that the principles of the United Order are such that a great portion of our people at the present time are not in a condition to take hold of it with all they have, for many of them have been foolish enough during the success of business for the last four years, instead of paying their debts, to launch into business of various kinds and get deeper into debt. That class of men have to get their hands untied before they can take hold to promote the great project of uniting the whole of the Latter-day Saints in all their business affairs. But this must be done as fast as possible, and the work of making Zion self-sustaining must be regarded as part of the work of the Lord, for it is an obligation devolving upon us to provide within ourselves labor and the necessaries of life. We must take hold of this matter, brethren and sisters, and with all our hearts never let ourselves rest until Zion is independent of her enemies and all the world. May peace and the light of truth abide with you, that you may understand these things and act upon them with all the spirit and power of the gospel of peace. It is my prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The choir sang, O Praise the Lord. Conference adjourned until 2 p.m. Benediction by Elder J. L. Smith. Third day. Thursday afternoon, October 8. The choir sang, All Hail the Glorious Day by Prophets Long Foretold. Prayer by Elder J.C. Little. The choir sang, Great God, attend while Zion sings, the joy that from thy presence springs. Elder G.Q. Cannon said five weeks ago he started on a visit to the southern part of the territory. He found a willing and obedient people wherever he went. Elder Erastus Snow and A.M. Musser were with him most of the time and they had excellent and large meetings at every place. God had inspired men in our day to lead and guide the people in the way of salvation, and we should hold ourselves ready at all times to be guided in the habits of life and the performance of any duty required at our hands. We should be willing to forsake old and erroneous traditions as fast as they were pointed out to us. There were many duties imposed upon us inasmuch as the foundation of the great Latter-day Kingdom had been committed into our hands, and it had to grow and increase until it should fill the whole earth. Hence, there was much to do. He then reviewed the principles of the faith of the Latter-day Saints and contrasted them with those entertained by the outside religious world. He also spoke favorably of the labors and efforts of the Latter-day Saints. Though not perfect, yet they approximated towards perfection and were attended with very beneficial results. We were striving to live in accordance with the life that was to come. One of the first lessons given to the saints in this dispensation, through the prophet Joseph, was to become one in their temporal labors and submit to a union of interests. The lack of the saints in not responding to that revelation was the chief cause of their expulsion from Jackson County, Missouri. He felt thankful, however, that God had again called upon the Latter-day Saints to become one and lay aside their individual interests by seeking the general good of the whole people. Some people had predicted the downfall of the people of God in these valleys, owing to the contact of various influences that would gradually come among us. But God had decreed that his kingdom would stand and not be given to another people. He traced the persecutions of bygone days towards the servants of God, who endeavored to establish a principle of brotherhood among the people. If we were to establish a greater work than any of our predecessors upon the earth, we had got to have more faith more power, and practice a higher righteousness, or we could not do it. In our efforts, coupled with sacrifices and self-denial, God would assist us. He spoke very favorably of the progress of the new order in some of the southern settlements, and made an energetic appeal to the bishops and leading men of this city to take hold of it, in the right spirit, and God would bless them. 
but if they continued to be so faithless and inoperative, we need not be surprised if God visited us in his displeasure and scourged us until we were willing to be an obedient people. He then testified that he knew that God had revealed this united order to this people, and woe be to us if we did not enter into it with good and honest hearts. Seek for perfection, reign of righteousness, live in union, the united order. Discourse by Elder George Q. Cannon, delivered at the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Thursday afternoon, October 8, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. Six weeks ago yesterday, I left this city to visit the settlements throughout the southern portion of our territory. My trip has been one of the most interesting and pleasant I ever undertook, and I have rejoiced exceedingly in the opportunity which I have had of meeting the people in that section of the country. There is a great anxiety in many places and with many people to know what the condition of affairs is in that region. I can say that I never saw our people feeling better as a general thing, and more willing to do that which is required of them than at the present time. There was great anxiety among them to be instructed, and the meetings in every instance were crowded, the people turning out with great alacrity and expressing regret that we could not stay longer. Brother Erastus Snow and Brother Musser and myself attended most of the meetings. Part of the time in visiting the western settlements I was alone. The anxiety of the people seems to be to know what to do, and to be instructed in the best manner of doing that which God requires at their hands. And this is the spirit which, as Latter-day Saints, we should entertain and cherish. God has called us to be a peculiar people. He has raised up prophets, has organized his church, has placed within it those callings and offices and gifts and qualifications and blessings which characterized the church in ancient days, and he has condescended in his mercy and goodness to reveal himself unto the children of men, to teach them, counsel them, and inspire them so that they may be instruments in his hands in building up his kingdom and laying the foundation of that work of which the prophets have spoken and which we are told shall stand forever. We, as a people, with the views which we entertain, should not make up our minds to live in accordance with the methods of life, the modes of doing business, and the habits and traditions of our forefathers, who have lived in ignorance of these principles and of the spirit of revelation. For we are required, in obeying the gospel, to hold ourselves in a position to receive the word of God, to be counseled, to be directed, to be guided by that word in all of our transactions, in the doctrines which we believe, in the habits of life which we adopt, and in all our practices and labors. This is one of the first lessons that is impressed upon us in starting out in obedience to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very first teachings we received impressed upon our minds the necessity of forsaking the errors and false traditions which we have received from our fathers, errors in doctrine, false traditions concerning God, concerning his kingdom, and concerning the plan of salvation which he has revealed. And if we have profited by that first lesson, we have been continually progressing, learning new truths, new to us, acquiring knowledge concerning ourselves, concerning the work with which we are connected, concerning the earth and the inhabitants thereof. And we have been unlearning and forsaking the errors and faults of our forefathers and of the world from which we have been gathered. The prayer which Jesus taught his disciples to ask the Father, that his kingdom might come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, will be fulfilled by means of this work with which we are identified. The foundation of that kingdom has already been laid, and the aim of every true Latter-day Saint, from the day that he or she joined this church until today, has been to approximate to that life which we were told is led by those who are exalted through keeping the commandments of God, to do the will of God on earth as it is done in heaven. For as the Apostle John says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope within him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So with the Latter-day Saints. They have a hope of salvation within them. They desire to keep the commandments of God, and they have been seeking from the beginning until today to purify themselves, to live a heavenly life, and to reduce, to practice, in their daily walk and conversation, those precepts and laws obedience to which would prepare them to dwell eternally with God in the heavens. There is a characteristic about the faith of the Latter-day Saints in which they perhaps differ from most of the professed followers of Jesus Christ. They do not believe that God expects or desires them to put off acquiring these perfections, powers, gifts, and graces which belong to the heavenly world until they reach that world, but they believe that God has placed them here 
in a state of probation, and that he has hid himself only to a certain extent from them, that he has drawn a veil of darkness between himself and his children on the earth, for the purpose of trying their faith, of developing their knowledge, and testing their integrity, so that those who will feel after him in faith, persevering in the, mo in the midst of ignorance, darkness, doubt, confusion, and the temptations of Satan, and all the evils with which we come in contact in this state of being, may receive his blessings and the gifts, graces, and favors which he bestows upon his most favored children. Hence the Latter-day Saints believe in doing everything here that will help to prepare them for eternal life in his presence. They look upon this world as a place where they should attend to these things. By baptism? Yes. By having hands laid upon them? Yes. Having the gifts of the Holy Ghost? Certainly. Have them here as well as hereafter. Have them here to a partial extent to prepare them for the life that is to come. Have the voice of God here? Yes. Why should we not know God's will here? Why should we be closed out entirely from not all knowledge of God here, and yet believe that as soon as we die we are ushered into the fullness of His glory? Receive these blessings here? Yes, every blessing that is necessary. Be perfect here? Yes, it is man's privilege, and the Latter-day Saints believe to be as perfect in his sphere as God our Eternal Father is in his sphere, or as Jesus in his sphere, or as the angels in their spheres. Said Jesus to his disciples, Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Perfection, then, is to a certain extent possible on earth for those who will live lives that are agreeable to the mind and will of God. Now, as fast as the Latter-day Saints can comprehend the life that God, his angels, and those who are made perfect in his presence lead, they should be willing, and I believe that most of them are willing, to copy after that life in this state as quickly as possible. Well, but, says one, how useful it is for frail, fallible, and mortal beings to attempt to live lives of perfection, like the angels and those who are just and perfect in the presence of God. I know that if we are to judge of men naturally, as we see them in the midst of their sins, breaking the commandments of God, trampling upon his holy ordinances, disregarding his requirements, we should say it is useless. And it is not only useless, but it is impossible for men to ever to reach that perfection of which we speak. But I am encouraged in my hopes that perfection, to a certain extent at least, is possible even in this mortal life, by witnessing the results in the midst of a people who are striving after it. I know that the efforts of this people in this direction, though not always crowned with the success that we have desired, yet there has been abundant cause for rejoicing and thanksgiving in the progress which we have made. We have attained unto a degree of union and love that approximates to some extent to that union and love which we believe exists in the eternal worlds. We have not yet reached, probably, that point when we can love our neighbors as we do ourselves. But still, if we strive for and keep that object in view, and endeavor to reach that perfection, undoubtedly we shall overcome our selfishness and all those feelings which seem to be part of fallen human nature, sufficiently to carry out that command of God. If we could get a glimpse of heaven, that heaven to which we are hastening, or to which we hope we are hastening, have you any idea that there would be any conflict of interest among the inhabitants of that blissful abode? Do you imagine that we should see one arrayed against another, that we would be clashing and struggling, each one scrambling to get the advantage of his neighbor, and to acquire influence and power, and the blessings that belong to that abode more and greater than his neighbor? That is not the idea that we have formed of heaven. We have not entertained such views, but we imagine when we get there that God will be the possessor. He is the possessor of all things that are comprehended within that sphere of existence, that the thrones, the principalities, powers, and crowns, and even the very garments that the exalted wear belong to God, and that he will give them to us, that we shall possess them, subject, of course, to his laws, and to those regulations that he will enact, or that he has already enacted. I do not suppose that there was a Christian that ever lived. I do not suppose that there was a heathen that ever lived, who expected that when he got to the next world, to the place of bliss, which he anticipated in his faith while here, he would live in anything like the condition he occupied here. Converse with the Christians about the next world, and they will all say that they do not expect to have anything, that they are redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, and that all the glory and honor of their salvation they ascribe to God and the Lamb, that they will be content with anything he chooses to give them when they reach there, they would be content to be doorkeepers or to occupy the lowest position if they could only be permitted to dwell in the presence of God. 
and the heathen who believe in a future state of existence, and this belief is universal among them. I believe it was Bancroft who said that atheism is the sin or crime of civilization and not a heathendom or of natural men. The heathen universally believed in a future state of existence, and they pictured to themselves a condition such as I have described, of course varying according to their faith and their views of this life, thinking that they will have circumstances similar to that life which is to come, with this difference only, that they will be more perfect and will be delivered from the evils to which they are subjected here as mortal beings. If, then, my brethren and sisters, we are striving to live in accordance with that life to which we are hastening, we, by a little reflection, can see how much there is for us to do in order to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the first teachings or revelations that was given to this church after its organization was to effect that we should dwell together as one family, that there should be an identity of interests among us, that we should approximate to some extent at least, and as far as practicable to that identity of interest which we understood by the revelations of Jesus Christ to exist in the eternal worlds. This revelation is one of the earliest given to this people, and its practice was entered upon in early days. We have been told that those who are old enough to know, and who had experience at that time, that to the obedience or to failure of the people in carrying out this revelation was due the expulsion of the Latter-day Saints from Jackson County to, in the state of Missouri, and that afterward the same causes operated to produce the results which the people experienced at that time, God suffering the enemies of his kingdom and people to have power over them because of their disobedience to respond to the call which he made upon and to the commandments which he gave unto them. This is one of the traditions that has come down to us of a younger generation. From the fathers of this church, it has been taught to us and impressed upon us for years probably, upon many of us since we knew anything of this work, until the belief is fastened upon the hearts, consciences, and feelings of the great bulk of the Latter-day Saints, and that at some time or other, in the future of this church, that doctrine would again be taught, and the requirements embodied in that revelation would be again made upon us as a people. In fact, the teachings I have received have been that until we did obey that the privilege of going back and building up the center stake of Zion and redeeming that land which God first gave unto his people as an inheritance in the state of Missouri would not be granted unto us, and that until we did obey it, we should be pilgrims and wanderers and should not have the privilege of going back and laying the foundation of the center stake of Zion and of that great temple which God has said shall be reared in this generation, so that for years, speaking my own feelings, I have awaited, I will not say with anxiety, but with great desire, the time when this people would have sufficient faith, and when the circumstances should be so favorable that God should command us to enter upon the practice of that principle, or to enter into that order which he commanded us in the beginning to obey. Every time I have traveled among the nations of the earth, I have thanked God that he had provided a panacea for the evils which I saw everywhere around me. When I saw the rich reveling in luxury, crowding upon the poor, crushing out their lives, the poor living in squalor and misery, their lives a burden to them, not having in many instances enough food to eat, or raiment to wear, or a shelter, and when winter approached, dreading it with feelings indescribable. In a society where the world there is a large class of people having more means than they can spend for their comfort and convenience, they have the finest houses, abundance of food, every convenience, troops of servants to wait upon them to do their bidding, and have all the wealth they can desire, every luxury they can conceive of. At the same time, there are living in the same community thousands of poor creatures destitute of the necessaries of life. My heart has been pained within me in visiting the large cities of Europe, at seeing women degraded like beasts of the field, and their lives continual burdens to them, their existence almost joyless. It has been a wonder to me how people could keep from committing suicide in the midst of, of the want that was everywhere apparent. I have thought, how can God bear with this people on the cries of the poor ascending to him continually? And, as I have said, I have thanked God in my heart that he had provided a means of deliverance from such evils for his people. There is an expression used in the prophets which I have often thought of about the rich grinding the faces of the poor. It is a most forcible and significant metaphor. The tyranny and oppression that are practiced upon the poor are terrible. In many places their faces are literally ground by those who rule over them. Yet there are philanthropic men and women, rich people, who do not take comfort in their riches because of the existence of this misery on every hand of which I have spoken. 
and they form benevolent societies of every name and nature in order to relieve the wants of the suffering poor. And yet with all their efforts, the suffering is not lessened to any measurable extent. The people live and toil and die in the most squalid misery by thousands in all the large cities of thickly populated countries. I have also, in conversation at various times and under various circumstances, been told by those with whom I have conversed and who have taken some interest in the work with which we are identified, that so long as we were a primitive people and were simple in our habits, so long as we did not have a great deal of wealth in our midst, we should probably continue to prosper and increase, and bring forth and manifest in our lives the virtues which I described as having an existence among us. Men have told me, Oh yes, Mr. Cannon, the picture you draw of the manner of life of your people is very delightful. It is delightful to find a people exhibiting such qualities as you describe as existing among, or possessed by your people. But you are a new people, a new sect or de denomination. But wait a while, wait until you have grown in wealth, importance, numbers, and power, and then we shall see whether your system possesses elements superior to the systems with which we are acquainted and which have preceded yours. Men who have reflected, who have read and made themselves acquainted with the histories of other peoples, know full well that once wealth increases in the midst of a people, when class distinctions make their appearance, when education is promoted and aspired after by certain classes with which other classes cannot reach, when refinement, the refinement of education and culture has its effects, creating distinctions among a people who were originally were primitive, and luxurious habits come in to foster these differences, then the strength of former communities has disappeared, and the nations which have been noted as possessing the strength and the union of iron have fallen into decay and have lost their power and have been broken into fragments and have eventually disappeared. Judging us by the light of this kind of experience, might many have made predictions which you have probably seen in the papers thousands of times, that there were causes operating in the midst of the Mormon community that would work out its disintegration and eventually bring about its utter overthrow or downfall, or at least bring about an assimilation between it and the systems by which it was surrounded. There is one thing, however, that is not taken into account in measuring us, and that is that God has laid the foundation of this work. Men do not recognize that but they recognize other causes and other influences that are apparent to them and with which they are familiar. We have consoled ourselves in listening to these predictions with the reflection that we are the people of God, that God has made promises unto this people, that he has said that this work shall stand forever and shall not be given into the hands of another people. These predictions, therefore, have not had any discouraging effect upon us. But with all our confidence, we must not lose sight of the fact that God works by means. If we are to withstand the encroachments of the evil one, we must, on our part, do that which will fortify us against his encroachments. We must take steps to render us impregnable to his assaults. We are not the first people to engage in such a work as this. Others have made repeated attempts to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. One by one the prophets fell. One by one they became victims to the power of the evil one and to the assaults of the wicked. The Son of God himself fell a martyr to this fell spirit. His apostles, one by one, although they endeavored in their day and generation to establish this order of Enoch, to which I have referred, also fell martyrs to the same spirit of persecution, until the inhabitants of the earth had either slain or driven off every apostle, and not a man was left to stand up in the midst of the people to say, Thus saith the Lord, having the authority and power of the apostleship, and of the holy priesthood from God to administer in the things of God and to communicate the mind and will of God unto the people. What followed? A reign of night, darkness, and confusion covered the face of the whole earth. There was no heavenly voice to disturb the solemn stillness that ensued. Every man of God who aspired to revelation had been killed or swept from among men. And then, and not till then, was the vengeance of the adversary satiated, but as long as there was a holy man who aspired to the distinction, or to the honor or blessing of knowing God's will, so long as there were those arrayed against him who scrupled not to shed his blood, and were not satisfied until that blood was spilled. You trace the various dispensations down from the days of Adam until the days of the apostles of which I have spoken, and see how short-lived were their attempts to establish a reign of righteousness. If we turn to the Book of Mormon, which gives an account of God's dealings on this land, we shall find that while the circumstances which surround the Jaredites and the Nephites were more favorable 
than those which surrounded the people of Asia. Yet the same causes operated on this land, and after Jesus came, and the wicked had been swept off by the judgments of God, and none were left but those who were righteous, or partly so at least, that then they sought to establish the holy order among them, and were successful, in continuing in their midst until the year 201 after the birth of Jesus. And we are told that during that time the generations that lived passed away in righteousness before the Lord. The circumstances were undoubtedly favorable for the establishment of a holy order among the people, because, as I have said, the judgments of God had visited the land, and the wicked had been swept off. But no sooner did they begin again to divide each one, seeking after his own affairs to the exclusion of the general affairs of the people, than that they began again to fall into sin and transgression. And the result was that they were punished of God, and the Nephites were eventually blotted out. But we are informed that 167 years, terminating in the year 201 of the Christian era, were passed in perfect peace and righteousness. It was almost millennial righteousness. Satan was bound almost as much during that 167 years in his operations among the Nephites, if we may judge by the short record which has come to us, if he did not have an existence, or as he will be during that thousand years reign of peace, that is so far as leading away the hearts of the people to commit sin is concerned. I have alluded to these various attempts on the part of holy men to establish truth and righteousness on the earth. We have seen that they have only been partially successful. They did not succeed in overcoming sufficiently to entirely bind Satan and to banish from the earth the evils of which he is the cause. But we are told that in the last days God will establish his kingdom. Brother Penrose described this morning in the close of his remarks some of the results which should follow. He said that the lamb and the wolf should lie down together, and the bear and the cow should feed together, and that there should be nothing to hurt or destroy in all the mountain of the Lord, but that peace and union and love should prevail throughout the earth for one thousand years. The prophets have spoken of this time. Those to whom I have referred, who fell victims to the rage of their persecutors, they looked forward to the time when this kingdom should be established and should be successful, and they dwelt upon it with great delight and anticipation. The Apostles John the Revelator speaks about a thousand years of peace and righteousness, when Satan should be bound and should not have power over the hearts of the children of men to tempt them, or to lead them astray, and that this should last for one thousand years, and then at the close of that period he should be loosed again for a little season. The revelations which we have received through the prophet Joseph Smith speak of the same period, that is, anticipate such a time as this that the Apostle John speaks of, and we have been taught from the beginning until the present time that this work, this system, this gospel, called Mormonism, should be the beginning of this work, and that it should spread and increase until it should fill the whole earth and bring to pass the fulfillment of these predictions. Now what I wish to impress upon your minds in bringing them to this point is this, that if we are engaged in a work that is to be more successful than any other work that has been established by God, our Heavenly Father, from the beginning until now, there must be greater faith and union, there must be more power, there must be a willingness to sacrifice more than has ever been manifested by any people who have preceded us in works of this character, or in any dispensation which God has given unto men. I know that many think that God will do a great deal. I believe that I am a believer in God's power to the fullest extent, but I have noticed in my experience that God works by means, that he does not himself come down in person, neither does he send his angels down except on visits occasionally, but he commands his people, his children on the earth, to do that which he requires at their hands, and then helps them in doing this. And my conclusion is that if we lay the foundation of a work that shall stand forever, that shall never be overthrown, or given into the hands of another people, we must have more faith, practice a higher righteousness, be more valiant for the truth, and possess more of God's power than any people who have ever preceded us. Are we prepared for this? Did the Latter-day Saints take this into their calculation when they joined the church? If they did, it is well. If they did not, they had better begin to investigate the matter and satisfy themselves as to what their duties are. It may be said, as I have already stated, that God will assist us. Undoubtedly he will. He assisted his servants in ancient days. But we have a foe to contend with, who is sleepless. The adversary of our souls has not lost his cunning. He knows that his time is short, and that the last struggle is approaching, and he will not relax in the least degree his vigilance, 
or his diligence in seeking to destroy this work or and to martyr or destroy the men and the women connected with it. The supremacy of the earth depends upon the issue of the contest. He has held the sway. He has been dominant. He has been successful in destroying the holiest and the best that ever trod the earth's surface. The Son of God himself, and the pure and holy in all ages, he has succeeded in destroying, and in spreading his pall of darkness over the earth, and in destroying faith from the midst of the children of men. And now that the attempt is made to revive the work of God, and to establish his kingdom on the earth, we may make calculations with all certainty that he will not cease his endeavors until either he or God and his kingdom are triumphant. He wants to vanquish, and he will vanquish if possible, and he will spare no means to destroy this work, for if it is established, the foundation of his kingdom is sapped. There are principles taught unto us now which will fortify us more effectually than anything that has ever been taught to us before, so far as resisting the pressure that is brought to bear upon us to destroy us. I refer to this order to which I have alluded before, the order of God, the order that is called after Enoch, because as we are told in the Revelations, he established it among his people, and brought about that perfection which enabled him and his city to be translated. I know there are many feelings among the people in relation to this. I have heard more since I returned to Salt Lake City. In the few days I have been here concerning the feelings of men who call themselves Latter-day Saints than I imagined existed among us. In the South the people have organized, and they have gone along very well during the last season. Bishop Collister remarked to me when I was at Fillmore passing south that he doubted whether Enoch himself and his people made more or better progress than they had made in the same time. I doubted it also. Subsequent observation confirmed the truth of this remark. So far as other settlements are concerned, I found the people in some instances discouraged a little, but on the whole they were greatly encouraged by the results of their season's labor, and they felt to organize themselves more perfectly according to the new Articles of Association and to carry out the requirements which had been made upon them. I was delighted in visi visiting a little town on the banks of the Rio Virgin called Price. There the superintendent of the farming, Brother Baker, remarked, I wish you had come about an hour earlier. You would have seen us all here together at our meal. Said I, What do you mean? He said, They had just got through dinner. Said I, Do you eat together? Oh, yes, he said. We have been living as one family all this season. I was surprised, for I had not heard of it, and I was so much interested in it that I commenced to make inquiries as to their condition. I found that there were from forty to forty-four men, women, and children, who had joined together in accordance with the counsel given by President Young while in the South. They had proceeded to farm together, and to live together as one family. I thought that the best persons that I could refer to, to obtain information as to the real workings of the affair, would be the sisters. So I proceeded to interrogate them. The leading sister told me that sometimes it was rather hard work. I did not wonder at it when I saw the kitchen. They had three small cooking stoves, and they were quite inconveniently situated. But, she added, we have felt excellently and feel greatly encouraged. Said I, are the people satisfied? Don't you sometimes have fault fighting with your cooking, or your meals, or something of this kind? No, she said, there had been no faults found. How did the sisters feel? Are they tired of it? No, she said, they were not. They felt greatly encouraged, and they divided the labor so that it was not very heavy upon any of them, not too heavy. How do you arrange about your washing? They told me that in the beginning they put their washing all together, but they had no machinery, and they found it was no advantage, as it was too heavy even for the strong women, and they concluded that it was better to divide their washing, and for each family to do its own. I spoke to the superintendent. How do you manage with your men? Are the brethren willing, when you require them to do anything? Do they go with alacrity, or do you have difficulty in controlling them? Not in the least, said he. I have never made a requirement or asked a man to do anything that he has refused to do, and in our farming they have worked well and patiently together, and they are satisfied with the arrangement. I spoke to others who worked there and made inquiries of them, and I found in every instance that there was a good deal of satisfaction in the arrangement, and they hoped, if they could get up a suitable building and have suitable convenience for their cooking, that a great deal of this labor would be lightened, and they would get along much better even than they had done. Brother Samuel Miles is one of the company, a man whom many of this congregation know, and who has been a long time in the church. I talked with him, being an old acquaintance, and he told me that from his observation during the entire season, 
He deemed what was originally an experiment was an entire success, and he felt very much gratified with the result. After rising in the morning, they meet in one room together and have prayers. Then they sit down to breakfast, and while at breakfast the superintendent converses with the men as to the arrangement of labor for the day. After breakfast they go to their work, one to one department, one to another. At noon they again assemble for dinner, eat their dinner after having asked a blessing upon it, and then spend a little leisure until one o'clock or the hour expires, and then resume their labors. They come together again in the evening, when they have supper to attend to their prayers, and spend the remainder of the evening in social conversation or in conversation on business or in arranging their affairs as the case may be. I afterwards visited a little settlement of the name of Hebron, where there are about thirty families. The bishop, George H. Crosby, said they had a brick and lumber on hand to build several residences, but they hesitated about building as they had some thought of carrying out the suggestions which President Young made to the people, or to some of them, to enter into a family arrangement, and they thought that probably it would be well to use their material and build a suitable building. It was afterwards suggested that they build a dining room and a commodious kitchen, etc., and that they live in their own residences during this coming summer and try the effect of eating together. This they may do. They had found that it would be far more convenient for them in their labor to be together during the summer season. At least, and the weather being fine, they could walk from their houses to the dining room and eat their meals, and then the men go to their labor and the women and children separate again. In that settlement they have labored during this past season in the United Order, and they told me that they had raised double the amount of crops they ever raised before, and all their labors are proportionally advanced. And this is the testimony of a good many settlements. There are some complaints as a matter of course. I heard some about tools being misused, about wagons not being greased, about animals not being fed, harnesses not being cared for, but these results are due to great extent of to want of system. Another objection that we found that has been that has resulted badly in some instances is that men have put in a portion of their property only and kept out a portion. Of course, the portion that is kept out absorbs nearly all of their attention, while that which is put into the order does not receive that share of attention which it should have. And when they were called upon to labor, they had other interests which called them off, and they excused themselves or sent their boys to attend to it. In some wards and settlements, they have been crippled in consequence of this. But recent instructions which have been given by the First Presidency that no one should be admitted into the order unless he enters with all that he has, except in case of debt, then the Board of Directors to exercise their discretion about that, will have a good effect throughout the entire South. It will concentrate the labors of the people in one direction, and where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. And if all a man's property is in the United Order, if he be a Latter-day Saint, he will labor with fidelity for the furtherance of the objects which the Order has in view. There is one thing that has been demonstrated by this season's labor, namely that better results can be produced by a combination of labor as proposed in the United Order than by individual effort to the same extent. I was much gratified at finding that this was the universal testimony of all with whom I conversed on the subject. While at St. George, after holding two days' meeting, Brother Snow and myself held meetings with the bishops, superintendents, foremen, and leading men in the various settlements throughout the stake. We requested them to give us a full and free expression of their feelings concerning the season's labors, to tell us all the causes of discouragement, if there were any, and also the causes of encouragement, and those that I have already alluded to were the principal ones given. There have been in some instances indolence, carelessness, and indisposition, and indisposition to work, and an inclination manifested to throw the labor upon those who are industrious and energetic. It might be expected that such would be the result. It could scarcely be otherwise. I was reminded very much in hearing the statement of the brethren of what the Prophet Joseph said when alive about the indolence, carelessness, and indifference to work manifested by some men. He said that there were three kinds of poor, the Lord's poor, the devil's poor, and the poor devils. I thought that this order was bringing to the surface the poor devils, and I should not be surprised if it would have this effect. In fact, if a man who is not inspired with right feelings should get connected with the order, there is no doubt that he would shirk work and be careless and indifferent whenever he could be. We know that there are many eye servants among us, men who work only when they are watched, and so far as the use of the tools is concerned, any man who has employed other men 
and has not been in a position to look after them and watch what they are doing, knows how men work, even as we are situated at the present time. He knows how his tools are misused and mislaid, and his harness and his wagons and his teams are used or abused, and that it requires much care on his part or on the part of somebody equally trusty to preserve his property. He has to frequently buy new tools, new spades, hoes, forks, plows, and if he has a mower and entrusts it to other hands than his own, in many instances he gets it broken. This is not always the case, but it is too much the case, and we have these things to contend with now, and in my opinion, judging imperfection to the light that a man has within him, and in my opinion, judging by my observation, as far as it has extended, they are no worse in the united order, and there is this about the gospel. It brings every imperfection to the light that a man has within him. When this gospel has been preached for the first time in neighborhoods, I have heard hundreds say to me, at different times, Oh, I am so glad that I have got this truth. There is Mr. So-and-so, or there is my aunt, or my uncle, or such and such a friend, my wife, or such a relative. There is my minister. If I go to him and tell them what I have received, he will embrace it gladly and be a Latter-day Saint. And they go and tell what they have received. Probably hundreds of you are here today, have gone filled with zeal. Why, I have got the truth, and I want you to hear the truth. And what has been the result? The devil has manifested himself immediately, and they have found that their relatives had a spirit which they never dreamed of, and they have proved their ministers to be anything but willing to receive the truth. The gospel has that effect. It brings men and women's imperfections to light. It shows the imperfections of their characters. It tests people and tears the covering from hypocrisy and false pretensions as nothing else can. The united order being one of the principles will, I expect, have this effect. But would it not be better for our faults and imperfections to be brought to light in this life than to wait until the next and have them brought to the surface then? The people feel very well so far as I have had opportunity to observe. We have explained the articles of association to them. They have been gratified at the explanations which have been made. Many have reasoned upon it like this. If I put all that I have got into the United Order and I begin to draw day's wages only out of the order, I have got a large family. How can I sustain them upon my day's wages? It takes the product of my property managed with care and economy, in addition to my own labor, to enable me to live. And if I put all my property in the order, how am I to live? This has been the inquiry more frequently made than another. It is not the intention in establishing the United, United Order to destroy the productiveness of property. It is not the intention to take property from men who have it and give it to those who have none. There are two extremes to be avoided. One is the disposition of the rich to aggrandize themselves at the expense of the poor. That is we are trying in the United Order to put a stop to, so that we may prevent the growth of class distinctions, the increase of wealth in a certain class, and that class have interests diverse from and frequently adverse to the rest of the community. That is one extreme. The other is this idea, to which I have referred, the anxiety of poor people to get possession of the accumulations of the rich and to have them divided among them, and a general leveling take place. There is no such idea connected with this order. Such a thing could not stand for very long. And let me say to you who find fault with this united order, ask yourselves when you ever saw anything connected with this church or its doctrines that was unnatural, that was not consistent with good common sense. Do you think that we can teach and practice anything that will repress people, that will destroy individual effort, that will take away from enterprise its incentive? No, there is nothing connected with the system of this character, and it is upon this point that men and women are so much deluded by the false and slanderous reports which are circulated. There never was a day since our organization as a people, according to my ideas and my reading of our early history and my subsequent experience, when there were so many falsehoods in circulation about any principle as there have been about this united order. There is far too much ignorance among us, and men take advantage of this to deceive the people by their falsehoods. It is the intention to preserve that which we have. If a man is a man of business, let him have a chance to show his business capacity, not stop him, not take his property from him and give it to somebody who never had anything. The intention is to use the skill of the businessman in elevating those who are not businessmen, to bring up the poor from their level to the broad upper level, not to pull down the upper level to the plane of the lower. That is not the design, but it is that we shall work for each other's good, and where men have property, let them take means to preserve it, not to destroy it. 
It's not the intention for boards of directors to use arbitrary power over men and property. There are many cases where if a man were to put all that he has into the order, it would be found that he already manages that property better than the board of directors could. Under such circumstances, it would be better to say, here, you have managed this property economically. You have done well with it. We could not do so well with it if we took it. There is no object to be gained by our taking it from you. You continue to use and manage it as a stewardship and keep up its productiveness. This will have to be done doubtless in many instances. But as to our farming interests, we can farm together far better than separately. Instead of having so many mowers and reapers and so many tools, teams, and wagons as we have now, we can concentrate our labors and have better results from the use of a given quantity of capital and labor than under our present system. And I do hope that the bishops in this city will take hold of this matter as they should do. Will they do it, or will they stand in the way of the people? I firmly believe that many of our leading men are standing today in the way of the people in relation to the organization of this united order, but if they were to do as they should do, as God requires from them, they would take hold of this principle and the spirit of it. Well, but, says one, suppose I lose my property. Suppose you do. Is it, it is not intended that you should lose it, but suppose that you do. If my property goes, what odds is it? God gave it to me, and if I lose it in obeying his commandments, who cares? I do not. When I got old enough to understand this gospel, I saw that it might take everything men had and even their lives to maintain it in the earth. And if a man is not willing to lay down his life for this gospel, he is not worthy of it. If he should not be willing to risk his property in carrying out a great principle of what value are his professions of faith. And when God calls upon us, we who have been saying all day that our property was upon the altar and proposes a plan to save and exalt us and give us strength, we begin to mourn about our property and to tell what failures there have been in the management of the property about cooperation being a failure and thus justify ourselves for refusing to do what God requires and yet call ourselves Latter-day Saints. Out upon men and women calling themselves saints of God and making the professions which they do and striving for the exaltation which they profess to be aiming for, who would make such expressions? Suppose that in doing that which God requires, all of our property should be taken, which we may rest assured will not be the case. If God were to permit a mob to come upon us, they should sweep away the whole of our property. If a mob were to come upon us and drive us, how much would any of us be worth? And cannot God let our enemies have power to scourge us? I think he can, and unless there is a different spirit manifested by leading men, by bishops, and by men who ought to have the spirit and power of God resting upon them, and by the people themselves in many instances, anger may be aroused against us. I believe that today President Young is prostrated under a load that, if we were obedient, he would be relieved from. I believe he would have been sound and well able today to teach us from this stand if we had done as we should have done. He is wearied by his labors in teaching and laboring in our midst, calling upon us early and late, entreating us to listen to the counsel of God. I have said, and I repeat it, that if we do not know that this united order is true of ourselves by the revelations of God, we should be willing to obey it just because President Young teaches it, a man who has taught us and led us for so many years, so faithfully and so successfully, God having blessed him as he has done in so signal a manner all the time. If this people would take hold of the principle in that spirit, they would soon know that it was of God. The testimony of Jesus would rest upon them, and they would know it for themselves. And then, when you get that spirit, they would not care about property. If it took all, they would say, All right. When you made up your minds to obey this gospel, did you hesitate because your friends told you that if you became Mormons, you would spoil your prospects and lose your friends? No, you sacrificed every worldly consideration. You risked all for the truth, for the salvation which God promised you. And so, in this united order, you have a testimony that it is of God. You will feel, no matter what it costs, all right. Failures, yes, there may be failures. I expect there will be failures and mistakes as long as we are so full of frailty. But who cares for that? But this will not be the fault of the principle. If God commands us to do anything, let us do it with all our heart, and he will prepare the way and preserve us from the bad effects of the failures. He always has controlled results for our good, and he will do it again. Why, there are men who would say that the mission of Jesus was a failure. Was he not killed by the Jews? and the plan of salvation is a failure, and that creation is a failure, that may, 
And they may just as well say these things as to say that cooperation is a failure and that many other things are failures. Some say that God failed in putting Adam and Eve in the garden and allowing the serpent to tempt them and cause them to fall, and the whole scheme was a failure. Why not as well say that as to say that the other things are failures? There are some people who can only judge of merit by success. If successful, no matter what it may be, it is meritorious. It may have its origin in hell, and success is, in their estimation, a test of merit. The best of schemes and plans have fr failed frequently in this sense, and yet have been true and perfect. I know that God requires this union in our hands, and by the help of God I am determined with all the influence and power that he has given me, or that he may give me, to use my endeavors with the people to organize in a manner to resist every encroachment made against them. All hell is arrayed against us, and the powers thereof are bound to destroy this work, if they can, and it is our duty as Latter-day Saints to band ourselves together in the power of God. We shall be able to do it if we do right, and the wicked will not gain a single advantage over us. That is just as true as that God lives, and I know it. I know that this united order is of God, for God has revealed it to me. The revelations of Jesus Christ have imparted this knowledge to me, and I know it for myself. I know by the gift of the Holy Ghost that it is our duty as a people and as individuals to enter into this united order and carry it out in the spirit that God has revealed it in. Listen to this testimony and the men and women who have the love of the truth within them have, or will have the testimony of Jesus that these words are true and faithful. And I desire to say further, there has got to be a spirit of repentance sought for by many of those who are now called Latter-day Saints, or they will lose the Spirit of God and their standing among this people. Will God prosper us in this united order? Yes, and we cannot be a rich people. We cannot be the people which God designs us to be until we live after that pattern. There are hundreds of men who are praying constantly to God to deliver them from apostasy, and there are others who pray that God will deliver them from being rich, because they perceive that frequently when men get rich, they are not easily handled. They become intractable. They lose, in some instances, the Spirit of God, and therefore they pray that God will deliver them from being rich, and that they may not be lifted up in pride. Yet we know that the revelations and prophecies say that God will make us a rich people. Speaking about Zion of the last days, Isaiah says that the Lord will bring for brass gold, for iron silver, and for stones iron to build up the Zion of God. When will that be done? When we are united, so that we shall not consume the wealth that God will give us upon our lusts, upon creating class distinctions, raising one class above another, one class living in luxury and another class groveling in poverty. But when we are so organized that there will be no rich and no poor, but all partaking alike of the bounties that God shall give unto us, then, and in my opinion not till then, can he bestow upon us the wealth that he has promised. It would ruin us today if we had it. And God, as I view his providence, withholds these blessings from us because of the effects that they would have upon us as a people. He does not wish to destroy us. But when we are organized to write, then what? Why, then, we will be fulfilled after a while another, saying, Isaiah's and stranger shall stand and feed your flocks, and the son of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, and ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of God. All these problems of capital and labor can be solved by this principle and in no other way, and there will be an incessant and never-ending conflict between capital and labor until they are solved in this manner. That God may pour out his Holy Spirit upon you, my brethren and sisters, and fill you therewith, to enable you to do his will perfectly, is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. The following missionaries were then called and presented before the conference, who were unanimously approved by the congregation with uplifted hands. Names of Missionaries To Scandinavia N. C. Fly Glare, Ogden City Soren C. Christofferson, Manti Andrew R. Anderson, Lehigh To the British Isles Robert Easton of Greenville for Scotland Henry C. Fowler, 20th Ward, S.L. City for England To the United States and Canada Chandler Holbrook, Fillmore Thurden Rogers, Fillmore Ansel P. Harmon, Holden James Z. Stewart, Draperville, A. W. Smith, Draperville, Thomas Steed, Farmington, Truman Leonard, Farmington, William Rawson, Harrisville, Louis D. Wilson, Ogden, Erastus Bingham, Jr., Huntsville, 
Alexander Brown, Lynn, Moses Clough, Provo, Joshua Davis, Provo, Ezra Barnard, Box Elder County, Samuel Henderson, Box Elder County, Abraham Hunsaker, Brigham City, William Brown, Bountiful, George Hickerson, Sr., Corn Creek, J. A. Ross, Corn Creek, David Savage, Sr., Holden, M. B. Ship, 11th Ward, S. L. City, Ezra T. Clark, Farmington, H. C. Haight, Farmington, Joseph A. Taylor, Sr., Harrisville, Noah Shirtliff, Harrisville, Myrtleo Shaw, Ogden, Allenson C. Allen, Huntsville, Myron B. Child, Riverdale, Charles Harding, Box Elder County, R. K. Homer, Box Elder County, Christopher F. Dixon, Payson, George S. Rust, Payson, Samuel Bills, Payson, Robert Smith, Payson, George E. Steele, Provo, Alfred Billings, Provo, J. M. Ballinger, Pleasant Grove, William Wynn, Lehigh. Elder George Q. Cannon announced that on Friday afternoon the church authorities would be presented to the conference. The choir sang the anthem, Give Ear to My Words. Conference adjourned till 10 o'clock on Friday morning. Benediction by President George A. Smith. Fourth day, Friday, October 9, 1874. The choir sang, When Earth in Bondage Long Had Lain and Darkness o'er the Nations Reigned. Prayer by Elder H. H. Clough. The choir sang, Come all ye saints who dwell on earth, your cheerful voices raise. Elder John Van Cott spoke of the many opportunities that were offered the Latter-day Saints for their improvement if properly attended to, but considerable slackness was very observable in many of late, which he thought could be accounted for by the fact of the Saints being in more easy and comfortable circumstances than heretofore, and allowing themselves to be allured into slothfulness pertaining to the things of God, whereas such blessings ought to inspire feelings of gratitude and devotion. He then reviewed the travels and trials of the saints in coming over the plains to these valleys, and the union that existed among them in their then poverty-stricken circumstances, and that continued in their midst, which accounts for the wonderful improvements that are to be seen everywhere throughout the territory. We are now called upon by God, through his servant Brigham, to unite our temporal interests, that we might obtain more power and favor with God, and be able to repel the powers of darkness. He personally was ready and willing to thoroughly unite with the saints, with everything he had, feeling very desirous to take those steps marked out for the saints, not only for our present benefit, but for the blessing of future generations. Greater blessings would grow out of this union than it is possible for the minds of the saints to contemplate. Elder Wilford Woodruff said that during the last forty years the Latter-day Saints had been taught many things, and yet they still needed a great deal of preaching. In all ages of the world, history tells us that persecution and trials had been the legacy and experience of the saints, and any man who is not prepared to round up his shoulders and take what persecution, or even death, might be his lot, was not worthy of the blessings that were promised to the faithful. This dispensation was the one that all ancient prophets had their eye upon, and would not close until the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Eternal life was what we were aiming after, and what goods and chattels, houses or lands in comparison with it. We should have far more safety if we united ourselves together than in remaining in our present divided condition. God never had a better nor a valiant set of men and women in any age of the world than he had in our day, and we who gathered in these mount valleys of the mountains. Speaking of persecutions, he said, we were no better than our master was when he was on the earth, who suffered much poverty and persecution and also death. And we need not fear, for God would not permit our enemies to do more than was necessary to accomplish his purposes. If persecution and even death awaited us, what of it? All the world had to die sooner or later, and it was far better to die in trying to establish the kingdom of God than, as many did, on the battlefield, simply for the glory of defending some earthly king or potentate. Let our prayers ascend before the Lord for the presidency of the church. They were our leaders, and had been for many years. We should not only pray, but our work should correspond therewith to sustain the kingdom of God. Let us try to do our duty and attend to all the ordinances of the gospel and enter into the united order of God, or we could never attain to a celestial glory. Saints are chosen. Eternal life worth more than all things else. Works must correspond with faith. Prayer to God a duty. Remarks by Elder Wilford Woodruff, delivered at the semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 
in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Friday morning, October 9, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. We as a people have had a great deal of teaching and counsel in our day and generation. Some of us have been taught in the things of this kingdom for over forty years, and by this time we ought to exercise faith in the promises of God. We have looked forward to the fulfillment of the revelations which have been given in all ages and dispensations which are past and gone, and we have not only expected their fulfillment, but we have helped to fulfill a great many of them in the course of our lives. This work is the work of God. It is not the work of man. The Lord has set his hand in the last days in fulfillment of revelation and prophecy and the promises which have been made for thousands of years past and gone, concerning the earth and the dispensations thereof. I will here say that all inspired men from the days of Father Adam to the days of Jesus had a view, more or less, of the great and last dispensation of the fullness of times. When the Lord would set his hand to prepare the earth and a people for the coming of the Son of Man and a reign of righteousness. One of the brethren was speaking here about the views entertained by some in the world who regard Christianity and the work of God as a failure. I will say that the work of the Lord has never been a failure, and it never will. His purposes have to be accomplished in the earth. There is one thing true with regard to the history and travels of the saints of God in every age of the world. They have had to pass through trials, tribulations, and persecutions, and have had to contend with opposition and this will always be their fate until the power of evil is overcome. This is one of the legacies that is designed from God to the saints while dwelling in the flesh among a world of devils, for the world is full of them. There are millions and millions. All that were cast out of heaven, they never die, and they never leave the earth, but they dwell here and will continue to do so until Satan is bound. As a people, we have to meet this warfare and the saints of God have had to contend with it in every age of the world. Any man who undertakes to serve God has to round up his shoulders and meet it, and any man who will not trust in God and abide in his cause even unto death is not worthy of a place in the celestial kingdom. Said Jesus, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hate you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. They have hated me, they will hate you, and if they persecute me, they will persecute you. This is the legacy which all saints may depend upon receiving. True, there has been a difference in the various dispensations. This is the only dispensation which God has ever established that was foreordained, before the world was made, not to be overcome by wicked men and devils. All other dispensations have been made war upon by the inhabitants of the earth, and the servants and saints of God have been martyred. This was the case with Jesus and the apostles in their day. The Lord gave that good old prophet Enoch, president of the Zion of God, who stood in the midst of his people 365 years, a view of the earth in its various dispensations, showing him that the time would come when it would groan under the wickedness, blasphemy, murders, whoredoms, and abominations of its inhabitants. The prophet asked the Lord whether there would ever be a time when the earth should rest, and the Lord answered that in the dispensation of the fullness of times the earth would fill the measure of its days and then it would rest from wickedness and abominations, for in that day he would establish his kingdom upon it, to be thrown down no more for ever. Then a reign of righteousness would commence, and the honest and meek of the earth would be gathered together to serve the Lord, and upon them would rest power to build up the great Zion of God in the last, latter days. These things were also shown to Abraham, and many others of the ancient servants of God had glimpses of them by vision, revelation, and the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and what they saw, or on account of what they saw, has been left on record. This dispensation is one that all the patriarchs and prophets had their eye upon, and the Lord has commenced it and has carried it on now for more than forty years, since this church was organized with six members. We have not altogether traveled on beds of ease. We have had warfare and opposition from the commencement until this day. But we in the world may set our hearts at rest concerning Mormonism, for it will never cease until the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of heaven. This nation and other nations will war with the saints of God until their cup is full, and when they become ripened in iniquity, the Lord Almighty will cut them off, and the judgments of the Most High will follow the testimony of the elders of Israel. This is the way I look upon it. We are called upon to do our duty with regard to the subject which has been spoken by Brothers Van Cott and Cannon. What is this world, I would like to know? What are the things of this world? What are houses and lands, goods and chattels, and the treasures of the earth generally to us? What are they to any saints of God compared with eternal life? We should certainly be well off to unite ourselves and our interests together in the things of God as to be separate. 
There have been too much selfishness and division in every man for himself amongst us, and the devil for us all. Eternal life is worth more to a saint of God than all things else put together. In fact, it is the greatest gift God ever gave to man, or that he can give to him, and whatever the Lord requires at our hands, we should be ready to do so, individually and collectively. As I have often remarked in my testimony from my youth up, I had a desire to live to see a people rise up in the earth and contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, who would receive and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was taught in his day and generation. When I heard this gospel, I embraced it. The first sermon I ever heard, the Spirit of God bore record to me that it was true, and I went forth and was baptized for the remission of my sins. I received the laying on of hands, and the Lord gave me the Holy Ghost and a testimony just the same as he gave to you, and to hundreds of thousands of those who have obeyed the gospel. It was but a short time after embracing the work that I was called to go with my brethren a thousand miles for the redemption of Zion. I went willingly, for I knew it was the work of God. It was what I had sought for from the time I was eight years old, what I had been taught in the Presbyterian Sunday School, and what I had read in the New Testament in my father's house. From that time up, I had looked for these things, and I had a testimony that I should live to see them, and I did, and when I embraced this gospel, my heart was filled with joy and consolation. And as for this world, if I had the whole of it, I felt in those days as I feel now, it would not stand in my path in seeking for eternal life. I was called to take my life in my hands and go up to Missouri, and a little handful of us went up to redeem our brethren. We certainly had to go by faith. My neighbors called upon and pled with me not to go. Said they, Do not go. If you do, you will lose your life. I said to them, If I knew that I should have a bolt put through my heart the first step I took in the state of Missouri, I would go. I went, and I did not get shot, neither did any of the rest of us, but we fulfilled the commandment of God. That is the way I felt in those days with regard to the work of God, and that is the way I feel today. I am after salvation and eternal life, and I do not want anything to stand between me and that which I am in pursuit of. It does not make any difference what we as a people may be called to pass through. Men can go no further than they are permitted by the Lord. I have often remarked, and I repeat it, your destiny, the destiny of this nation and the destiny of every king, prince, president, statesman, and ruler under heaven, are in the hands of the God of Israel. He made the world and all its inhabitants, and they can go no further than they are permitted. If we unite ourselves according to the law of God, we shall have far more safety than if we turn away from the commandments of the Lord and set our hearts upon the things of this world. If we forget God, we are liable to be scourged. That is my feeling this morning. This is the work of God. The Lord has set his hand to build up his kingdom, and he will do it whatever the consequences may be. Whatever the persecutions or difficulties his saints may be called to pass through, the Lord will never withdraw his hand, for he decreed before the foundation of the world that in the dispensation of the fullness of times the kingdom should be set up upon the earth, never more to be thrown down. The world has had its dispensations. We are at the end of the six thousand years and are bordering upon the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory to reward every man according to the deeds done in the body. And whatever the feelings of the world may be, the Lord has decreed a woe upon that man, that house, that nation, or that people that rejects the testimony of his servants. The Lord says that he will hold a controversy with the nations and judge the world with fire and sword, and he will plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord will be many. What if some of us do have to sacrifice our lives for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ? What of it? What is a man's life? The whole world will die. Armies containing thousands of men go forth for the honor of being killed in order to defend a king or a government. Is it any worse to die for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ than to die serving the devil? Not a particle. I glory in my feelings at the valiant spirit that is and has been manifested by the servants of the living God in the cause of truth and in defense of the great Latter-day work. The Lord never raised up a better set of men and women since the world was than are they who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ in these latter days. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ with them, and they have been called to pass through many trials thus far in the history and progress of the work of God. It is true that many have broken their covenants and turned away from the Lord, and the reason is that they stopped serving God and undertook to serve themselves. And that led them into darkness. They rejected the things of the kingdom of heaven, and the Spirit of God was taken from them, 
And that class of people in every age of the world is the darkest of any who ever breathed the breath of life. They lose all confidence in every principle of salvation and eternal life revealed to man. With regard to our present position, I want to say that it is the duty of every saint of God in these valleys of the mountains to let his prayers ascend into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, day and night in the season thereof, in the family circle and in private places, for the Lord to sustain his people, build up Zion, and fulfill his promises. We are in duty bound to fulfill ours, and the Lord will not fail now any more than he has at any other time. He did not fail in the days of Jesus Christ, not a bit of it. Jesus was poor, and from the manger to the cross spent his whole life in the deepest poverty, suffering, and affliction. He descended below all things that he might rise above, and we are told that he had not money enough to pay his taxes to Caesar, and he had to send Peter to catch a fish to get money for that purpose. He was poor all the way through his life. Is it any worse for you or me or any other saint of God to suffer persecution, affliction, poverty, or trials than for a great leader, president, redeemer, king, and savior who is going to come in the clouds of heaven? No, not a particle. As some of our brethren have said, there is need for us to repent and humble ourselves before the Lord our God, that we may have and enjoy more of the Holy Spirit to prepare us for that which lies before us. It is our duty to unite together as a people. Our temporal salvation lies in this, and we should not be backward in this matter. We should not only preach it, but be also ready to practice it. As leaders and as people, all should unite in carrying out that which was required of us. As an individual, I am not afraid of starving to death. I never was afraid of that in my life, and I have traveled a great many thousand miles to preach the gospel without money and without price. And so have many of my brethren who are around me, and we never starved to death, and we do not expect to. The amount of it is that everything we have here in these valleys of these mountains, this tabernacle, this temple, these public grounds, and all the cities and towns that have been built over 600 miles of territory are the gift of God to us. The Lord knows this country was barren enough when we came here, and a faithful people were tried here with cricket and grasshopper wars until famine stared them in the face. But they trusted in God, and they did not get disappointed. Our prayers should go up day and night in behalf of our president and the presidency whom God has sustained from the beginning, and also for the leaders of the people and for each other. We should labor and pray for this. We are making history. The travels and experience of the Latter-day Saints have been as interesting as the history of any people in any dispensation since the world began. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and he was called to lay the foundation of this kingdom. He was raised up from before the foundation of the world for this purpose, and he came forth through the loins of ancient Joseph who was sold into Egypt and dwelt in the flesh, and nothing failed in its fulfillment as far as he was concerned. He lived until he planted the gospel, until he received the apostleship, and every branch of the priesthood of Aaron and Melchizedek, all the keys of the kingdom of God, everything that was necessary in order to lay the foundation of this church and kingdom, which God through the mouths of holy prophets declared should be established in the latter days, to be thrown down no more forever. Under these circumstances, of course, faith is required on the part of the saints to live their religion, do their duty, walk uprightly before the Lord, and build up his Zion on the earth. Then it requires works to correspond with our faith. I know the testimony of Jesus Christ is not palatable. It does not, and never did, suit the ears of the world at large. Christendom today does not like Mormonism, because it comes in contact with the traditions handed down from the fathers. The world never did like the truth. We cannot help that. It is our duty to bear a true and faithful testimony to the work of God, and to preach the gospel which has been revealed to us in our day by the ministration of angels out of heaven. The gospel is the same as was taught by Adam and the ancient patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Noah, Enoch, Methuselah, and all the ancient prophets, also by Jesus and the apostles. There never was but one gospel, and never will be but one delivered to the children of men, and that never changed and never will change in time or eternity. It is the same in every age of the world. Its ordinances are the same. Believers in the gospel had faith in Jesus before he came in the flesh, and repentance of sin was preached before his day as well as since. They also practiced baptism for their mission of sins and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, and they had the organization of the church with inspired men therein. Saith the Lord Jesus, I have set in the church first apostles, second prophets, 
third teachers, pastors, gifts, helps, and governments. What for? For the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints, etc. These things are necessary in every age of the world, and they have been restored in these last days, and they are true and will have their effect upon the children of men. When this gospel is preached to the Gentiles and they count themselves unworthy of eternal life, it will go to the house of Israel, and the first will then be last, and the last has been first. It is our duty as a people to unite together and not to be slothful in well-doing. As I have already said, we should let our prayers ascend before God. I have more faith in prayer before the Lord than almost any other principle on earth. If we have no faith in prayer to God, we have not much in either Him or the Gospel. We should pray unto the Lord, asking Him for what we want. Let the prayers of this people ascend before the Lord continually in the season thereof, and the Lord will not turn them away, but they will be heard and answered. And the kingdom of Zion of God will rise and shine. She will put on her beautiful garments and be clothed with the glory of her God, and fulfill the object of her organization here upon the earth. Therefore I say, brethren and sisters, let us do our duty. Let us pray for the presidency of this church. Let us uphold and sustain them by our faith and by our works. They are called of God. They have been our leaders for years. President Young has led this church longer and a great deal better than any other man. His works and his life have been before you, and you know him, and the course he has pursued. God has blessed him, and he has been profitable unto us. The revelations of God and the principles which he has brought forth have been a consolation to Israel. Our prayers should ascend for him, that he may be restored to health and be preserved by the hand of God. We should pray to the Lord for everything else that we stand in need of. Then we should go to and do our duty in building the temples of our God, that we may magnify our calling, and be saviors on Mount Zion, for the living and the dead. In the seventeen hundred years which are past and gone, over fifty thousand million people have gone into the spirit world, who never saw the face of a prophet or an apostle, and never heard the works of an inspired man. For during the whole of that time, no man was called of God to build up his kingdom on the earth. Whatever the Christian world may think, these things are true. When the apostles were put to death, the priesthood went from the earth, and the church went into the wilderness, or in other words, there was a falling away among the Gentiles, as there had been before among the Jews. Those generations are in the spirit world, shut up in prison. They have got to be visited by men who held the priesthood in the flesh, that they may preach the gospel unto them. The same as Jesus did when he went to preach the spirits in prison during the three days and nights when his body lay in the tomb. This is our duty. And I will here say that every elder of Israel who lays down his life, whether he dies in his bed or is put to death by the enemies of truth, when he goes into the spirit world, his works follow him and he rests in peace. The priesthood is not taken from him, and he has thousands more to preach to there than he ever had here in the flesh. But it depends upon the living here to erect temples, that the ordinances for the dead may be attended to. For by and by you will meet your progenitors in the spirit world, who never heard the sound of the gospel. You who are here in Zion have power to be baptized for and to redeem your dead. The resurrection and the coming of the Messiah are at the door. The signs of heaven and earth indicate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fig trees are putting forth their leaves in the eyes of every man who has the faith of the gospel. Let us therefore try and do our duty. Let us attend to the ordinances of the house of God and unite ourselves according to his law. For Jesus will never receive the Zion of God unless its people are united according to celestial law. For all who go into the presence of God have to go there by this law. Enoch had to practice this law, and we shall have to do the same if we are ever accepted of God as he was. It has been promised that the new Jerusalem will be built up in our day and generation, and it will have to be done by the united order of Zion and according to celestial law. And not only so, but we have to keep that law ourselves if we ever inherit that kingdom, for no man will receive a celestial glory unless he abides a celestial law. No man will receive a terrestrial glory unless he abides a terrestrial law. And no man will receive a telestial glory unless he abides a telestial law. There is a great difference between the light of the sun at noonday and the glimmer of the stars at night, but that difference is no greater than the difference of the glory in the several portions of the kingdom of God. I always have said and believed, and I believe today, that it will pay you and me and all the sons and all the daughters of Adam to abide the celestial law, for celestial glory is worth all we possess. If it calls for every dollar we own and our lives in the bargain, if we obtain an entrance into the celestial kingdom of God 
it will amply repay us. The Latter-day Saints have started out for celestial glory, and if we can only manage to be faithful enough to obtain an inheritance in the kingdom, where God and Christ dwell, we shall rejoice through the endless ages of eternity. I thank God that my ears have heard the sound of the gospel. I thank God that I have been preserved upon the earth to see the face of an elder of Israel, and to be called of God to administer the ordinances of his house. I traveled a good many miles with President Joseph Smith, as some of you did. I have also traveled a good many miles with President Young, and with the apostles and elders of Israel, and I have never seen the hour yet in the midst of our deepest afflictions and persecutions that I was sorry that I had embraced the gospel, and I hope I never shall. I pray God, my Heavenly Father, that He will inspire our hearts as Latter-day Saints, that we may become one, and not having the fear of man before our eyes, but the fear of God, that we may be ready to do whatever is required of us, and to carry out the counsels of the servants of God. When we do this, we shall be happy, and we shall be saved, whether in life or in death. I pray that we may pursue this course, that we may overcome the world, the flesh and the devil, and inherit eternal life. For Jesus' sake, amen. Conference adjourned until 2 o'clock p.m. The choir sang the anthem, I Will Extol Thee. Benediction by Elder F. D. Richards. Fourth day, Friday afternoon, October 9th. The choir sang, Hark the Song of Jubilee, Loud as Mighty Thunders Roar. Prayer by Elder B. Young, Jr. The choir sang, A Holy Angel from on High, The Joyful Message Has Made Known. President George A. Smith said the conference would be adjourned this afternoon until Sunday morning, and on Sunday afternoon would be adjourned until April 6, 1875. He said that there had been a remarkable unity in all our past conferences among the Latter-day Saints when holding up their hands to sustain the authorities, which was a prayer to Almighty God to sustain them in their duties. Elder George Q. Cannon presented the authorities of the Church of the Conference, all of whom were unanimously sustained by the vast assembly, as follows. Brigham Young, prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in all the world. George A. Smith and Daniel H. Wells, counselors to President Brigham Young. Lorenzo Snow, Brigham Young, Jr., Albert Carrington, John W. Young, and George Q. Cannon, assistant counselors to President Brigham Young. Orson Hyde, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and Orson Pratt, Sr., John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Charles C. Rich, Lorenzo Snow, Erastus Snow, Franklin D. Richards, George Q. Cannon, Brigham Young, Jr., Joseph F. Smith, and Albert Carrington, members of said quorum. John Smith, Patriarch of the Church. George B. Wallace, President of this stake of Zion, and William H. Folsom and John T. Kane, his counselors. William Eddington, Thomas E. Jeremy, John H. Rummel, Minor G. Atwood, Dimick B. Huntington, Theodore McKean, Hosea Stout, Milando Pratt, J. R. Winder, George J. Taylor, Henry Dinwoody, Millen Atwood, A. M. Cannon, Joseph Horn, Andrew W. Winberg, and George Nebaker, members of the High Council. Elder Cannon stated that the last four of the above-mentioned brethren would act as High Counselors when required to do so on account of the absence of other members. He also stated that a number of brethren presented and sustained as members of the High Council at the last conference, but whose names were not presented now, had been released because their business was such as to frequently compel their absence from the High Council when it was in session. Elias Smith, President of the High Priest Quorum, and Edward Snellgrove and Elias Morris, his counselors. Joseph Young, President of the first seven presidents of the 70s, and Levi W. Hancock, Henry Harriman, Albert P. Rockwood, Horace S. Eldridge, Jacob Gates, and John Van Cott, members of the first seven presidents of the 70s. E. W. Davis, President of the Elders Quorum. He would choose his own counselors. Edward Hunter, Presiding Bishop. Leonard W. Hardy and Robert T. Burton, his counselors. The conference was informed that Elder J. C. Little, formerly one of the counselors of Bishop Hunter, had tendered his resignation of that position, which had been accepted because the business of Elder Little required his almost constant absence from the city. Samuel G. Ladd, President of the Priest Quorum, William McLaughlin, and James Latham, his counselors. Adam Spears, President of the Teachers Quorum, Martin Lenzi and Henry I. Dorham as his counselors, James Leach, President of the Deacons Quorum, John H. Picknell and Thomas C. Jones his counselors, George A. Smith, Trustee and Trust for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and John Sharp, John L. Smith, LeGrand Young, 
Elijah F. Sheets, Joseph F. Smith, Moses Thatcher, John Van Cott, Amos M. Musser, James P. Fries, F. A. Mitchell, Thomas Taylor, as his assistants, Albert Carrington, President of the Perpetual Emigrating Fund for Gathering the Poor, Truman O. Angel, Architect for the Church, Orson Pratt, Historian and General Church Recorder, and Wilford Woodruff, his assistant. He also presented the officers of the United Order who were voted in at the last conference and were again sustained as follows. President of the United Order in all the world wherever established, Brigham Young. First Vice President, George A. Smith. Second Vice President, Daniel H. Wells. Assistant Vice Presidents, Orson Hyde, Orson Pratt Sr., John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Charles C. Rich, Lorenzo Snow, Erastus Snow, Franklin D. Richards, George Q. Cannon, Brigham Young, Jr., Joseph F. Smith, and Albert Carrington. Secretary, David McKenzie. Assistant Secretaries, George Goddard, D. O. Calder, P. A. Shetler, James Jack, and J. T. Kane. General Bookkeeper, T. W. Ellerbeck. Treasurer, G. A. Smith. Assistant Treasurer, Bishop E. Hunter. Board of Directors, H. S. Eldridge, John Sharp, Farrah Moores Little, Moses Thatcher, John Van Cott, James P. Fries, Henry Dinwiddie, Thomas Taylor, and E. F. Sheets. The following names were also presented, names of missionaries called since last conference who have gone to their fields of labor. Soren Jacobson, William B. Barton, Salt Lake City, David McKenzie, Salt Lake City, Dirk Bockholt, Salt Lake City, Joseph H. Perry, Salt Lake City, N. J. Nuttall, Provo, Jacob Zundel, Willard City, John Woodhouse, Lehigh, William Greenwood, American Fork, Henry Eyring, St. George, Verney L. Halliday, Pleasant Grove, Edward Hanham, Salt Lake City, Peter Barton, Kaysville. The following names of missionaries were called to Europe. J. J. Taylor, Salt Lake City, to the United States and Canada, Edwin Harley, Nephi, John Andrews, Nephi, David W. Norton, Nephi, Gilbert Belknap, Sr., Hooper City, George Rose, North Ogden, Thomas Grover, Farmington, Ammon Green, West Weber, David E. Fackerell, Bountiful, Samuel Anderson, Salt Lake City, H. Gorgonson, Huntsville, A. Iskren, Tuella City, James Barker, North Ogden, Simon S. Higginbottom, Ogden, Joseph Thatcher, Logan, Simpson Nolan, Hyde Park, Abel Gar, Millville, Alma Harris, Cache Valley, Thomas J. King, Kaysville, to Scandinavia, Soren Peterson, Huntsville, C. I. Gustafson, Salt Lake City, John Larson, Salt Lake City. Elder John Taylor said, when we were in conference assembled to talk over the general interests of the church, it became a matter of great moment to those thus engaged. We felt that we were acting for the welfare of ourselves, our families, our posterity, and our progenitors, and for the building up of the kingdom of God for those who had lived on the earth and who now lived in concert with the Almighty. Encompassed with weaknesses and infirmities, we stood all the more in need continually of the sustaining power, wisdom, and assistance of our Heavenly Father. We had been presenting the President and other authorities before the conference. How did we know that we needed those officers? God told us. We had been under the direction and guidance of the Almighty since the organization of the Church. The officers of the Church today were wanted for the selfsame purpose as they were formerly, viz. for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, etc., until we came to the unity of the faith, though there were many circumstances that indicated considerable union among us already, for instance, the raising of a great amount of means to assist the poor from the old countries, the sending of 500 teams to the Missouri River to bring them over the plains, and even the other evening, 300 men were reported as being ready to go down to St. George to work on the temple, a distance of over 300 miles. In all of which labors, a great amount of union is absolutely necessary to bring them about. We were engaged in a lifelong service to last th through time and all eternity, for the welfare of all who had lived, now live, or would yet live. We were now living in very peculiar times, and under the necessity of forming our associations with the view of uniting our interests together so as to bring them in strict conformity to law. 
After making a few more remarks in the united order, he closed by saying that we were heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Knowledge received by immediate revelation, cooperation in temporal affairs. The saints are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Discourse by Elder John Taylor, delivered at the semi-annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Friday afternoon, October 9, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. In our assemblies at conference, the representatives of the people from the various parts of the territory meet together to be informed in relation to any and all measures that may be determined upon for the furtherance of our interests as a people, and the interests of the Church and Kingdom of God upon the earth. For the Church and Kingdom of God is established upon the earth, and God has communicated unto us His will, and, by revelation, has instructed us how to organize the various orders of the priesthood as they have been presented before you today. I feel that we are acting in the presence of God and of the holy angels, and that we are operating for our own welfare, the welfare of our ancestors, and in part for the welfare of the millions who have lived upon the earth, and for the introduction of principles that have emanated from God, which are calculated to regenerate, evangelize, and redeem the world in which we live. There is something peculiar in the relationship that we sustain to each other, to those who have gone before us, to our God, and to the building up of his kingdom. We are not acting for ourselves individually, but in the interests and for the benefit of all men that have ever lived upon the earth, as well as those now living upon it. We are acting in conjunction with the Almighty, with apostles and prophets and men of God, who have lived in the various ages of the world, to accomplish the great program that God had in his mind in relation to the human family before the world existed, and which will as assuredly come to pass as God lives. We feel at the same time that we are encompassed with the infirmities, weaknesses, imperfections, and frailties of human nature, and in many instances we err in judgment, and we always need the sustaining hand of the Almighty, the guidance and direction of His Holy Spirit, and the counsel of His priesthood that we may be led and preserved in the path that leads to a life eternal, for it is the desire of all Latter-day Saints to keep the commandments of God, live their religion, honor their profession, and magnify their calling, and so prepare themselves for an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. We have had presented before us today the church authorities. This may seem to many of us a mere matter of form, but it is at the same time a matter of fact, and one in which we are individually and collectively interested. It presents to our minds a train of reasoning, ideas, thoughts, and reflections, which men generally do not experience. Here is a president and his council. Here are the twelve, the bishops, high priests, seventies, elders, and the various authorities and councils of the Church upon the earth, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What is that Church? Is it a phantom, a theory, an ideality, something that has been got up by the schools, by the wise men and philosophers of the day? No, it is something that emanates from God, that had its origin with Him. It is to Him that we are indebted for all the light, intelligence, and knowledge that we possess. How did we know that we needed a president? God told us. How did we know that we needed counselors? The Lord told us. How did we know that it was necessary that there should be a twelve in the church and kingdom of God? The Lord told us. How did we know that there should be quorums of seventies, high priests, elders, high councils, and all these various organizations? The Lord told us, and we have come together and passed upon these principles, and have united together in the commonwealth of Israel. And when we talk about this priesthood, as has been very properly remarked by one of the speakers during this conference, why, we of all of us belong more or less thereto. It is emphatically that which was spoken of in the days of Moses, a kingdom of priests. We are in reality a kingdom of priests, and we are in possession of principles that will endure throughout all eternity. We are associated with men who have lived before us, and who are connected with the same ministry and calling as we possess. And they are operating with us, and we with them, for the accomplishment of certain objects which God has in view. And who of us can point out the path wherein we should walk? Who of us can direct our steps in relation to the principles that lie before us? We need the guidance, instruction, intelligence, and revelation that flow from heaven to lead us. We have needed them to bring us thus far. When the Lord got angry with the children of Israel because of their follies, and said, I will not go up with you, but my spirit shall go with you. Moses might well plead and say, O oh God, if thou goest not up with us, carry us not up hence. He felt, What can we do? What course shall we pursue unless the Lord directs us? 
We, the Latter-day Saints, are in the same position. Unless the Lord guides us, we are in a poor fix. Now then, what were apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and other officers played in the church for in former days? Paul tells us that for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we are all come to a unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the fullness of the stature of the perfect man in Christ, that we be no more children tossed about with every wind of doctrine and the cunning craftiness whereby men lie in wait to deceive, that what we may grow up in him are living head in all things. What are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, etc., placed in the church now for? For precisely the same reasons as they were then. Only much more so, for they were connected with a system that had to succumb to the adversary and to be rooted out. A certain power was to rise up and was to prevail against them, but it is not so with us. Our course is onward. We are connected with that little stone that was hewn out of the mountain without hands, and that was to continue to roll until it filled the whole earth. That is the position that we occupy, and it is said that the kingdom shall not be given into the hands of another people. These several officers, we are told, are placed in the church for the perfecting of the saints. We need their labors. They are for the work of the ministry. We need a little of it. They are for the edifying of the body of Christ. We need edifying. How long? Until we all come into the unity of the faith, and until we are perfect in the knowledge of the Son of God. We are not quite there yet. There is a little faltering, shaking, tottering, and stumbling like babes among us once in a while, and we need the sustaining hand, the instruction of God to support us, and help us to pass along in the path marked out for us. He has led us along remarkably, and he has united us to a certain extent in many things. And there is something pleasant and delightful in union. We have done a good deal in being united. Here are many of the elders around me who have been ready, in any moment, to go anywhere, just as these elders who have been called today to go to the States, England, Scotland, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, or any other part of the earth, to preach the gospel, build up settlements, or whatever else they are required to do in order to further the purposes and to build up the kingdom of God upon the earth. I was very much pleased at a meeting we had the other evening in the tabernacle to learn that over 300 men could be found who would go down to St. George this winter, find their own food, and work as teamsters, carpenters, stone cutters, and in other callings necessary to forward the work on the temple. That shows there is something like union among the Latter-day Saints. I like to see principles of that kind operating among us. It shows that we possess a portion of the spirit of the work, and that we appreciate the gospel, and we have done a good deal of this kind of thing heretofore. Many of you remember what took place when we left Far West, when our people there had been robbed of everything that the thieves could get hold of. They put the balance of their means together to help one another out, until there was not a man left who wanted to leave the state. We agreed to do that, and we did it. Then afterwards, when we left Nauvoo, we covenanted in the temple that we built there that we would never cease our endeavors until every man who wanted to leave that country and come here had had the opportunity, and that we would assist him in doing so. Did we carry it out? We did, and we were united in our efforts, and we did a good many things besides that we promised to do. We have sent as many as 500 teams at a time from here with provisions and other necessaries to bring the poor from the frontiers to this land before the railroad was was in existence, and since then we have operated and cooperated with our means to bring them by the railroad. So far these things are good, honorable, and praiseworthy. Then again, we are a good deal united in our doctrinal affairs, and we begin to feel that we are part of God's creation, that we are operating in this particular day and age of the world to accomplish a certain work, And that work is not for our own individual interests alone. It is not to build up and aggrandize ourselves, but it is to build up the kingdom of God and to forward his purposes upon the earth. That is what we are here for. You might talk about principle to a great many men until your heads turn gray and your tongues cleave to the roofs of your mouths, and it would make no difference. They are not prepared to receive it. But the Latter-day Saints are to a very great extent. Why? because the very first thing that God did with us was to get us converted, to get us baptized and in a position where we could receive the Holy Ghost. And then we were placed in what some people call en rapport with God, brought into communication and relationship with Him, so that we could recognize Him as our Father and our friend. And we are His friends, and He and we, 
and others who have lived and died here on this earth, who obeyed the same principles that we have obeyed, are all operating together for the accomplishment of the purposes of God on the earth. That is what we are doing. It is a great work, and every one of us needs to ponder the path of our feet, to mark well the course that is laid out to us, and seek to do the will of our Heavenly Father. We are living in a critical and an important age. Men sometimes are astonished when they see the corruption, wickedness, and evil, the departure from honesty and integrity, and the villainy that everywhere exist. But why should they be? Have we not been preaching for the last thirty or forty years that the world would grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived? Has it not been preached to us that the nations of the earth had the elements of destruction within themselves and that they were bound to crumble? And when we see honor trampled underfoot and integrity and truth standing afar off, while the wicked, corrupt, and for froward manage and direct affairs, we may expect that the axe is laid at the root of the tree, and that it is decaying and will soon fall. And that is what is being accomplished among the nations today. We need not whine or think there is anything strange or remarkable about it. We have expected these things to transpire, and they will be a great, great deal worse than they are today. But we are engaged in introducing correct principles, and we are trying to get united. We are united, as I said before, in many things, for the religion that we have embraced in its spiritual signification brings us into communication one with another and helps us to love one another. And I wish there was a little more of that disposition among us, that we loved one another a little better and studied one another's interests a little more. I wish we could sympathize with our brethren and be full of loving kindness and generosity one towards another. I wish that we could feel that brotherly love continued and that it was spreading and increasing flowing from the fountain of life, from God, from heart to heart, as oil is poured from vessel to vessel, that harmony, sympathy, kindness, and love might be universal among us. That is what the gospel will do for us if we will only let it. Said Jesus, when speaking to the woman of Samaria, If thou hadst asked of me, I would have given thee water, that thou should have been in thee a well springing up to everlasting life. Let us drink a little more deeply of our religion. It leads to God. It opens up a communication between us and our Father, whereby we are enabled to cry, Abba, Father. The principles of the gospel that we have embraced reach into eternity. They penetrate behind the veil where Christ, our forerunner, has gone. If we are living our religion and keeping the commandments of God, and wherever the influence of this gospel is exerted, it binds people together, and at the same time unites them with their God who rules in heaven, and with Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and with the heavenly throng and their minds are illuminated until, like the vision of Jacob's ladder, they can see the angels of God ascending and descending, carrying messages to and from God and his people. Said Jesus about the last thing when he was leaving the earth, Father, I pray for those whom thou hast given me, and not for these only, but for all those who believe in me, or through their word, that they may be one, even as I and the Father are one, that they may be one in us. One in sentiment, feeling, desire and action for the accomplishment of the purposes of God, whether in the heavens or upon the earth. Can we conceive of these things? We have little glimpses in relation to them sometimes, by which we are enabled to form a very faint idea of the effect of that unity which exists in heaven, and of the unity that ought to exist on earth. What can bring this latter about? Some speculative theory? No, we want, in the first place, to have our hearts united to God, we want to have the Spirit of God planted in our bosoms. We want to have the power of the gospel in our households. We want a union with each other there, and a union with our God, and every one of us to feel as one felt formerly, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As a starting point, we each of us must feel, no matter what others do, I and my house will fear God, keep His commandments, and do that which is right in His sight and in the sight of holy angels. And what then? Why, we will do everything else that God wants us. If it is to build temples, yes. Is it profitable? God knows best about that. If it does not make much money, it brings something in the heart and that the world cannot give and that men cannot take away. It gives peace and joy and satisfaction. And you feel, I am the household of faith. I am a child of God. I am carrying out the will of my Father. And they who have lived and we who now live are operating together for the redemption of the living and the dead, for the regeneration of the world, for the carrying out of the purposes of the great Elohim, for the introduction of principles that will ennoble and exalt man and enable him to stand in the dignity of his office, calling 
and priesthood and as a priest of the Most High God. That is the position that we occupy and that is what we are after. It is no little boy's play that we are engaged in. It is a lifelong service and that life will last while eternity endures. We want to operate here all the time so that we may have our own approving conscience and that we may have the approval of all good, honorable men, that we may have the sanction and approval of God and of all the holy angels and of the priesthood who have lived before, that we may feel that we are operating for the general benefit of the world that was, that is, or is to come. We are called upon once in a while to take a new step in this great work. At one time it was polygamy. At another it was baptism for the dead. Then it was building temples. Then certain endowments. Then the sealing of our children to us. Then certain promises made to ourselves, such as God made to Abraham in former times. And now it is that we must get a little closer together, and be more united in regard to our temporal affairs, that we may be prepared to act and to operate in all things according to the mind and will of God, and this step in advance, like every other, has caused us to reflect and ponder. And many of us are full of fears and doubts in relation to many things and many men. Well, have we all done right? No. Have we all been strictly honest? No. Have we all lived our religion? No. Have we all been upright in our dealings one with another and done that which is right in the sight of God? No, we have not. What then? Shall we continue to do wrong? We are called upon, in this as in many other things, to take a new step that is contrary to our traditions, ideas, and theories, but not contrary to the doctrines that have been taught to the Latter-day Saints. But we hardly know sometimes how to get at these things, how to fix them up, how to put them right. We have been trying since God moved upon his servant Brigham to get things into order, but the ship moves very slowly, and there seems to be a good many snags of one kind or another in this way. Many people are very much misinformed in relation to many of these things. There have been a good many things said, and a great many ideas in circulation about the order of things that it is desired should be established among us. I will tell you some of the ideas in relation thereto. In the first place, it has been a matter of fact with me for years and years that such a state of things has to be introduced among us. I think that is an opinion which prevails very generally among the Latter-day Saints, and I do not think there is much difference in opinion in relation to it. We have read about it in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants. I think there are as many as a dozen revelations in that book in reference to this subject, and perhaps more than that. I do not propose to quote them, however, at the present time. We read an account of the city of Enoch, which was established on this principle, and how the people acted there. There is also an account of the people who formerly lived on this continent, who carried out the same principle. And when this church was first organized by Joseph Smith, these very principles were among the first that he introduced to the people. And we have had them before us all this time, so that we have no need to begin and argue the points at all. But I want to come right to matters of fact as they exist among us here today. Many will say, I do not like the thing as it now is. I wish we had it as it was laid down in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants. No, you don't. Well, we think we do. Well, but you don't. I'm sure you don't. And I will show you why before I get through. We are living in peculiar times. We cannot be governed by thus saith the Lord, independent of other influences. We are associated with national and judicial affairs that are opposed to every principle that God would reveal or will reveal. That is a fact that I need not argue before the Latter-day Saints. They all know it. Well, what then? The Spirit of the Lord has operated upon President Young to introduce these principles in our midst. That is, as near as they can be to conform to the laws of the land. For the people in these United States profess to be so pure, you know, that they could not think of having anything contrary to law. They would never dream of anything of that kind. Why, the people of the United States, including their presidents, governors, and rulers, are the most law-abiding people you ever heard of, according to their professions, are they not? They cannot think of doing anything contrary to law. Well, we have to go with the general stream, or at least it is necessary that we protect ourselves from legal cormorants, and from every man who would devour, tear in pieces, and destroy, who is after our property and our lives. This class of persons would be very glad to take not only the property, but the lives of some of the leaders of God's people here on the earth, Nothing would suit them better. They are so holy, pure, and law-abiding. These are the circumstances that we are placed in. Now what shall be done? There are certain principles that emanate from God, but we have to protect ourselves in carrying them out and make them conform as near as we can to the laws of the land. 
In the Book of Doctrine and Covenants it is said, in the first place, that a man shall place his property at the feet of the bishop. That is what that lays down, and you say, that is what you would like to do. Some would, very many would not. The bishop, after examining into the position and circumstances of the man, and finding out what his wants are, and what his capabilities and talents, what the size of his family, etc., appoints to him a certain amount of means, which he receives as a stewardship. Well, say some, how does this order you are talking about introducing agree with that? Where does the stewardship come in? I will tell you. We have organized this as far as may be on the principles of cooperation, and the voice you have in selecting your officers and in voting for them and the stock you hold in these institutions is your stewardship. You may say, is that not taking away our freedom? I do not think it is. I am not prepared to enter into details, but I should say that one-third, perhaps a half, of the wealth of the world is manipulated just in the same way. How so? Why, there are among the nations national securities of various kinds issued, which are taken by the people. We have the United States bonds, state bonds, county and city bonds in this country as well as in Europe, to which the people subscribe and in which they have an interest, all of which is voluntary, and the free act of the people. Then we have railroad bonds, steamship bonds, and we have telegraph, mercantile, manufacturing, and cooperative associations which are represented by those who hold stock therein, and there are hundreds and thousands of millions of dollars throughout the world that are operated in this way by financiers, statesmen, men of intelligence, merchants, capitalists, and others, in every grade and condition in life, none of whom consider that there is any coercion associated with it. These men all have their free agency. What is the modus operandi? For illustration, a company is organized. Men subscribe stock into that company, or they purchase bonds, perhaps from a government, for which that government pays interest. Or, if it is in a company, that company manipulates and arranges matters, not the stockholders individually. They never think of it. They select the officers to do these things for them, and all they have to do with it is to vote in these officers, each person voting according to the amount of stock he holds in the institution, and then they draw their dividends at certain speci specified times. That is the way, I presume, that one half or perhaps three quarters of the wealth of a civilized world is manipulated today. Well, is freedom taken from these men? Are the men engaged in these operations thieves and robbers? Some of them act very fraudulently, it is true, and the amount of defalcation and fraud in our country of late is painful to reflect upon. But then they consider that they have a perfect right or bought to buy or to sell any of this stock, and if parties enter into institutions of any kind, mercantile or manufacturing, they must be subject to the rules or laws thereof. But the stockholders do not individually operate these institutions, and what I wanted to say is that herein we, as they, have our stewardship and freedom of action. Well, but you want to manipulate men's time as well. Yes. Will they have a vote? They ought to have, and will have if the law will let them. And the great trouble is that the law will not allow us to do everything we would like. But wherever we can get at it, we shall vote on these things, as you have voted here today. But we have to evade these things a little now, because the law will not allow us to do otherwise. Now then, there is another feature connected with this matter. You know that, in this order, is not all putting in. There is some taking out, and that is the point I want to get at. It would be a very nice and beautiful thing if we could carry it out, if, as described in the Revelation, we could have a general treasury from which we could all draw what we needed and then return it, together with our tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands, and all act as one family for the general interest of all. It would be a very beautiful thing. But everybody is not so honest, pure, and upright as the state of things demands. If we had a general treasury, some would be very willing to go to the treasurer and request so much to enable them, as they would represent to carry out their stewardship, and he would have to hand it out to them according to the provisions made in the Doctrine and Covenants. But that would in all probability be the last of it with many. Would you businessmen like to have a system like that in the United Order? You say you would like this order carried out, as it is laid down in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, but I say you would not. Would you like every man, simply because he was a member of the Order, to have power to go to the treasurer and draw out what he thought proper and use it just according to his fancy? No, you would not. You could not, and you would not trust your neighbors as far as that. For all men are not capable, and all men are not honest and conscientious. 
If they were, we should be nearly ready to be caught up, but we have not reached that point yet, and consequently, we have to do the best we can. Now, I will tell you in my opinion. I am living in the 14th ward. We, in that ward, have selected a number of men for our directors, and I would just as soon trust these men with the management of my property as to manage it myself. I do not believe that every man is a thief, scallywag, and rascal. I have no such idea. I think there is a great deal of honesty, truthfulness, and integrity, and if there is not, it is time we turned over a new leaf and introduced better principles, that we may be governed by purer, nobler laws. I cannot conceive of anything more beautiful and heavenly than a united brotherhood, organized after the pattern laid down in the Doctrine and Covenants, when all act for the benefit of all, when, while we love God with all our hearts, we love our neighbors as ourselves where our time, property, our talents, our mental and bodily powers are all exerted for the good of all, where no man grabs or takes advantage of another, where there is common interest, a common purse, a common stock, where, as they did on this continent, it is said of them that they all dealt justly to each other, and all acted for the general weal, when every man in place could meet a brother and a friend, when all the generous and benevolent influences and sympathies of our nature are carried out, and covetousness, arrogance, hatred, and pride, and every evil are subdued and brought into subjection to the will of the Spirit of God. These principles are very beautiful and would be very happifying for a community, a territory, a state, nation, or the world. Now then, these things are presented before us, and I suppose we shall have to come into them as best we can, and if we ever get into the celestial kingdom of God, we shall find that they are just such a set of people. If ever we build up a Zion here on this continent, and in case Zion ever comes down to us, and we expect it will, or that ours will go up to meet it, we have got to be governed by the same principles that they are governed by, or we cannot be one. And if we ever get into the eternal worlds, and we shall have to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and it would not do for a man of us to go up into heaven and say, Look here, Jesus, or look here, some of you great men who manage matters here. I wish you would set me off a place by myself. I would like to have my own house and garden, and my own farming arrangements separate to myself, so that I could manage these things a little in my own way, as I used to, in the place I come from. Well, says the individual addressed, I do not see things exactly in that way. We brought you up here, believing that you were a pretty decent fellow but you have got to conform to our rules. These things are all ours. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. This is a joint association. We are united together in one thing. We are all one, and if you want to go off by yourself, you will have to leave here. That would be just about the position of things. This is the order that exists there. They are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. This is the position we have to attain to, and to do this there we will have to be less individuality of feeling than there is now, and we must seek to introduce and establish the principles of the kingdom of God upon the earth. We are not for ourselves, but for the kingdom of God. God called us not to do our own will, but His, and we are operating to prepare ourselves and our children, and all who will be governed by the principles of truth for a celestial and eternal glory in the kingdom of our God. Well then, says one, you believe in these things? I do, most assuredly. Do you believe in the authorities? Yes, I think I do. I have voted for them a great many years, and by the help of God I mean to sustain them still. That is my feeling. Brethren, is it yours? Shall we sustain the elders of Israel, the presidency, and the authorities of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Shall we do it, ye Latter-day Saints? The congregation answered, Yes. All who feel like it say, I, by the congregation. Now let us go and carry it out. Amen. Conference was adjourned till Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. The choir sang, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Benediction by Elder John Sharp. Fifth day, Sunday morning, October 11. The choir sang, Mortals awake with angels join and chant the solemn lay. Prayer by Bishop Thomas Callister. The choir sang, With joy we own thy servants, Lord, thy ministers below. Elder Orson Pratt spoke upon the ninth to 14th verses of the 7th chapter of Daniel, also St. John's Revelation, 20th chapter. All Bible believers were looking forward to the time when mankind would appear before God for judgment, and it would appear that the deeds of the human family are recorded and kept in books. But how many, and in what way these records were kept behind the veil was not known. 
We read in the Book of Mormon, which was just as sacred as the Bible, that Jesus said about 1800 years ago that the Father kept an account of all the deeds of the children of men. One saying declared that the saints should judge the world. Another said that the twelve apostles should judge the tribes of Israel. Another quorum was also spoken of in the Book of Mormon as acting judges. So it appeared there was quite a number of quorums selected to sit as judges under the inspiration of the Almighty when the final judgment took place, which must be done in equity and righteousness. In another passage we were told that there were certain angels who would have judgments passed upon them by the saints of God. Every thought, word, or deed would be subject to judgment, and judges appointed for different ages of the world, so that judgment might be passed in a reasonably short space of time. He then referred to a time of judgment prior to the resurrection where the wicked would be cast out into outer darkness, and the righteous would go into paradise. Those angels who kept not their first estate, who fell from the presence of the Almighty, were reserved until the final judgment of the great day when the saints, endowed with the authority of the holy priesthood, would sit in judgment upon them and assign to them their final doom. He then spoke of the Ancient of Days, before whose presence stood ten thousand times ten thousand, making one hundred million. He would come as a great judge in flaming fire to set in order the entire range of the priesthood, from the earliest to the latest period of time. This ancient personage was no other, according to the great modern prophet Joseph, than our father Adam, and he delivered up the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom to Jesus Christ. And the place where this great conference would be held would be Adam on Diamond, being about fifty or sixty miles north of Jackson County, Missouri, where Adam rose up and gave his final blessing upon his posterity, and they in turn blessed him. On that very spot was where the Ancient of Days would sit enthroned in power and glory, and before him ten thousand times ten thousand would stand and minister unto him, and all the former day saints and latter day saints would receive their appropriate places according to the priesthood they held, and honored in their probation. He also referred to the benefits and blessings that would accrue to those who had been duly and legitimately married according to the celestial order of marriage, and contrasted the disappointment of those who had only been joined together by a justice of the peace. All men to be judged out of the books. Adam, the Ancient of Days. In the days of Enoch, the righteous gathered together from the ends of the earth to one place. The great prophet Joseph Smith raised up by God to reveal hidden mysteries. Discourse by Elder Orson Pratt, delivered at the adjourned semi-annual ch conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Sunday morning, October 11, 1874, reported by David W. Evans. The speaker took as a foundation for his remarks the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th verses of the 7th chapter of the Prophecies of Daniel and the 20th chapter of the Revelation of St. John. All Bible believers are looking forward to the time when the inhabitants of this creation shall be brought into judgment and be judged out of the books which are written, every man according to his works. We should rather conclude from these sayings in Daniel and in the Revelation of St. John that there is a record, or perhaps many records, kept of the works of men, their deeds done in this probation. However, these records are kept in heaven is not for me to say. What language they are recorded in, or what are the symbols of the ideas of the heavenly hosts who are engaged in the recording, how many records there are, etc., is not known to us. But from what is written, we can form some conclusions in relation to this matter, for we are told in the sayings of Jesus in the New Testament that for every idle word and every idle thought, men shall give an account in the great judgment day. Hence these words and thoughts must be had in remembrance either in books or impressed upon the minds of beings who are capable of retaining all things in their remembrance. There must be some way by which the idle words and thoughts of the children of men shall be kept in remembrance, and if the dead are to be judged out of the books that are to be opened, we should naturally draw the conclusion that they are memorandum books of the idle words and thoughts of the children of men. We also read in the Book of Mormon a record which all the Latter-day Saints profess to believe in, and consider equally sacred with the rest of the Word of God that is recorded in the Bible and elsewhere, the sayings of Jesus that were spoken on this continent some 1800 years ago. Jesus says, All things are written by the Father. I suppose by his agents, that is through his direction, by his authority. All things are written by the Father. Taking all these passages of Scripture together, we may look for a general reckoning with all the inhabitants of the earth, both the righteous and the wicked. How long this day, called the Day of Judgment, will be, is not revealed. 
it may be vastly longer than what many suppose. It seems to me that unless there were a great number engaged in judging the dead, it would require a very long period of time, for for one being to personally investigate all the idle thoughts and words of the children of men from the days of Adam down until that time, it would require a great many millions of years. And therefore I come to another conclusion, namely, that God has his agents, and that through those agents the dead will be judged. This reminds me of what was said by the Apostle Paul when reproving the ancient Christians for going to law one with another. He tries to shame them out of this evil practice by referring them to the lowest esteemed among them that were called saints. Says he, in substance, let them be your judges. It is not necessary for you to go to the highest authorities, but let even those who are least among you become judges in regard to many of these things that you now take before unbelievers, and for which you require a judgment from those who have nothing to do with the saints of God, or rather with the gospel in which they believed. And in connection with these sayings he asked this question, Know ye not that the saints shall judge the world? This reminds me of some sayings that are recorded in the Book of Mormon, as also others contained in the Bible. Jesus said to his twelve disciples or apostles, You that have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall come sitting upon the throne of his glory, then you shall also sit upon the twelve thrones, and shall eat and drink in my presence, and shall judge the twelve tribes of Israel. It seems, then, that there are certain personages to be engaged in judging the world. The twelve apostles are to judge the twelve tribes of Israel, and the saints will be set to judge the world. The Book of Mormon, speaking on the same subject, informs us that there are twelve chosen among the ancient Nephites on the American land, and that while the twelve chosen by Jesus on the continent of Asia were to judge the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve chosen among the Nephites should judge the remnant of the house of Israel that dwelt on this land. Here, then, is another quorum of judgment, another council that is appointed to judge, and so we might continue the subject and bring in all the counsels that God has ordained in any generation of those whom he has appointed and selected and ordained with power and authority from on high. To them was granted not only the privilege of acting here in relation to the ordinances of mercy, but hereafter in relation to the ordinances of justice. Hence both justice and mercy were committed in some measure into the hands of those who were ordained of the Lord. But in these respects there is one thing to console the saints of all ages, as well as to console the whole world, and that is, when the final time shall come to judge the children of men, whoever the agents may be who shall sit in judgment upon their several cases, they will do it by the inspiration of the Almighty, and hence it will be done right. This reminds me of what Jesus said to the twelve who were chosen among the Israelites on this continent eighteen hundred years ago. Said he, Know ye not that ye shall be judges of this people? What manner of persons therefore ought ye to be, in all holiness and purity and uprightness in heart, if you are to judge this great nation? In other words, if you are to sit in judgment upon all of their deeds done in the body and to render a righteous decision before the Almighty, how pure, holy, upright, and honest you twelve disciples ought to be, in order to become judges indeed of the people, that in judging them you may not condemn yourselves. Having quoted these passages which give us a little understanding of the purposes of the Almighty in regard to judging the world, I now quote another passage of scripture that has a bearing in some measure upon this subject, showing that it was a principle understood by the ancient saints of God, and that the eternal judgment was to be administered by the saints at some future time, was numbered among the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. It was not one of the hidden mysteries, one of those secret things, one of those wonders that were to be searched out by the faithful, but it was a doctrine numbered among the first principles of the oracles of God. I will now, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ according to King James' translation, quote from another translation which I have seen, and which I believe to be more correct. The passage to which I will direct your attention reads, Therefore, not leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, and of the doctrine of baptisms, and of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. These principles of the doctrine of Christ were thoroughly understood by the faithful ones who lived 1800 years ago. They understood that the day would come when God would set them not only to judge the world, but to judge angels. Some angels have got yet to be judged, and the saints will be the agents to perform this great work and render the decision of judgment. 
Jesus said to the twelve among the ancient Nephites, Know ye this, that your judgment, speaking of the judging of the Nephite nation, shall be that judgment which the Father shall give unto you. In other words, you shall not judge by your own natural wisdom, you shall not judge according to the outward appearance, but it shall be that judgment which the Father shall give unto you. Now the Lord judges mankind according to the law and the testimony. The revealed law is delivered to the people, and to those to whom it is revealed will be judged by that law. Hence Jesus says, My words shall judge you at the last day. It is not the tradition of the children of men that is going to judge the world. That is not the law. The traditions of the children of men are one thing, and the law is another thing. Popular ideas are one thing, and the law of God is another thing. We are not to be judged by the creeds, doctrines, disciplines, and articles of faith invented by uninspired men, but by the pure law of God as it is issued forth from his own mouth, and by the mouths of his ancient prophets and apostles. The testimonies will be forthcoming, one of which will be the record, the books that are written, every idle word that is spoken, every idle thought that has ever entered into the hearts of man will be written and brought up, and out of that record of our conduct, our thoughts, words, and deeds, we will be judged. Now, if there is to be a vast number of individuals engaged in the work of judgment, it may be a speedy work. For let all mankind be classified, a certain portion delivered over to the apostles of ancient days, another portion to the twelve chosen from among the ancient Nephites, another portion delivered over to the saints who lived in the first ages of the world, another portion to the saints who lived after the flood, and another portion to the Latter-day Saints, and let all be engaged in this work of judging the human family, and the work can speedily be accomplished. It may require years. It may be accomplished perhaps in less than one year. That is a matter that we cannot decide upon now. There is to be, however, a prior judgment to the final judgment day, and we will speak upon that a while. There is a certain degree of judgment rendered upon every man and every woman as soon as they have passed the ordeals of this present probation. When they lay their bodies down, their spirits return into the presence of God, when a decree of judgment and sentence is immediately passed. Hence we read in the Book of Mormon that the spirits of all men, as soon as they depart from this mortal body, return home again to that God who gave them life. And then shall it come to pass that the spirits of the righteous shall enter into a state of rest, peace, and happiness, called paradise, where they shall rest from all their labors. And then shall it come to pass that the spirits of the wicked, for behold, they have no part or portion of the Spirit of the Lord, shall depart into outer darkness, where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And in these two states or conditions the children of men shall be placed until the time of the resurrection. Then again there will be a judgment after the resurrection that will not be the final judgment, that is the judgment of the twelve tribes of Israel, spoken of by our Savior, which will take place when he and the twelve return again to the earth. That judgment will be exercised more directly on the whole house of Israel, and that have loved the Lord and kept his commandments. Here, then, are the various times of judgment, the various conditions and circumstances of the children of men in the spiritual state, judged before the resurrection, assigned to happiness or misery as the case may be, and in the judgment of the first resurrection, certain rewards, glory, power, exaltation, happiness, and eternal life will be conferred upon the righteous. But another sentence of judgment will be pronounced upon those who are not favored with coming forth on the morning of the first resurrection, namely those who have disobeyed the gospel. To all such the voice of the angel will be, Let sinners stay and sleep until I call again. Their sins have been sufficiently judged beforehand, that they are not counted worthy of a resurrection among the just and the righteous ones of the earth. This agrees with another passage recorded in the Book of Covenants, that at the sound of the third trump, then come the spirits of men that are under condemnation. These are the rest of the dead, and they live not again until the thousand years are ended, neither again until the end of the earth. Why? Because a certain measure of judgment is pronounced upon them even then. Now then, let us go to the angels which the saints are to judge. We find that the angels who kept not their first estate are reserved in chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day. Those angels that fell from before the presence of God were judged in a measure upon their fall, and were cast out to wander to and fro upon the face of this earth, bound as it were with chains of darkness, misery, and wretchedness, and this condition is to continue during the whole of the temporal existence of this earth, until the final judgment of the great day, when the saints, in the authority and power of the priesthood which God Almighty has conferred upon them, will arise and judge these fallen angels and they will receive the condemnation of which they are worthy. 
Having made these few preliminary remarks in regard to the judgment of the children of men, let us now refer again to the passage contained in the seventh chapter of Daniel. Says that ancient prophet, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, that the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set, and the books were opened. How many are ten thousand times ten thousand? One hundred million. That would be a larger congregation than you or I ever saw, and larger probably than any congregation that has ever been collected together upon this earth at any one time. They would occupy a vast region of country, even for a foothold. A hundred million people stood before this personage, the Ancient of Days. Who was this personage called the Ancient of Days? We are told by the prophet Joseph Smith, the great prophet of the last days, whom God raised up by his own voice and by the ministration of angels to introduce the great and last dispensation of the fullness of times, the last dispensation on the earth so far as the proclamation of mercy is concerned. I say we are told by this prophet that the Ancient of Days is the most ancient personage that ever had an existence in days here on the earth. And who was he? Why, of course, old father Adam. He was the most ancient man that ever lived in days that we have any knowledge of. He comes then as a great judge to assemble this innumerable host of which Daniel speaks. He comes in flaming fire. The glory and blessing and greatness of this personage it would be impossible even for a man as great as Daniel fully to describe. He comes as a man inspired from the eternal throne of Jehovah himself. He comes to set in order the councils of the priesthood pertaining to all dispensations, to arrange the priesthood and councils of the saints in all former dispensations in one grand family and household. What is all this for? Why all this arrangement? Why all this organization? Why all this judgment and the opening of the books? It is to prepare the way for another august personage whom Daniel saw coming with the clouds of heaven, namely, the Son of Man. And these clouds of heaven brought the Son of Man near before the Ancient of Days. And when the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, behold, a kingdom was given to the Son of Man, and greatness and glory, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, and his kingdom should be an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that should never be done away. This explains the reason why our father Adam comes as the Ancient of Days with all these numerous hosts, and organizes them according to the records of the book, every man in his place, preparatory to the coming of the Son of Man to receive the kingdom. Then every family that is in the order of the priesthood, and every man and every woman and every son or daughter, whatever their kindred, descent, or priesthood, will know their place. Where will this great conference take place? The Lord has revealed this also. The Lord did not raise up this boy, Joseph, for nothing, or merely to reveal a few of the first principles of the gospel of Christ. But he raised him up to reveal the hidden mysterious things, the wonders of the eternal worlds, the wonders of the dispensation of the fullness of times, those wonders that took place before the foundation of the world, and all things, so far as it is wisdom in God, were unfolded by this personage called by his enemies, Old Joe Smith, who was about fourteen years old when the Lord raised him up. I say that he, by the power of the Holy Ghost and the spirit of revelation, revealed the very place where this great assemblage of ten thousand times ten thousand of the righteous shall be gathered together. When the books are opened, it will be on one of the last places of residence of our father Adam here on the earth, and it is called by revelation Adam on Diamon, which, being interpreted, means the valley of God where Adam dwelt, and words belonging to the language which was spoken by the children of men before the confusion took place at Babel. In that valley, Adam called together Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalaleel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, and all the high priests and righteous of his descendants for some seven or eight generations. Three years before his death he there stood up, being bowed with age, and preached to that vast assembly of people, and pronounced upon them his great and last patriarchal blessing. And they rose up by the authority and power and revelation of the holy priesthood which they held, and pronounced their blessing upon the great common progenitor Adam. And he was called the Prince of Peace, and the Father of many nations. And it was said that he should stand at the head of and rule over his people 
of all generations, notwithstanding he was so aged. That was the blessing pronounced, three years before his death, upon the great head, patriarch and prophet of this creation, the man whom God chose to begin the works of this creation, in other words, to begin the peopling of this earth. Where was that valley in which that grand patriarchal gathering was held? It was about fifty, sixty, or seventy miles north of Jackson County, Missouri, where the Zion of the latter days will be built, where the Garden of Eden was, if not fully revealed, where Adam ate the forbidden fruit is not revealed as far as I know, that is, the particular location on the earth, no revelation informs us where he passed the first few centuries of his life, but suffice it to say that, when Adam was about six or seven hundred years old, there was a great gathering of the people. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, who lived contemporary with his old ancestor, and others who were called by him, went forth and gathered out the righteous from the nations, and as there was no Atlantic Ocean in those days rolling between the eastern and western continents, they could gather together by land from Asia, Africa, and Europe. In those days the earth was not divided as it was after the flood, in the days of Peleg. In that gathering many came from the ends of the earth. Adam might have been among the emigrating companies. If not, then he most probably had his residence at that central place of gathering. Let this be as it may, it is not revealed. There is a place, however, where this great conference took place in ancient times where the Lord revealed himself to that vast assembly, and stood in their midst, and instructed them with his own mouth, and they saw his face. There is the place where it was ordained that Adam should have the power, as the Ancient of Days, after a certain period and dispensations had rolled away, to come in his glory accompanied by the ancient saints, the generations that should live after him, and should take up their abode upon that land where they received their last blessing, there in the valley of Adam and Iamen. This man will sit upon his throne, and ten thousand times ten thousand immortal beings, his children, will stand before him, with all their different grades of priesthood, according to the order which God has appointed and ordained. Then every quorum of the priesthood in this Latter-day Saint church will find its place, and never until then. If we go behind the veil, we will not see this perfect organization of the saints of all generations until that period shall arrive. That will be before Jesus comes in his glory. Then we will find that there is a place for the first presidency of this church, for the twelve apostles, called in this dispensation, for the twelve disciples that were called among the remnants of Joseph on this land in ancient times, for the twelve that were called among the ten tribes of Israel in the north country, for the twelve that were called in Palestine, who administered in the presence of our Savior, all the various quorums and councils of the priesthood in every dispensation that has transpired since the days of Adam until the present time, will find their places according to the callings, gifts, blessings, ordination, and keys of the priesthood which the Lord Almighty has conferred upon them in their several generations. This, then, will be one of the grandest meetings that has ever transpired upon the face of our globe. What manner of persons ought you and I, my brethren and sisters, and all the people of God in the latter days to be, that we may be counted worthy to participate in the august assemblies that are to come from the eternal worlds? whose bodies have burst the tomb, and come forth immortalized and eternal in their nature. It will be found then who it is who have received ordinances by divine authority, and who have received ordinances by the precepts and authority of men. It will then be known who have been joined together in celestial marriage by divine authority, and who by wicked counsels and by justices of the peace who did not believe in God at the time that they did it, or those who have been married merely until death shall part them. It will then be known that those who have received the ordinances of marriage according to divine appointment are married for all eternity. It will then be known that their children are the legal heirs to the inheritances and glories and powers and keys and priesthood of their fathers throughout the eternal generations that are to come. And every man will have his family gathered around him which have been given unto him by the sealing of the everlasting priesthood and the order and law which God has ordained and none other. Amen. Elder C. C. Rich was much pleased and instructed with what he had listened to during conference, especially during that morning. We were engaged in a great and glorious work, and could accomplish a work not only for ourselves, but for those who had passed behind the veil. And should any of us neglect the labor binding on us in their behalf, we should certainly feel under condemnation when we met them behind the veil. 
we should also remember that the priesthood upon the earth had a right to direct us in our temporal as well as our spiritual labor, and the more closely we adhered to our counsel, the better it would be for us, for we could look forward with satisfaction and without fear to the day of judgment, about which we had heard so much this morning. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, so was President B. Young, and the gospel that each of them taught was nothing but the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we applied the principle of that gospel in our lives, they would save us from every evil. This was exactly what we needed, viz., a present as well as eternal salvation, and if each one was actuated and governed by those principles, the millennium would certainly have commenced. But trials being essential to our growth, let us humbly strive to overcome them and to be worthy of that exaltation and blessing that had been so encouragingly presented before us this morning. Guard against temptation. Those who trust in God will not be disappointed. Joseph Smith, a prophet of God, if there was no cause creating evil, there would be no evil works. Discourse by Elder Charles C. Rich, delivered in the adjourned semi annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Sunday, October 11, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. I have rejoiced in listening to the instructions that we have received this morning, as well as during the whole of this conference. It seems to me that they ought to make an everlasting impression upon the minds of the saints, that we, one and all, should be determined under the influence thereof to live more faithfully and to keep the commandments of God as near as possible in all things. I have no doubt that this is the feeling at the present time of most of those who have attended this conference. It is for us to guard against temptation that may be presented before us, and when we leave this place that we suffer not ourselves to do or to say anything that is wrong, but be willing, with an eye single to the glory of God, to carry out the counsels of his servants, and to perform all labors required at our hands in aiding to advance his cause, and to build up his kingdom upon the earth, that we may prepare ourselves for that which is to come both on the earth and in the eternal worlds. I know very well that there is no being upon the earth who is thus engaged but what feels well, all such rejoice in their labors, and the spirit and power of God will rest upon the saints when they take this course and adopt this policy. We have been permitted to live in one of the most auspicious times or dispensations that has ever been ushered in upon the earth, the dispensation of the gathering together of all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. We may feel our weakness and inability, but it is not our strength or wisdom that is to bring about the triumph or the purposes of God upon the earth. We are simply co-workers with our Heavenly Father, and His power will bear off His saints in the future, as it has done in the past and up to the present time. It is upon His arm that we have to lean, and in Him we must put our trust. When has there been a time when the saints have trusted in God and been disappointed? Never, inasmuch as we have done our part, the Almighty has never failed to do His, and fulfill His promises. We have the power to carry on this work and to perfect ourselves, and also to perform a labor for our benefit, and for the benefit of our friends who lived before us, who did not have such an opportunity as we have. This should be impressed upon our minds, and we should not suffer ourselves to neglect any duty that is incumbent upon us, whether for our benefit or for the benefit of those who have lived before us. When we pass behind the veil and meet with our friends, if we can tell them that, while we were in the flesh, we attended to and performed certain ordinances and ceremonies in their behalf, which they, while here, had not the privilege of attending to and performing for themselves, and which they had not power to accomplish in the spirit world, it certainly will be a matter of rejoicing to us and also to them. But if, on meeting them there, we have to admit that we neglected to do that for their benefit, which it had been in our power to attend to, we shall not feel pleasant, and our friends will most assuredly be disappointed. In speaking of the temples now in course of erection in which to perform the ordinances for the dead, our hearts ought to be inspired with determinations to do all we can to push them forward to completion, that in our day, while we yet live in the flesh, we may have the privilege of doing a work therein for our dead friends as well as for ourselves. All these things are before us, and our eyes should be single to the glory of God, and our hearts set upon building up his kingdom upon the earth, and not upon objects that do not tend in this direction. I have felt for many years that it was not safe in any place or upon any errand, and had no business to be engaged in any labor, no matter what it might be, unless that business, errand, or labor was directed by the priesthood. And I feel today that all the labors and operations of the Latter-day Saints, temporal and spiritual, 
ought to be organized and directed by the priesthood which God has established to lead his people. If our labors are thus directed, they will tell in the right direction for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God, and not for the promotion of evil upon the earth. This is a thing against which we should be continually on our guard. Human nature is weak, and many people, when brought in contact with evil influences, are liable to be led away. They are in danger, and the best, the safest policy is to keep away from dangerous ground and beyond the range of evil, and we should not associate with those whose influence is evil. Our lives are made up of small items, of labors performed a little at a time. If our acts are good, if our words are such that the righteous can approve them, we need not fear when they are summed up and judgment rendered. For our lives, having been spent in the performance of good deeds, it will be all right with us. And if we have this consciousness, we can rejoice wherever we are. I can bear testimony that I have never been disappointed when I have been engaged in the work of the Lord and in carrying out the counsels of his servants unto me. I can bear testimony that this is the work of God, and that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, that Brigham Young is a prophet of God, and that the gospel which they have preached to the Latter-day Saints is the gospel of the Son of God. And inasmuch as we live according to his precepts, we shall be delivered from evil. Salvation is revealed in the gospel, and that salvation commenced to be received by us when we obeyed it. We can be freed from our sins when we learn to obey the truth, for in the gospel there is deliverance from sin, if we will but apply its principles to our lives. When we find a difficulty in the midst of the people, it is simply because one or more have done that which they ought not to have done, and they have applied the principles of the gospel applicable to that particular case. The difficulty might have been avoided when we practice the principles of this gospel to perfection. We shall be delivered from evil, whether in this world or in the world to come. For instance, if no murders are committed, none of the evils will be experienced which grow out of that crime. If the people generally would cease lying, the evils now resulting from the great prevalence of falsehood in the world would be unknown. And so we might enumerate all of the evils that are committed by the human family and say that if the principles of the gospel of Christ were universally observed, the evils of every kind now so abundant in the parts of the world would be known no more. Then it is for us to whom this gospel has been revealed to learn what is right and to be faithful in practicing it. And the more faithful we are in applying ourselves to this important duty, the more speedily will evil disappear from amongst us and the salvation promised by the gospel be by us enjoyed, and that is precisely what we want, a present as well as an eternal salvation by an application of the principles of the gospel to our daily lives. If this course were pursued by mankind generally, it would soon bring about a millennium, or that still more happy time spoken of by the prophets when the knowledge of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the great deep, and when men all over the world are friends and brothers. This is the direction in which the practice of the principles of the gospel leads us, and a continued and close attention thereto will enable us to overcome every imperfection. At the same time, our Heavenly Father is disposed to try those who profess to have taken upon them the name of Christ, and, in fact, He is trying us continually in order to prove whether we will serve Him in all things. If an evil is presented before us, we must either receive or reject it. If we reject it, we have overcome. If we accept it, we are overcome of evil. We may say that we have continually a trial before us, and it is for us to be on our guard, that we enter not into temptation, that we are not overcome, no matter in what guise or how temptingly evil may present itself to us. We need to be valiant before the Lord, valiant in testimony, valiant in keeping His commandments, valiant in rejecting every evil principle and practice that may be presented before us. And if this is our course and we continue therein, time will come when we will be counted worthy of an inheritance and exaltation among the sanctified in the presence of our Father. I feel to rejoice in the principles of the gospel that the Lord has revealed to us, and that many years ago I had the privilege of hearing and obeying them. I can say that from that time until the present I have never had the first moment sorrow because of anything that I have been called to pass through in connection with the gospel, and I hope I never shall. My experience in this cause and kingdom has been a source of continual rejoicing, and I believe it will be so to the end. I trust, brethren and sisters, that this is also your experience, and that you and I may continue faithful to the end, that we may be counted worthy of the privilege of mingling with that great company of the sanctified and just, whom we have spoken of this morning, 
and that with them we may receive a crown of glory and immortality. This is my prayer, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Elder A. Carrington had been much interested in the remarks made during the conference. He had been led to ask himself this question, what was crime? Simply the violation of law, whether human or divine. Which law should be based upon justice and righteousness? All human laws, being necessarily tainted with more or less imperfection, would sooner or later be superseded by the perfect laws of the kingdom of God. He then commented on the merits and value of the original constitution of our country, and that we, as a people most rigidly observed and lived up to the principles of which it was composed, but the public administrators of law at the present time, filling the most responsible places and trust under the government, were corrupt, and they willfully infringed upon the principles of the Constitution. Crime a transgression of law. Saints are under divine law. The gospel a perfect law. The Constitution of the United States a just instrument. Saints must be patient and long-suffering. Latter-day Saints prepare by good works to meet the Savior. Discourse by Elder Albert Carrington, delivered at the adjourned semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Sunday, October 11, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. I have been much interested during our meetings in this conference, and with you I measurably realize the benefits to be derived in thus assembling together. In my reflections and reference to some remarks that have been made, I have been led to ask myself, what is crime? Simply a transgression of the law, human or divine. What is law? It is, or should be, a rule of order, founded in justice, for the benefit of those to whom it may apply. Now, so far as we are concerned in regard to law, we are under divine law, the gospel, the grand plan of salvation, a law that is perfect, plain, and simple, as well as just, and applicable to the whole human family at all times, and in this we should rejoice. But we are also under human laws as well. We pertain to a number of what are termed human governments, subject, in a greater or lesser degree, to man-made institutions. And are they perfect? No, each and every one of them, notwithstanding the intelligence possessed by mankind, and their centuries of experience contain the seeds of their own dissolution, and in the providence of God they are all destined, and in their times and in their seasons, to be superseded by the government and kingdom of God upon the earth, a fact at which every human being should rejoice. But do they? Does even that portion of the world termed Christian rejoice in the ushering in of the kingdom of God upon the earth? I am sorry to say, and chagrined for humanity at being compelled to say, that all Christendom, almost to a unit, perhaps as much a unit on that subject as upon any one thing, although they have the Bible in their hands, are opposed to the establishment of the government of God upon the earth. What folly, absurdity, and inconsistency on the part of so-called Christendom to oppose that which was devised in the wisdom of the gods in the eternal worlds, and which, in its very nature and constitution, is calculated to benefit and to promote, to the utmost possible degree, the welfare of mankind in all their relations. What about the government under which we live? Why, it is one of the very best, as to its form, that the human family has ever devised. It was founded by excellent, honorable, upright, liberal, and high-minded men, who, in framing the Constitution, were measurably inspired, by that Holy Spirit which, the, which our Father in the heavens bestows upon whom he will. That is the view that we, as Latter-day Saints, have in regard to the fundamental or basic instrument of the government of the United States termed the Constitution, and however much we may be misrepresented, maligned, or lied about in regard to that matter. As a people, we are loyal to that Constitution to the minutest principle therein contained. We understand the Constitution, its spirit as well as its letter, and, so far as it is observed, it is a very excellent instrument for the conducting of human affairs. We are a people that uphold that Constitution, and we ever have done so, and take great pleasure in doing so, and so, also, with every constitutional law. And I am at the defiance of the wide world to truthfully con controvert the statement that we, as Latter-day Saints, have ever transgressed one single particle of constitutional law, 
or have ever had any occasion to do so, or ever will have, in obeying the principles of the gospel and laboring to build up and establish the kingdom of God in the earth. What do you think of that? The world will tell you that we are a terrible set, that we are disloyal, ignorant, stupid, fanatical, bigoted, deceivers, and deceived, and in all these statements, and as many more about the Latter-day Saints, the world will lie like the devil. Now you heard me say constitutional law. Mark it well. I understand as a general thing somewhat of what I am saying when I speak, and I made use of the expression understandingly. The constitutional laws of this government, what are they? They are laws enacted in the pursuance of the principles couched in that constitution under the authority given the Congress of our nation to enact laws for the whole United States and to make treaties for our government. All that is beyond that one hair's breadth is just that far usurpation, tyranny, and wrong. Have we obeyed that more or less? Oh, no doubt. We have had to do so now these many years. In the days of the stripling Joseph, when he was first called of God to bring forth this great latter-day work that the Lord our God has set his hand to accomplish, he was assailed unconstitutionally so far as the Constitution of the State of New York was concerned by the citizens of that state, and again the same thing occurred in Ohio, in Missouri, and finally in Illinois, where contrary to the plighted faith of the governor of the state, he was slain by a mob, because according to their own testimony the law could not reach him, for he had lived above it. What right, then, had they to assail or interrupt him? No right whatever. We, as a people, left the states, and I may say we left Christendom, from the simple fact that we were obliged to do so in order to live our religion. But would they let us alone after we had left the states? No, after having aided in the conquest of the very region to which we fled to avoid persecution and religious tyranny, they were not satisfied even then to leave us unmolested to worship the true and living God according to the dictates of our own consciences. But they have followed us as a nation, and are following us to this day, a professed Christian nation is trying to force upon us the tyranny and oppression of unconstitutional law, administered by officers for whose appointment there is not a scintilla of right under the Constitution. What do you think of that? And we are enduring their interference with our domestic affairs with as much patience as we may. We have endured these things with considerable patience for many long years, and I trust that we shall still be able to do so, realizing that patience is one of the great requirements of our Father concerning us as his children. He desires that we should be long-suffering towards those who seek to afflict and oppress us, as he is long-suffering towards the human family and their wickedness and waywardness. And we must become like unto him in these respects if we are his. And if we expect to become perfect in our sphere as he is in his, we not only have to be patient and long-suffering, but we shall have to continue in patience and long-suffering. Will we do so? I trust so, knowing the blindness, ignorance, bigotry, superstition, and consequent intolerance of our fellow human beings. Knowing also that they, as well as we, are answerable to the Lord our God, being careful while leaving events in the hands of the Supreme Ruler, that our conduct, day by day, is such that it will bear not only the strictest examination and scrutiny of our fellow beings, but also of our Father and His angels, Realizing also, now as anciently, that whosoever will live godly in Jesus Christ must needs suffer persecution. Do not forget that this is the very nature of things, from the simple fact that, in order to constitute this a probation, wickedness has been permitted upon the earth, and hence good and evil, and wickedness is and ever has been aggressive, tyrannical, oppressive, cruel, and murderous, and so it will ever continue to be. Do not forget these plain facts, and when you hear the wicked lie, and see them strive to oppress you and to deprive you of your rights, do not get impatient about it, and fancy that it is anything new, but remember that it has ever been so in the days of Cain, and that it will continue until wickedness is swept from the footstool of Jehovah, and not before that time can we hope to cease to be oppressed and wronged. And this is necessary to prove whether we will endure all things, as the great captain, pattern, and exemplar and of our faith, and the great high priest of our salvation endured in his time. He was buffeted, scourged, and mobbed, and led like a lamb to the slaughter, a being in whom was no guile, 
who finally terminated his mortal career by a cruel death on the cross. He was opposed by his own when he came to call and gather them as their king and ruler. Who were his own? The tribes of Israel, and he came more particularly to that most stubborn and stiff-necked of all the tribes, the tribe of Judah. And did the scribes and Pharisees, the rabbis and lawyers, the wise, intelligent, and noble hail and welcome him? No, most assuredly not. Then how much less need we expect that they will hail and welcome us, his professed followers, when instead of himself, his word through the prophet Joseph Smith came to Christendom with its almost numberless free schools and its millions of Bibles and legions of priests, did the people hail that word? No, they spurned it, and in every conceivable way derided him who brought it, and as in the days of the Savior, the priests, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the lawyers and scribes, the wise in their own estimation, and the wealthy all banded together to keep from the children of men the word of God, which is truth, and which is the power of God unto salvation, to all who will believe and obey it. Are not these facts? I know they are. Though the whole world may gainsay, I know that I am telling you the truth. As God lives, I know it for myself. Now then, with regard to these matters that we are immediately passing through, the attempted enforcement of laws that are not constitutional, and through not being constitutional they are not valid, and consequently of no force or effect whatever, in justice, what are we going to do about it? I trust that we will endure, with all patience, whatever the Lord our God may permit the evil one, and those who, through the exercise of their agency, list to serve him, to accomplish and while enduring with all patience that we seek in all faithfulness and uprightness for the guidance of his Holy Spirit to lead us in the path of truth, and to enable us to walk therein, and to endure meekly and patiently all things that he has in his providence may see fit to place upon us, in order to prove whether we as individuals and as a people will serve him in evil as well as in good report. Is there anything bigoted or contrary to the principles of eternal truth as taught by the Savior and his apostles in all this? No. Then why not the world turn to the Lord our God and live? Why not, Latter-day Saints, for our own sakes, live faithfully, humbly, and uprightly, and in all respects honor the requirements of the gospel, until we become powerful through good works and able to meet with joy the coming of the Savior? and prepared to hail with gladness the society and companionship of just men made perfect, being worthy to associate with them and to share in their blessings, and finally be saved in the celestial kingdom of our Father? That this may be our lot is my prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Conference adjourned till 2 o'clock p.m. The choir sang, O be joyful in the Lord. Benediction by Bishop E. D. Woolley. Sunday afternoon, October 11. The choir sang, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Prayer by Elder J. D. T. McAllister. The choir sang, "'Twas on that dark, that solemn night, when powers of earth and hell arose. While the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was being administered, President George A. Smith addressed the conference, said it was natural for us to call upon the various works that were now immediately upon us, and would form a practical exhibition of our faith. For, as James said, faith without works was dead." He then read a few of the rules of the United Order, and made remarks on the same, after which he said there was a great lack of confidence among the people, but it should be restored by keeping our promises and making good our contracts with each other. He strongly recommended the manufacture and use of every article of apparel that we need to wear, especially the use of wood-bottomed shoes in damp weather as a preventative of rheumatism. He also urged the establishment of schools in every settlement, the keeping of them clean and well seated and the seats and desks adapted to the size and convenience of the children, also to have good teachers, and to sustain our own university. After this conference, meetings would be held hereafter in the various assembly rooms of the city at 2 o'clock p.m., instead of in this tabernacle. Sunday schools would be held in the morning, at which he hoped there would be a good attendance of children and teachers. Let parents see that the children are got ready in good time, clean and tidy, and let the bishops render every accommodation throughout the territory to the Sunday schools, so as to have them held at the most convenient time for the children. 
he hoped the brethren would better sustain our own publications instead of spending our means for the lying trash that was sown broadcast throughout the community he then spoke of the progress of the two temples now under erection much had been done and more remained to be done he strongly urged the prompt payment of the fifty cents cash donation called for towards the erection of temples he then rehearsed the labors of president b young for many years past especially since he accompanied the twelve to the old country as missionaries when the gospel was first preached since then he had inaugurated the p e fund or system of emigration as to bring out forty thousand people from that country to this free land of america and most of whom were now enjoying comfortable homes and in easy circumstances such a philanthropic result could not be attributed to any other living man besides president b young his life was one of incessant labor and toil for the good of the human family he was now feeble in health and unable to speak to us on the present occasion let the brethren pray for him that he might be so far restored in health and strength that his voice might soon be heard again among us faith without works is dead pray to god keep the sabbath day holy encourage sunday schools discourse by president george a smith delivered at the semi-annual conference in the new tabernacle salt lake city sunday morning october eleventh eighteen seventy four reported by david w evans this being the closing day of the conference and as we are administering the sacrament we naturally call our minds up in a way of discipline for ourselves on various subjects which pertain to our everyday life the apostle james tells us that faith without works is dead being alone and good works are certainly the best illustrations of that faith which prompts us as our brethren will soon scatter through the different wards and settlements of the territory and to other parts of the world we wish them to carry forth just and wise impressions in relation to the simple principles of faith and practice which pertain to the holy gospel and to disseminate the instructions they have received that all may be benefited thereby when we come here and take bread and drink of the cup in memory of the death and sufferings of our savior we witness unto him that we remember him that we love his law that we are determined to abide by his gospel and that we will do all in our power to walk in the principles of faith and patience forbearance and long-suffering and of truth and righteousness in which we are engaged as a short illustration and to draw the minds of the congregation directly to the points of instruction i am disposed to read a portion of the rules of the united order rule one says we will not take the name of the deity in vain nor speak lightly of his character or of sacred things I am sorry to say that many professed Latter-day Saints are careless in the observance of this rule, which every Latter-day Saint and every person who has respect for his own character must certainly consider most wholesome and wise, and absolutely obligatory. Let us be very careful, and never indulge in profane language, or use the name of the Deity, except in such a manner as becomes his high and holy position, and our dependence upon him for every breath we draw. And let us also inculcate in our children a respect for that chaste, discreet, upright, and pure language, which is becoming saints of the Most High. Rule 2 reads, We will pray in our families morning and evening, and also attend to secret prayer. Now, brethren and sisters, remember this. Those of you, if any, who have been careless and negligent on this subject, remember how often God has heard our prayers, and how dependent we are upon Him for every blessing we possess and enjoy and for the protection which has been extended unto us. While almost all of the world has been ready to destroy the Latter-day Saints from off the earth, the Lord has answered our prayers and has protected us, as it were, in the hollow of his hand. Let us not forget to call upon him morning and evening, that our families may learn from their childhood to observe this great and important duty. And before we lie down to rest or rise in the morning, let us lift up our hearts in secret prayer to the Most High, asking his protection and blessing in all things, that by united faith we may be able to perform the great and arduous duties which are placed upon us. And in our prayers let us remember our bishops and teachers and those in authority, the president of the church, his counselors, and all those who act in the holy priesthood, that the Spirit of the Almighty may rest upon them as well as upon us, that with one heart and one mind we may have a knowledge of the things of God, and that by observing these duties of prayer and preserving ourselves in purity before the Lord, when teaching, instruction, or counsel is sent forth among the saints, or revelation is proclaimed unto us, we may have enough of the Holy Ghost in our hearts to know, each for himself or herself, whether these things are true or not, that when false spirits go forth 
and lead men astray into darkness, error, and folly, we may know the true from the false. Detect those who are liars, and expose them as may be necessary. The third rule is, we will observe or keep the word of wisdom according to the spirit and meaning thereof. Remember this, brethren and sisters. I hear occasionally of brethren indulging in intoxicating drinks, and I see many of them yet, even young men who indulge in the use of tobacco, a habit which is very pernicious and injurious to health, and a violation of the word of wisdom. There are also other violations of this rule among us which should cease, for we are told in the word of wisdom that if we will observe it with all our hearts, keeping the commandments of God, we shall have faith, health, and strength, marrow in our bones, and have wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, and the destroyer will pass by us and not slay us. Brethren, how general it is with us when persons are sick and afflicted, or when our children are sick, to say to the elders, Brethren, come and lay your hands upon them, and in thousands of instances they are healed. Perhaps we are losing some of our faith. We read in the scriptures that King Asa, whom God had healed and blessed when he was diseased, he trusted not to the Lord, but sought physicians. And King Asa died. While we recommend and approve of using every reasonable means within our power to preserve our lives and those of our children, we do depend, first of all, upon faith in the Holy Gospel, the administration of its ordinances, and the fulfillment of the promises of God. And inasmuch as we observe the word of wisdom and keep the commandments of God, we have faith, and we have the promises of God upon which we can rely, and by which thousands and thousands are delivered from the afflictions which prey upon them. We will treat our families with kindness and affection and set before them an example worthy of imitation. In our families and in our intercourse with all persons, we will refrain from being contentious and quarrelsome. We will cease to speak evil one of another and cultivate a spirit of charity towards all. We consider it our first duty to keep from acting selfishly or from covetous motives, and we will seek the interests of each other and the salvation of all mankind. This is rule four. And in calling your attention to it, I wish it to be remembered that it enters into our business transactions and everyday life. I have noticed in the course of many years that I have traveled and preached, being in hundreds of families, that some men were pleasant and agreeable, and others were crabbed, crossed, ill-natured, and surly in their disposition. The very tone of their voice would show it. This is all wrong. We should cultivate kindness, forbearance, and patience in our families, and a spirit that will incline them unto us, and in all things set such an example before our children, that we may be as shining lights unto them, that as they grow up imitating our examples, they may become pillars of society, plants of renown and ornaments in the kingdom of God, and not be led by covetousness, dishonesty, idolatry, or any corrupt motive whatever. Consider all these things, and remember this as one of the rules of the United Order which it is of special importance that we should observe. Rule 5 teaches, we will observe personal cleanliness, preserve ourselves in all chastity, refrain from adultery, whoredom and lust, and discountenance and refrain from all vulgar and obscene language and conduct. In regard to this rule, I am sorry to say that the influx of so-called civilization and Christianity in our midst has shown its effects upon some portions of our community, and that strict and firm adherence to the principles of chastity, for which the Latter-day Saints have been remarkable ever since the organization of the church and the gathering of the people seems in some instances to be wanting. We call upon all such persons to repent and humble themselves before the Lord, and we exhort all Latter-day Saints to maintain such a high position before God that every act of their lives may be approved of Him. Never let us be guilty of any word or deed that we will be ashamed of before our father, mother, brother, or sister, or before our Heavenly Father. This is a principle that we should cultivate, maintain, and abide by in all things. And wherever any have been foolish enough to fall or go astray through the toils or snares that have been set for them, let them repent and humble themselves before the Lord, and let a spirit of unity, harmony, peace, stern integrity, purity, and chastity abide in every heart. For if we ever inherit blessings and glory, if we ever are made partakers of the thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, and endless lives which pertain to the exaltation of the kingdom of God, we shall do so by maintaining a purity like that of Joseph who was sold into Egypt. The sixth rule is, we will observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I regret to say that I have noticed a great many instances of laxity in the observance of this rule, 
and I wish the elders and teachers in all the branches and settlements to preach and practice the observance of the Sabbath. Brethren, work six days, and on the seventh day rest and observe the Sabbath according to the revelation, and impress this principle upon the saints everywhere by practice. I remember once I was in a hurry to come to Salt Lake City. Fillmore was then the only settlement between my place in Parowan Iron County and the settlements in Utah County. The Sunday was very fine. We had attended meeting, and having been a long time away from the brethren in Salt Lake City, we wanted to hurry on. I certainly thought we could travel 20 miles on Sunday evening as well as not, so we started. I was a little conscious stricken. I said to myself, this is not exactly right, and I am afraid we shall not get along as well as we would to have stayed until Monday morning. We drove about 20 or 22 miles that evening. I told the brethren to tie up the horses, but some of them got loose and went clear back, and in the morning the brethren had to go the whole distance after them. That is what we gained at the start by breaking the Sabbath. But it did not end there. The next day we broke a wagon, and then we got into a storm, and we were six days in reaching Fillmore, and it took us some twelve days to reach this city. Now I do not believe that, as a general thing, anything is gained in property or in time by working on the Sabbath, and I advise and exhort all men professing to belong to the United Order or to be Latter-day Saints to observe the Sabbath, keep it holy, devote it to worship, to the study of good books, to rest, to imparting instruction, to attending meeting, and do not, under any circumstances, lapse into a habit of thinking that you can do as you please on the Sabbath, and that so doing is clear gain. We have some day to meet our Father in heaven, and that day is not very far off with many of us. I meet here at this conference quite a number with whom, forty years ago this summer, or last spring, I marched on the Zion's camp journey a thousand miles. That does not seem long, but we are marching steadily to our last account, and we should not let our love for self, our desire for gain, or our anxiety for pleasure so mar our path that when we come into the presence of our Father in heaven we shall be smitten with the reflection that, instead of observing the Sabbath according to the command, we went off spreeing, or hunting, or we went looking after cattle, or getting wood, or dashing around, and breaking the Sabbath time and again. For if our conscience reproves us, God is greater than our consciences, and he will surely condemn us. Rule 7 that which is not committed to our care, we will not appropriate to our own use. That is a very modest way of agreeing or promising that we will not steal, or to take that which does not belong to us. One of the Ten Commandments teaches, Thou shalt not steal. And in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, we are informed that he that steals shall be cast out and delivered to the law of the land. These things should never be forgotten by those professing to be Latter-day Saints. I have noticed in the course of my life a great many men professing a great deal of piety who have been very dishonest. And in the neighborhood where I was raised there were men who would charge a good round piece for a bushel of wheat and then use a false measure. In that way they reared children to be dishonest. If there are fathers or teachers in Israel who indulge in this covetous practice or who take that which does not belong to them, they set examples before their children which cause them to grow up a generation of thieves. I was once conversant with an incident il illustrative of this principle. A young man was cut off from the church for stealing. When he came home, his mother abraded him for it. But, said he, Mother, you have yourself to thank for it. My father always told me not to steal. He commanded me not to touch a thing that did not belong to me. But you used to send me to the neighbors to steal eggs. You taught me to steal, and you are measurably responsible for my disgrace. This was a rather a bitter pill for the mother, but it contains an important lesson, if we will consider it. That which we borrow, we will return according to promise, and that which we find, we will not appropriate to our own use, but will seek to return it to the proper owner. There is too much of a want of confidence in the midst of the saints. When some promise, they too often fail to keep their word, and those who are in business do not feel as free to trust their brethren as outsiders do. I have had brethren come to me and say, they are not as accommodating to me as outsiders are, and I sometimes answer them by saying, perhaps you are not as punctual to pay your brethren as you would be to pay an outsider. Many of our brethren are not, and this is all wrong. Confidence should be established in each other by fulfilling what we undertake. What we borrow, we should return. What we agree to do, we should fulfill. We should be careful to make our agreements so that we can fulfill them, and then do so. 
and if through some unforeseen circumstances we are unable to do so, we should immediately make known the facts of the case and be honest. I hope these cases are by no means common, but I am satisfied that they are more numerous than they ought to be. The ninth rule requires us, as soon as possible, to cancel all indebtedness, and thereafter to avoid getting into debt. For the last few years, owing to the opening of mines, the construction of railroads, and the good crops that have been raised, the prosperity of the people has been very great. And as a wise and prudent community, we should have taken a course to have had the benefits of all this means without being involved in debt, for notwithstanding we have been put to vast expense in consequence of persecution and oppression of our, from our enemies, we have been in a condition to have saved a great deal. But many of our brethren are in debt, notwithstanding all this prosperity. Now this rule requires that we take measures to pay or cancel our debts as soon as possible, and then avoid getting into debt by living within our means. Ambition to push forward and make wealth should not induce us to involve ourselves in debt, but we should, with economy and prudence, live within our means. The residue of these rules I will not read, but commend them to the consideration of all the brethren, as being of the utmost importance. There is one, however, to which I will just call your attention. It refers to the manner of dress and living and requires us to use proper economy and prudence in the management of all things entrusted to our care. I exceedingly regret to see the disposition to extravagance which exists among us, as also a disposition to purchase from abroad a variety of articles that are not of the first necessity. I do think that it is right and proper that we should take the utmost pains in our power as a united order and a united people to provide everything that we can produce within ourselves and not be sending away all the money we can get to buy things that we can make ourselves. Our brooms, for instance, and a great deal of our clothing and most of our shoes can be made here. With all the ridicule that has been expended in relation to wooden-soled boots and shoes, I sincerely advise every man who is afflicted with a cough or who is subject to colds or rheumatism, asthma, or any ailment of that kind, to put wooden soles under his feet this fall. They will preserve health a great deal better than rubber, and if they happen to be paid for, it will be much better than to owe a trader for them, or to wear leather that is like a sponge, through which the damp will penetrate, striking directly to and promoting cough and, or rheumatism. I am of the belief that wooden-soled shoes worn in winter will cure nine cases out of the ten of rheumatism, and will save the lives of many of our children by keeping their feet dry and warm. I feel like preaching up wooden soles as a medical prescription, if you please, as well as on the score of economy. I wish you, brethren, when you return to the settlements to look after the schools, see that they are established in all the settlements for the winter, that no child be left without a chance to acquire a knowledge of the common branches of education. See that all the poor are provided with the means of sending their children to school, that no child be deprived of the privilege of attending school through the poverty of its parents. Make your schoolhouses comfortable and pleasant. Make the seats of the proper height and comfortable, so that the children may not become humpbacked or round-shouldered, nor contract spinal complaints or anything of that kind through their seats being awkwardly constructed. There is plenty of lumber in the mountains and plenty of workmen. Let them make good, comfortable seats for the children. See that your schoolrooms are properly warmed, and be careful as to the characters of the men you employ for school teachers. Do not hire a scoundrel, a seducer, or blackleg for the position, for if you employ as teachers in your schools those who are foul, wicked, and corrupt in their habits, you assume a terrible responsibility, for the impressions made upon and, and the lessons taught to the children while attending school have a great influence for good or for evil upon their future lives and welfare. I believe I have preached upon this subject almost every conference since I can remember, or since I began to speak at conferences, and I shall continue to do so. Let parents be stirred up in regard to the education of their children and provide for their welfare. In the early days of the territory, the first house built in every settlement as a general rule was a schoolhouse. Let this rule still be followed, and let our children receive their education directly within ourselves. And if we want them to study the advanced branches, fill up our home universities, instead of sending them abroad to be educated in foreign schools, uphold your own university and sustain your own schools. After the close of this conference, meetings in this building will be discontinued during the winter and will be held under the direction of the bishops in the ward assembly rooms every Sunday afternoon and evening. 
The forenoons will be devoted to Sunday schools, and I exhort the brethren and sisters to have their children ready so that they can be at school in time. And I invite the young men, and especially the young sisters, to attend Sunday schools. I want to stir up the young men to go there and form Bible classes. And I exhort the elders to be present as teachers, that there may be no lack of teachers. I want to express my admiration of Brother Goddard and a number of the other school superintendents and teachers with whom I am acquainted, because of their efforts to spread among the young throughout the territory a knowledge of the principles of the gospel as taught in the Bible, Book of Mormon, Book of Doctrine and Covenants, and in the standard works of the church. And I say to the young men that if they will attend the Bible classes and study the catechism in use in our schools and make themselves familiar with it, they will become so thoroughly informed in the principles of the gospel and the evidences of it that when called upon to go abroad to defend the doctrines of Zion, they will be well prepared to do so. I invite the elders to see that these classes are formed in all the settlements. I will again repeat the idea that has already been presented to sustain our own literary institutions and publications, the juvenile instructor, the woman's exponent, the Deseret News, which contains discourses by the First Presidency and Twelve, and also the publications in the several counties. They are conducted by men who take pains to disseminate the truth, as well as the general news of the world, and they ought to be sustained that their influence may be extended and increased. Do not spend your money in buying lies nor your time in reading yellow-covered literature, or in studying such things as are calculated in their nature to degenerate the human mind and degrade the soul. One of the best books you can read on this earth is the Bible. It is the finest history ever published in Great Britain. Study its history and its precepts. It is the foundation of the sciences of the world, and the basis of the laws of all the Christian nations. And although men in every direction have departed from it, we can read and understand it for ourselves. See that it is on every table, in every household, in every pulpit, and that it is the school book of every family throughout the territory. I want to say with regard to the temple at St. George that the walls are between 25 and 30 feet high. Some of the brethren remain at work upon it all summer, some of them without shoes and par poorly supplied with clothing. About 309 persons have reported, I believe, as going there this winter, to aid in pushing the work of the temple as volunteers from the different settlements of the territory. We hope, by means of this help and the contr contributions that may be sent there, to have the roof on early next spring, and very soon a baptismal font in the basement, in which we can begin the administration of the principle of baptism for the dead, and the ordinances of the gospel in connection with our fathers. The climate in St. George is well suited to those in feeble health, and such of that class of persons as desire to do so can, after the temple is completed, go there and spend the winter, and attend to the ordinances of their dead. I have invited the brethren during the conference to go and look at the temple foundation in this city. It is a very beautiful foundation, and the design of the building is grand. The labor of taking the granite from the mountains, bringing it on to this ground, and cutting it and putting it in position is immense. You saw a great many prepared stones that are not laid. I will explain how that has happened. We had a good many beginners who could shape a rough stone, but not so many stone cutters who could do a finished job, and all the stones for the outside had to be done by skillful workmen. A great number of those that you see lying around, numbered up as high as 13 or 14 courses, were cut by men who were not skilled workmen. That is the reason why so many are not yet laid in the building. We found it necessary during the harvest to dismiss 50 workmen of this kind from the block, that they might go and aid in gathering the harvest, because we could not supply them with work so far in advance of the laying. Brother Truman O. Angel has been exceedingly zealous in attending to this work. He has been so fearful lest a stone should be laid wrong that he has been on the walls early and late to see that every stone has been set in its proper place, to a hair's breadth. His zeal has been such that I have almost feared that, in spite of the faith of the saints and the energy of the man's soul, he would work himself into the ground. I want the brethren to pray for him that he may be sustained in his arduous labors. One great difficulty in getting along on this temple has been the want of money to supply the workmen with actual necessaries. We have been accustomed during the prosperous times of the past year or two to pay them one-fourth in cash or merchandise. This season we were unable to do that. Hence an invitation was given by the First Presidency and the bishops to all the saints, far and near, to make a donation of 50 cents a month to aid in the prosecution of the work on the temple. 
The names of all who respond are to be entered in the book of the law of the Lord. Quite a number have responded, and some means has come in from this source. I now invite the brethren, sisters, strangers, and all who feel an interest in the temple and wish to have their names enrolled in the book of the law of the Lord to make this monthly contribution that the hearts of the workmen may be gladdened and that the hands of those who are called to conduct this business may not be tied. We have been compelled to borrow money and to pay interest to carry on this work. The resources that have come in have been insufficient, and the kind that has come in has not been such that we could make it available in carrying on the work as vigorously as we desire to do on this temple and upon that at St. George. I appeal to the brethren also to remember the temple in their prayers. Let us pray that God will give us power to erect and dedicate it, and that he will preserve the life of our president to organize the priesthood in all its beauty and order in that temple, and fulfill to the uttermost the duties of those keys which were delivered to him by Joseph Smith, pertaining to the Twelve and to the Church, and to the bearing off of this work in the last days. Let us lift our hearts to God, that he will preserve his servants for the accomplishment of this work. And while we raise our hearts in prayer for this object, let our souls be filled with benevolence and liberality to pay our tithes and offerings. I fully believe that if one half of the brethren had honestly paid tithing as we understand it, our hands would not have been tied. Think of these things and act upon them. Most of the emigration of the present season has been through our own means and the aid of relatives and friends, and a goodly number have thus been gathered. We now again invite all those who owe the perpetual emigration fund, or whose relatives or friends are indebted to it, to remember their obligations, that those in the old countries who desire may be gathered here as fast as possible. We also invite the brethren to send for their friends from abroad, but before expending your money for that purpose, Find out whether those whom you wish to gather still remain saints, or whether they have corrupted their ways before the Lord. It would be a very good idea to learn this before expending money to help them, though it is an act of charity to bring anybody from the old world and place them on the broad plains of America where they may be enabled to obtain homes of their own. I want to say in relation to the missionary labors of President Brigham Young in going to Europe and founding and starting the system of immigration, and gathering thousands upon thousands of people from the old world and placing them in positions to get homes of their own, that he is the most distinguished and extensive benefactor of his race of any living man within my knowledge. We regret that he has been unable to speak to us during this conference. We feel confident, however, that had the gospel which he has preached for the last 43 years to the inhabitants of the world been received as honestly by those who heard it as it had been declared by him and his brethren, all the human family would have had a knowledge of the gospel today, and the millennium would have been brought it. This, however, has not been the case, but the formal preaching of President Young and the acts of his life and teaching and being a father to the people will be had in everlasting remembrance, and we will exercise our faith that God will restore his health, that his voice may again be heard amongst us, though that is not possible at this time. We are gratified to know that he is able to be in our midst, to hear our testimonies, see our countenances, and know that within us there is a portion of that Holy Spirit which God has revealed for our salvation. Elder George Q. Cannon rehearsed some of the experience of the saints, their persecutions and trials, our present position in regard to the outside pressure, in all of which he could distinctly discern the hand of God, which was plainly seen in the past deliverance of the saints under the most threatening circumstances. Union amongst this people had been and would continue to be the only safeguard. The object sought for at the present time by our enemies was our destruction, not perhaps of all our lives, but those of our leaders, and to destroy our union. We had always afforded every latitude and courtesy toward other religious teachers to preach in our tabernacles and meeting houses, and find congregations for them to preach to. He intended to devote himself to the promulgation of the principles of union, for we must be united as a people, that we might be enabled successfully to repel any unconstitutional attack that might be made upon us. Saints are the light of the world. Live down falsehood. Union in the church all important. Discourse by Elder George Q. Cannon, delivered at the adjourned semi-annual conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, Sunday afternoon, October 11, 1874. Reported by David W. Evans. 
The teachings which we have heard at this conference have been of a character most important to us as a people, and should be treasured up by all who have heard them, and those of us who reside in other places who have attended conference should carry the instructions they have received to the places where they reside, that the spirit of this work and the spirit of this conference may be disseminated among the saints. We are living in one of the most important periods of the earth's history. Events are of such a character connected with us as to excite the greatest interest, and no one connected with the people who feels as he or she should can help being interested in the way in which this work is progressing and attracting attention throughout the earth. There is no people today on the face of the earth who are situated in this respect as are the Latter-day Saints. God is dealing with us in a most remarkable manner and is fulfilling, through his people, the predictions of the holy prophets. And we behold on every hand, when we open our eyes to see and our hearts to understand, the great events which God said should transpire in some day and age in the future. There is one thing with which I am greatly impressed, and that is, within a few years, how determined the enemies of the kingdom of God have been to destroy that work which he has founded, how they have envied, maligned, and maliciously persecuted this people, and how they have concocted plots for their overthrow. In this last Congress, no less than eight bills were introduced, having for their object the subjugation of the people of Utah to the ring of men who have sought their destruction, and yet the population of this entire territory does not number as much as a second-class city in the United States. I remarked to members of Congress of the House and of the Senate that Congress was paying us a great compliment, a people so insignificant numerically, to so devoid of wealth in the estimate of many, so illiterate, so deluded, so bound and fettered, and so barbarous in our habits. I think it a great compliment that the representatives of 40 millions of people should bestow such attention upon 150,000. Yet it is not these representatives who wish so much to do us harm, but it is a body of men here who are anxious to gain power and influence in, at the expense of a people whose prosperity and influence they envy. And I have been impressed with the wonderful manner in which we have been advertised now for some years back. I cannot fail to recognize the hand of God in this. I look around me and see a people who, if they were not Latter-day Saints, if they did not believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, would not be noticed in any particular manner, but who, because they are Latter-day Saints, are known more widely and whose movements attract more attention and excite greater interest, whose public men are more advertised and their lives and characters published more widely throughout the earth than those of many rulers of great nations. Men say it is because this is such a great imposture, because Brigham Young is a false prophet and because the Latter-day Saints are deluded. These are singular statements to make as though a few deluded and ignorant people, led by a false prophet, could occupy the attention of the nations of the earth. It is something unheard of in history, except, as we testify, in the case of those who have preceded us in the same work. Jesus said to his ancient disciples, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. The eyes of the world were upon them, and in our day we behold the same effect. The Latter-day Saints and their work have been like a city set on a hill. They have attracted the gaze of the nations, and that too, without any especial effort on their part, to make themselves conspicuous. The clamor of our enemies has greatly contributed to this. What do their attacks accomplish for us? They advertise us, and give us an importance to which we could not otherwise attain. Every effort that is made to destroy this work, or to embarrass its onward progress, or to deprive its leaders of their lives, or of their liberties only enhances its importance in the midst of the earth, gives it publicity, preaches the gospel, attracts attention, causes men and women to think, to reason, and to investigate what it is about this people that creates so much excitement. I have said, and I do not think I exaggerate in the least degree, that the efforts of the past three or four years in this territory to destroy this work and to deprive the leaders of this people of their liberty have had more effect in preaching what is called Mormonism than the efforts of a thousand missionaries would have been able to accomplish. Well, but, says one, they say such terrible things about you, and it is no advantage to be spoken of in this manner, to be maligned and accused of wrong. It is an advantage, because, as I have said, it causes men and women to reason and reflect, and it promotes investigation. There have been hundreds who have come here and been brought in contact with this people, who have been astonished at what they have seen, because what they have seen has been so much different in every respect from the stories that they have heard, 
and the effect and revulsion of feeling that have been much greater than they would have been had they never heard anything about us at all. And it is our business to live down the lies that are put in circulation about us. I myself rejoice in these things, because I see the hand of God in it. I see the fulfillment of the predictions of the holy prophets. I see a people being gathered together who are united, not so much as they should be, but still more united than they were before they heard this gospel, and I rejoice that this is the case. I hope we shall continue to cultivate within us the principle of union. Remember the story of the Scythian king, when, on his deathbed, he told his boys to bring him a bundle of arrows. Now, said he, let me see you break this. They tried, one after another, but they could not break the bundle. Cut the string that ties them, said the king, and try to break them singly. They cut the string and tried the arrows singly and broke the entire bundle with ease. There is power in concentration of effort, and it is this which gives us our character in the earth today. Cause the Latter-day Saints to be disunited, divide us asunder, split us into factions, and what would we amount to? Why, nothing at all. We would not count anything in the history of the race or of the earth, but the very notice that we receive. The attention that we attract is a tribute to our nation and to that amount of the cementing influence which prevails among us as a people. Union among us is all important, because we have a power opposed to us that will destroy us if it can. There is no disguising this fact. It is publicly announced everywhere. It was hoped when the railroad was completed that that would do it. It was hoped that when the mines were discovered and emigration floated in here, that the accompanying influences would accomplish it that fashion, luxury, vice, with all their corroding influences at work at this system would destroy it, or produce the disintegration of the entire people. Every effort of this kind has for its object the destruction of the union of this people. Why, if we were disunited, if we were split into factions, we might have houses of ill fame on every corner in juxtaposition with churches. We might have drinking saloons and gambling saloons. We might practice harlotry to the fullest extent and who would indict us for it or say one word against our practices? No one. We would be following the fashion of the world. Why, it would furnish themes for preachers, and they would have excellent texts. For where these things abound, they flourish. But because we are united, because we have our faces set against these things, because we discourage vice, we are unpopular, and we shall continue to be so until a better judgment prevail. I have said there is no disguising the fact, nobody attempts to disguise it, that the object sought for at the present time is the destruction of this people as a people. Not that many would avow their wish to have our lives taken, but to destroy our union, to destroy the influence of our leading men. Now I ask you, Latter-day Saints, are you so blind and so foolish as not to see that this is the object of every attack which is made upon us? You who do not feel in favor of a more union and of concentrating our efforts, ask yourselves this question and reflect upon the objects sought to be obtained by those who are arrayed against us. We do not seek the destruction of any. We have never been aggressive. We have never sought to force our opinions upon anyone. We have invited all to come to this land and proclaim their principles here, without let or hindrance. They have not been gagged in their faith, or restrained or restricted in any manner. They have had the privilege of preaching to the fullest extent in our tabernacles and meeting houses, and we have not had the least objection thereto, but on the contrary, we have been pleased to see them. This is the course we have taken. But when we are threatened with destruction as a pure matter of self-defense, it is our duty to organize ourselves to resist these attacks, and the people who would not do it are unworthy of an existence upon the earth. I therefore have ever been, am now, and will always be, while I feel as I do at the present time, in favor of greater union among this people, in favor of the united order, in favor of everything that will give us strength and cement us closer and closer together to make our lines more impregnable than they are. And as I said the other day, so I say again, with the help of God, my life shall be devoted to that object with all the strength, influence, and ability which God shall give me among this people. Is there any harm in this? Not in the least, so long as our objects are what they are. We want to save, we want to preserve, we want to disseminate good principles, and any man or woman who will practice this can live forever in the midst of the Latter-day Saints and never have any difficulty. Every fair-minded man who comes to this land and deports himself as a gentleman, 
and any fair-minded lady who comes and deports herself in like manner might live here until they were as old as Methuselah was, and if we continue, as we have been, without ever having the least cause of feeling against us, we ask no more from our others than we are willing to extend them with the greatest liberality and freedom, but we expect to have liberty and freedom for ourselves, and we shall contend for them in every constitutional and legal manner as long as we live. My brethren and sisters, if you have not got the spirit of union, let me advise you to seek for it. Humble yourselves before God, and seek for it until the desire to be more closely united will burn within you, until you regard it as one of the greatest objects that can be attained. In a family capacity, in a ward capacity, or as a people, from north to south, we should not have, have these clashing and conflicting interests, Latter-day Saints against Latter-day Saints, and yet all of us professing to have the building up of God's kingdom at heart. I do not know of anything else that we have to do. God has sent us here for this object, and I do not know any better thing that we can engage in than to build up the Zion of God. It is as good and as great a labor as we can be engaged in. In fact, it is the labor which God has assigned unto us as a people, and as individuals, and if any of us are engaged in anything else, we are not in the line of our duty, and we should turn aside from that and pursue the path which God has marked out. May God bless you and fill you with his Holy Spirit, that you may carry it with you to your various homes in the remote parts of the territory, and that it may live and burn within you, fill you with good and holy desires to do the will of God, keep his commandments, and live in close communion with him. And then you need never be afraid of being deceived, for you cannot be if you have the Holy Ghost with you, within you, and that this may be the case is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. President George A. Smith desired the encouragements of those efforts now being made by the sisters in teaching the young to become more economical in the style and cost of their apparel. He also desired to see far more economy in the burial of our dead friends, and instead of using those expensively imported coffins from Chicago, to have them made from wood that grew in our own canyons, and wanted to see pride abated among us. Conference was adjourned till the 6th of April, 1875, at the New Tabernacle. The choir sang the anthem, Gloria, benediction by President George A. Smith. George Goddard, Clerk of Conference. <laughs>